Book Six, Chapter Thirty Seven of Robert Earlsmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Thirty Seven. Ten days after Langham's return to Oxford, Ellesmere received a characteristic letter from him, asking whether their friendship was to be considered as still existing or at an end. The calm and even proud melancholy of the letter showed a considerable subsidence of that state of half-frenzied irritation and discomfort in which Ellesmere had last seen him. The writer, indeed, was clearly settling down into another period of pessimistic quietism, such as that which had followed upon his first young efforts at self-assertion years before. But this second period bore the marks of an even profounder depression of all the vital forces than the first, and as Ellesmere, with a deep sigh, half angry, half relenting, put down the letter, he felt the conviction that no fresh influence from outside would ever again be allowed to penetrate the solitude of Langham's life. In comparison with the man who had just addressed him, the tutor of his undergraduate recollections was a vigorous and sociable human being. The relenting grew upon him, and he wrote a sensible, affectionate letter in return. Whatever had been his natural feelings of resentment, he said, he could not realise, now that the crisis was past, that he cared less about his old friend. As far as we two are concerned, let us forget it all. I could hardly say this, you would easily imagine, if I thought that you had done serious or irreparable harm. But both my wife and I agree now in thinking that by a pure accident, as it were, and to her own surprise, Rose has escaped either. It will be some time, no doubt, before she will admit it. A girl is not so easily disloyal to her past. But to us it is tolerably clear. At any rate, I send you our opinion for what it is worth, believing that it will and must be welcome to you. Rose, however, was not so long in admitting it. One marked result of that new vulnerableness of soul produced in her by the shock of that February morning was a great softening towards Catherine. Whatever might have been Catherine's intense relief when Robert returned from his abortive mission, she never afterwards let a disparaging word towards Langham escape her lips to Rose. She was tenderness and sympathy itself, and Rose, in her curious reaction against her old self, and against the noisy world of flattery and excitement in which she had been living, turned to Catherine as she had never done since she was a tiny child. She would spend hours in a corner of the Bedford Square drawing-room, pretending to read, or play with little Mary, in reality recovering, like some bruised and trodden plant, under the healing influence of thought and silence. One day, when they were alone in the firelight, she startled Catherine by saying with one of her old, odd smiles, do you know, Cathy, how I always see myself nowadays? It is a sort of hallucination. I see a girl at the foot of a precipice. She's had a fall, and she's sitting up, feeling all her limbs. And to her great astonishment, there is no bone broken. And she held herself back from Catherine's knee, lest her sister should attempt to caress her, her eyes bright and calm. Nor would she allow an answer, drowning all that Catherine might have said in a sudden rush after the child, who was wandering round them in search of a playfellow. In truth, Rose Leyburn's girlish passion for Edward Langham had been a kind of accident unrelated to the main forces of character. He had crossed her path in a moment of discontent, of aimless revolt and longing, when she was but fresh emerged from the cramping conditions of her childhood and trembling on the brink of new and unknown activities. His intellectual prestige, his melancholy, his personal beauty, his very strangenesses and weaknesses had made a deep impression on the girl's immature romantic sense. His resistance had increased the charm, and the interval of angry resentful separation had done nothing to weaken it. As to the months in London, there had been one long duel between herself and him, a duel which had all the fascination of difficulty and uncertainty, but in which pride and caprice had dealt and sustained a large proportion of the blows. Then, after a moment of intoxicating victory, Langham's endangered habits and threatened individuality had asserted themselves once for all. And from the whole long struggle, passion, exultation, and crushing defeat, it often seemed to her that she gained neither joy nor irreparable grief, but a new birth of character, a soul. It may easily be imagined that Hugh Flaxman felt a peculiarly keen interest in Langham's disappearance. On the afternoon of the Searle House rehearsal, 
he had awaited Rose's coming in a state of extraordinary irritation. He expected a blushing fiancé in a fool's paradise, asking by manner, if not by word, for his congratulations, and taking a decent feminine pleasure perhaps in the pang she might suspect in him. And he had already taken his pleasure in the planning of some double-edged congratulations. Then, up the steps of the concert platform, there came a pale, tired girl, who seemed specially to avoid his look, who found a quiet corner, and said hardly a word to anybody till her turn came to play. His revulsion of feeling was complete. After her peace, he made his way up to her, and was her watchful, unobtrusive guardian for the rest of the afternoon. He walked home after he put her into her cab in a whirl of impatient conjecture. As compared to last night, she looks this afternoon as if she'd had an illness. What on earth has that philandering ass been about? If he did not propose to her last night, he ought to be shot. And if he did, a fortiori, for clearly she is miserable. But what a brave child! How she played her part! I wonder whether she thinks I saw nothing like all the rest. Poor little cold hand! Next day, in the street, he met Ellesmere, turned and walked with him, and by dint of leading the conversation a little, discovered that Langham had left London. Gone! But not without a crisis, that was evident. During the dinner preparations for the Searle House concert, and during the meetings which it entailed, now at the Varleys, now at the house of some other connection of his, for the concert was the work of his friends, and given in the townhouse of his decrepit great-uncle Lord Daniel, he had many opportunities of observing Rose. And he felt a soft, indefinable change in her, which kept him in a perpetual answering vibration of sympathy and curiosity. She seemed to him for the moment to have lost her passionate relish for living, that relish which had always been so marked with her. Her bubble of social pleasure was pricked. She did everything she had to do, and did it admirably. But all through she was to his fancy absent and distrait, pursuing through the tumult of which she was often the central figure some inner meditations of which neither he nor anyone else knew anything. Some eclipse had passed over the girl's light, self-satisfied temper. Some searching thrill of experience had gone through the whole nature. She had suffered, and she was quietly fighting down her suffering without a word to anybody. Blacksman's guesses as to what had happened came often very near the truth, and the mixture of indignation and relief with which he received his own conjectures amused himself. "'To think,' he said to himself once with a long breath, that that creature was never at a public school, will go to his death without any one of the kickings due to him. Then his very next impulse, perhaps, would be an impulse of gratitude towards the same creature, towards the man who had released a prize he'd had the tardy sense to see was not meant for him. Free again, to be loved, to be won. There was the fact of facts, after all. His own future policy, however, gave him much anxious thought. Clearly, at present, the one thing to be done was to keep his own ambitions carefully out of sight. He had the skill to see that she was in a state of reaction, of moral and mental fatigue. What she mutely seemed to ask of her friends was not to be made to feel. He took his cue accordingly. He talked to his sister. He kept Lady Charlotte in order. After all her eager expectation on Hugh's behalf, Lady Helen had been dumbfounded by the sudden emergence of Langham at Lady Charlotte's party for their common discomfiture. Who was the man? Why, what did it all mean? He had the most provoking way of giving you half his confidence. To tell you he was seriously in love, and to omit to add the trifling item that the girl in question was probably on the point of engaging herself to somebody else. Lady Helen made believe to be angry, and it was not till she had reduced Hugh to a whimsical penitence and a full confession of all he knew, or suspected, that she consented, with as much loftiness as the physique of an elf allowed her, to be his good friend again, and to play those cards of him which at the moment he could not play for himself. So in the cheeriest, daintiest way, Rose was made much of by both brother and sister. Lady Helen chatted of gowns and music and people, whisked Rose and Agnes off to this party and that, brought fruit and flowers to Mrs. Laban, made pretty deferential love to Catherine, and generally, to Mrs. Pearson's disgust, became the girl's chief chaperone in a fast-filling London. Meanwhile, Mr. Flaxman was always there to befriend or amuse his sister's protégés, always there, but never in the way. 
He was bantering, sympathetic, critical, laudatory, what you will. But all the time he reserved a delicate distance between himself and Rose, a bright nonchalance and impersonality of tone towards her which made his companionship a perpetual tonic. And between them he and Helen coerced Lady Charlotte. A few inconvenient inquiries after Rose's health, a few unexplained stares and humphs and grunts, a few irrelevant disquisitions on her nephew's merits of head and heart, were all she was able to allow herself. And yet she was inwardly seething with a mass of sentiments to which it would have been pleasant to give expression. Anger with Rose for having been so blind and so presumptuous as to prefer someone else to Hugh. Anger with Hugh for his persistent disregard of her advice and the Duke's feelings and a burning desire to know the precise why and wherefore of Langham's disappearance. She was too lofty to become Rose's aunt without a struggle, but she was not too lofty to feel the hungriest interest in her love affairs. But, as we have said, the person who for the time profited most by Rose's shaken mood was Catherine. The girl coming over, restless under her own smart, would fall to watch the trial of the woman and the wife, and would often perforce forget herself and her smaller woes in the pity of it. She stayed in Bedford Square once for a week, and then for the first time she realised the profound change which had passed over the Ellesmere's life. As much tenderness between husband and wife as ever, perhaps more expression of it even than before, as though from an instinctive craving to hide the separateness below from each other and from the world. But Robert went his way, Catherine hers. Their spheres of work lay far apart, their interests were diverging fast, and though Robert, at any rate, was perpetually resisting, all sorts of fresh, invading silences were always coming in to limit talk and increase the number of sore points which each avoided. Robert was hard at work in the East End under Murray Edwards's auspices. He was already known to certain circles as a seceder from the church who was likely to become both powerful and popular. Two articles of his in the 19th century, on disputed points of biblical criticism, had distinctly made their mark, and several of the veterans of philosophical debate had already taken friendly and flattering notice of the new writer. Meanwhile, Catherine was teaching in Mr. Clarendon's Sunday school and attending his prayer meetings. The more expansive Robert's energies became, the more she suffered, and the more the small daily opportunities for friction multiplied. Soon she could hardly bear to hear him talk about his work, and she never opened the number of the nineteenth century which contained his papers, nor had he the heart to ask her to read them. Murray Edwards had received Ellesmere on his first appearance in R, with a cordiality and a helpfulness of the most self-effacing kind. Robert had begun with assuring his new friend that he saw no chance, at any rate for the present, of his formally joining the Unitarians. I have not the heart to pledge myself again just yet, and I own I look rather for a combination from many sides than for the development of any now existing sect. But supposing, he added, smiling, supposing I do in time set up a congregation and a service of my own, is there really room for you and me? Should I not be infringing on a work I respect a great deal too much for anything of the sort? Edwards laughed the notion to scorn. The parish as a whole contained twenty thousand persons. The existing churches, which, with the exception of St. Wilfrid's, were miserably attended, provided accommodation at the outset for three thousand. His own chapel held four hundred, and was about half full. "'You know I may drop our lives here,' he said, his pleasant friendliness darkened for a moment by the look of melancholy which London work seems to develop even in the most buoyant of men. "'And only a few hundred persons at the most be ever the wiser.' Begin with us, then make your own circle. And he forthwith carried off his visitor to the point from which, as it seemed to him, Ellesmer's work might start, viz. a lecture room half a mile from his own chapel, where two helpers of his had just established an independent venture. Murray Edwards had at the time an interesting and miscellaneous staff of lay curates. He asked no questions as to religious opinions, but in general the men who volunteered under him, civil servants, a young doctor, a briefless barrister or two, were men who had drifted from received beliefs and found a pleasure and freedom in working for and with him they could hardly have found elsewhere. The two who had planted their outpost in what seemed to them a particularly promising corner of the district 
were men of whom Edwards knew personally little. "'I'm really not much concerned with what they do,' he explained to Ellesmere, "'except that they get a small share of our funds. But I know they want help, and if they will take you in, I think you will make something of it.' After a tramp through the muddy winter streets, they came upon a new block of warehouses, in the lower windows of which some bills announced a night school for boys and men. Here, to judge from the commotion round the doors, a lively scene was going on. Outside, a gang of young roughs were hammering at the doors and shrieking witticisms through the keyhole. Inside, as soon as Murray Edwards and Ellesmere, by dint of good humour and strong shoulders, had succeeded in shoving their way through and shutting the door behind them, they found a still more animated performance in progress. The schoolroom was in almost total darkness. The pupils, some twenty in number, were racing about, like so many shadowy demons, pelting each other and their teachers with the dips, which, as the buildings were new and had not yet fitted for gas, had been provided to light them through their three hours. In the middle stood the two philanthropists they were in search of, freely bedaubed with tallow, one employed in boxing a boy's ears, the other in saving a huge ink-bottle whereon some enterprising spirit had just laid hands by way of varying the rebel ammunition. Murray Edwards, who was in his element, went to the rescue at once, helped by Robert. The boy minister, as he looked, had been in fact bow of the Cambridge Eight, and possessed muscles which men twice his size might have envied. In three minutes he put a couple of ringleaders into the street by the scruff of the neck, relit a lamp which had been turned out, and got the rest of the rioters in hand. Ellesmere backed him ably, and in a very short time they had cleared the premises. Then the four looked at each other, and Edwards went off into a shout of laughter. "'My dear Wardlaw, my condolences to your coat! But I don't believe if I were rough myself I could resist dips. Let me introduce a friend, Mr. Ellesmere, and if you will have him a recruit for your work. Seems to me another pair of arms will hardly come amiss to you.' The short, red-haired man addressed shook hands with Ellesmere, scrutinising him from under bushy eyebrows. He was panting and beplastered with tallow, but the inner man was evidently quite unruffled, and Elsmere liked the shrewd Scotch face and grey eyes. "'It isn't only a pair of arms we want,' he remarked dryly, "'but a bit of science behind them. Mr. Elsmere, I observe, can use his.' Then he turned to a tall, affected-looking youth with a large nose and long, fair hair, who stood gasping with his hands upon his sides, his eyes full of a moody wrath, fixed on the wreck and disarray of the schoolroom. "'Well, Mackay, have they knocked the wind out of you? My friend and helper, Mr. Ellesmere. Come and sit down, won't you, a minute? They've left us the chairs, I perceive, and there's a spark or two afar. Do you smoke? Will you light up?' The four men sat on chatting some time, and then Wardlaw and Ellesmere walked home together. It had been all arranged. Mackay, a curious, morbid fellow, who had thrown himself into Unitarianism and charity, many out of opposition to an orthodox and bourgeois family, and who had a great idea of his own social powers, was somewhat grudging and ungracious through it all. But Ellesmere's proposals were much too good to be refused. He offered to bring to the undertaking his time, his clergyman's experience, and as much money as might be wanted. Wardlaw listened to him cautiously for an hour, took stock of the whole man physically and morally, and finally said, as he very quietly and deliberately knocked the ashes out of his pipe, "'All right, I'm your man, Mr. Ellesmere. If Mackay agrees, I vote we make you captain of this venture.' "'Nothing of the sort,' said Ellesmere. "'In London I am a novice. I come to learn, not to lead.' Wardlaw shook his head with a little shrewd smile. Mackay faintly endorsed his companion's offer, and the party broke up. That was in January. In two months from that time, by the natural force of things, Ellesmere, in spite of diffidence and his own most sincere wish to avoid a premature leadership, had become the head and heart of the Elgood Street undertaking, which had already assumed much larger proportions. Wardlaw was giving him silent approval and invaluable help, while young Mackay was in the first uncomfortable stages of a hero-worship which promised to be exceedingly good for him. End of Book 6, Chapter 37 Book 6, Chapter 38 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Book 6, Chapter 38 
There were one or two curious points connected with the beginnings of Ellesmere's venture in North R, one of which may just be noticed here. Wardlaw, his predecessor and colleague, had speculatively little or nothing in common with Ellesmere or Murray Edwards. He was a devout and orthodox comtist, for whom Edwards had provided an outlet for the philanthropic passion, as he had for many others belonging to far stranger and remoter faiths. By profession he was a barrister with a small and struggling practice. On this practice, however, he had married, and his wife, who had been a doctor's daughter and a national schoolmistress, had the same ardours as himself. They lived in one of the dismal little squares near the Gospel Road, and had two children. The wife, as a positivist mother is bound to do, tended and taught her children entirely herself. She might have been seen any day wheeling their perambulator through the dreary streets of a dreary region. She was their providence, their deity, the representative to them of all tenderness and all authority. But when her work with them was done, she would throw herself into charity organisation cases, into efforts for the protection of workhouse servants, into the homeless acts of ministry towards the sick, till her dowdy little figure and her face, which but for the stress of London, of labour and of poverty, would have had a blunt, fresh-coloured, dairy-maid charm, became symbols of a divine and sacred helpfulness in the eyes of hundreds of straining men and women. The husband also, after a day spent in chambers, would give his evenings to teaching or committee work. They never allowed themselves to breathe even to each other that life might have brighter things to show them than the neighbourhood of the Gospel Road. There was a certain narrowness in their devotion. They had their bitternesses and ignorances, like other people, but the more Robert knew of them, the more profound became his admiration for that potent spirit of social help which in our generation Cometism has done so much to develop, even among those of us who are but moderately influenced by Comte's philosophy, and can make nothing of the religion of humanity. Wardlaw has no large part in the story of Ellesmere's work in North R. In spite of Robert's efforts, and against his will, the man of meaner gifts and commoner clay was eclipsed by that brilliant and persuasive something in Ellesmere which a kind genius had infused into him at birth. And we shall see that in time Robert's energies took a direction which Wardlaw could not follow with any heartiness. But at the beginning Ellesmere owed him much, and it was a debt he was never tired of honouring. In the first place, Wardlaw's choice of the Elgood Street room as a fresh centre for civilising effort had been extremely shrewd. The district lying about it, as Robert soon came to know, contained a number of promising elements. Close by the dingy street which sheltered their schoolroom rose the great pile of a new factory of artistic pottery, a rival on the north side of the river to Dalton's immense works on the south. The old winding streets near it, and the blocks of workmen's dwellings recently erected under its shadow, were largely occupied by the workers in its innumerable floors, and among these workers was a large proportion of skilled artisans, men often of a considerable amount of cultivation, earning high wages and maintaining a high standard of comfort. A great many of them, trained in the art school which Murray Edwards had been largely instrumental in establishing within the easy distance of their houses, were men of genuine artistic gifts and accomplishment, and as the development of one faculty tends on the whole to set others working, when Robert, after a few weeks' work in the place, set up a popular historical lecture once a fortnight, announcing the fact by a blue and white poster in the schoolroom windows, it was the potters who provided him with his first hearers. The rest of the parish was divided between a population of dock labourers, settled there to supply the needs of the great dock which ran up into the southeastern corner of it, two or three huge breweries, and a colony of watchmakers, an offshoot of Clerkenwell, who lived together in two or three streets, and showed the same peculiarities of race and specialised training to be noticed in the more northerly settlement from which they had been thrown off like a swarm from a hive. Outside these well-defined trades, there was, of course, a warehouse population, and a mass of heterogeneous cadging and catering which went on chiefly in the riverside streets at the other side of the parish from Elgood Street, in the neighbourhood of St Wilfrid's. St Wilfrid's at this moment seemed to Robert to be doing a very successful work among the lowest strata of the parish. From them, at one end of the scale, and from the innumerable clerks and superintendents who during the daytime crowded the vast warehouses of which the district was full, its Lenten congregations, now its full activity, were chiefly drawn. The Protestant opposition, which had shown itself so brutally and persistently in old days, 
was now, so far as outward manifestations went, all but extinct. The cassocked, monk-like clergy might preach and process in the open air as much as they pleased. The populace, where it was not indifferent, was friendly, and devoted living had borne its natural fruits. A small incident, which need not be recorded, recalled to Ellesmere's mind, after he had been working some six weeks in the district, the forgotten unwelcome fact that St Wilfrid's was the very church where Newcombe, first as senior curate and then as vicar, had spent those ten wonderful years into which Ellesmere at Muirwell had been never tired of inquiring. The thought of Newcombe was a very sore thought. Ellesmere had written to him, announcing his resignation of his living immediately after his interview with the bishop. The letter had remained unanswered, and it was by now tolerably clear that the silence of its recipient meant a withdrawal from all friendly relations with the writer. Ellesmere's affectionate, sensitive nature took such things hardly, especially as he knew that Lucombe's life was becoming increasingly difficult and embittered. And it gave him now a fresh pang to imagine how Newcombe would receive the news of his quondam friend's infidel propaganda, established on the very ground where he himself had all but died for those beliefs Ellesmere had thrown over. But Robert was learning a certain hardness in this London life, which was not without its uses to character. Hitherto he had always swum with the stream, cheered by the support of all the great and prevailing English traditions. Here, he and his few friends were fighting a solitary fight, apart from the organised system of English religion and English philanthropy. All the elements of culture and religion already existing in the place were against them. The clergy of St Wilfrid's passed them with cold, averted eyes. The old and fainal rector of the parish church very soon let it be known what he thought as to the taste of Ellesmere's intrusion on his parish or as to the eternal chances of those who might take either him or Edwards as guides in matters religious. His enmity did Elgood Street no harm, and the pretensions of the church, in this babel of twenty thousand souls, to cover the whole field, bore clearly no relation at all to the facts. But every little incident in this new struggle of his life cost Ellesmere more, perhaps, than it would have cost other men. No part of it came easily to him. Only a high utopian vision drove him on from day to day, bracing him to act and judge, if need be, alone and for himself, approved only by conscience and the inward voice. Tasks in hours of insight willed can be in hours of gloom fulfilled. And it was that moment by the river which worked in him through all the prosaic and perplexing details of this new attempt to carry enthusiasm into life. It was soon plain to him that in this teeming section of London the chance of the religious reformer lay entirely among the upper working class. In London, at any rate, all that is most prosperous and intelligent among the working class holds itself aloof, broadly speaking, from all existing spiritual agencies, whether of church or dissent. Upon the genuine London artisan the church has practically no hold whatever and dissent has nothing like the hold which it has on similar material in the great towns of the north. Towards religion in general, the prevailing attitude is one of indifference tinged with hostility. Eight hundred thousand people in South London, of whom the enormous proportion belong to the working class, and among them church and dissent nowhere, Christianity is not in possession. Such is the estimate of an evangelical of our day, and similar laments come from all parts of the capital. The Londoner is, on the whole, more conceited, more prejudiced, more given over to crude theorising than his North Country brother, the Mill Hand, whose mere position, as one of a homogeneous and tolerably constant body, subjects him to a continuous discipline of intercourse and discussion. Our popular religion, broadly speaking, means nothing to him. He is sharp enough to see through its contradictions and absurdities. He has no dread of losing what he never valued. His sense of antiquity, of history, is nil, and his life supplies him with excitement enough without the stimulants of otherworldliness. Religion has been on the whole irrationally presented to him, and the result on his part has been an irrational breach with the whole moral and religious order of ideas. But the race is quick-witted and imaginative. The Greek cities, which welcomed and spread Christianity, carried within them much the same elements as are supplied by certain sections of the London working class, elements of restlessness, of sensibility, of passion. The mere intermingling of races 
which a modern capital shares with those old towns of Asia Minor, predisposes the mind to a greater openness and receptiveness, whether for good or evil. As the weeks passed on, and after the first inevitable despondency produced by strange surroundings and an unwonted isolation had begun to wear off, Robert often found himself filled with a strange flame and ardour of hope. But his first steps had nothing to do with religion. He made himself quickly felt in the night school, and as soon as he possibly could he hired a large room at the back of their existing room, on the same floor, where, on the recreation evenings, he might begin the storytelling which had been so great a success at Muirwell. The storytelling struck the neighbourhood as a great novelty. At first only a few youths struggled in from the front room, where dominoes and draughts and the illustrated papers held seductive sway. The next night the number was increased, and by the fourth or fifth evening the room was so well filled both by boys and a large contingent of artisans that it seemed well to appoint a special evening of the week for storytelling, or the recreation room would have been deserted. In these performances, Ellesmere's aim had always been twofold the rousing of moral sympathy, and the awakening of the imaginative power pure and simple. He ranged the whole world for stories. Sometimes it would be merely some feature of London life itself, the history of a great fire, for instance, and its hairbreadth escapes, a collision in the river, a string of instances as true and homely and realistic as they could be, made of the way in which the poor help one another. Sometimes it would be stories illustrating the dangers and difficulties of particular trades, a colliery explosion and the daring of the rescuers, incidents from the life of the great northern ironworks, or from that of the Lancashire factories, or stories of English country life and its humours, given sometimes in dialect, Devonshire or Yorkshire or Cumberland, for which he had a special gift. Or again he would take the sea in its terrors, the immortal story of the Birken Head, the deadly plunge of the captain, the records of the lifeboats, or the fascinating stories of the ships of science, exploring step by step through miles of water, the past, the inhabitants, the hills and valleys of that underworld, that vast Atlantic bed, in which Mont Blanc might be buried without showing even his topmost snowfield above the plain of waves. Then at other times it would be the simple frolic and fancy of fiction, fairy tale and legend, Greek myth or Icelandic saga, episodes from Walter Scott, from Cooper, from Dumas, to be followed perhaps on the next evening by the terse and vigorous biography of some man of the people, of Stevenson, or Cobden, of Thomas Cooper, or John Bright, or even of Thomas Carlyle. One evening, some weeks after it had begun, Hugh Flaxman, hearing from Rose of the success of the experiment, went down to hear his new acquaintance tell the story of Monte Cristo's escape from the Chateau d'If. He started an hour earlier than was necessary, and with an admirable impartiality he spent that hour at St Wilfrid's hearing vespers. Flaxman had a passion for intellectual or social novelty, and this passion was beguiling him into a close observation of Ellesmere. At the same time he was crossed and complicated by all sorts of fastidious conservative fibres, and when his friends talked rationalism, it often gave him a vehement pleasure to maintain that a good Catholic or ritualistic service was worth all their arguments, and would outlast them. His taste drew him to the church, so did a love of opposition to current isms. Bishops counted on him for subscriptions, and high church divines sent him their pamphlets. He never refused the subscriptions, but it should be added that with equal regularity he dropped the pamphlets into his waste-paper basket. Altogether, a not very decipherable person in religious matters, as Rose had already discovered. The change from the dim and perfumed spaces of St Wilfrid's to the bare warehouse room with its packed rows of listeners was striking enough. Here were no bowed figures, no reculement. In the blaze of crude light every eager eye was fixed upon the slight elastic figure on the platform, each change in the expressive face, each gesture of the long arms and thin flexible hands, finding its response in the laughter, the attentive silence, the frowning suspense of the audience. At one point a band of young roughs at the back made a disturbance, but their neighbours had the offenders quelled and out in a twinkling, and the room cried out for a repetition of the sentences which had been lost in the noise. When Dante's, opening his knife with his teeth, 
managed to cut the strings of the sack, a gasp of relief ran through the crowd. When at last he reached terra firma, there was a ringing cheer. "'What is he, do you know?' Flaxman heard a mechanic ask his neighbour, as Robert paused for a moment to get breath, the man jerking a grimy thumb in the storyteller's direction meanwhile. "'Seems like a parson somehow, but he ain't a parson.' "'Why not he?' said the other laconically. "'Knows better. Most of them as comes down here stuffs all they have to say as full of goody-goody as an egg's full of meat. If it were that sort, you wouldn't catch me here. Never heard him say anything in the dear brethren sort of style, and I've been here most of these evenings, and to his lectures besides. Perhaps he's one of those damned sly ones, said the first speaker dubiously. Means to shovel it in by and by. Well, I don't know as I could stand it if he did, returned his companion. He'd let other fellows have their say anyhow. Flaxman looked curiously at the speaker. He was a young man, a gas-fetter, to judge by the contents of the baskets he seemed to have brought in with him on his way from work, with eyes like live birds and small emaciated features. During the story, Flaxman had noticed the man's thin, begrimed hand as it rested on the bench in front of him, trembling with excitement. Another project of Robert's, started as soon as he had felt his way a little into the district, was the scientific Sunday school. This was the direct result of a paragraph in Huxley's Lay Sermons, where the hint of such a school was first thrown out. However, since the introduction of science teaching into the board schools, the novelty and necessity of such a supplement to a child's ordinary education is not what it was. Robert set it up mainly for the sake of drawing the boys out of the streets in the afternoons, and providing them with some other food for fancy and delight than larking and smoking and penny dreadfuls. A little simple chemical and electrical experiment went down greatly. So did a botany class, to which Ellesmere would come armed with two stores of flowers, one to be picked to pieces, the other to be distributed according to memory and attention. A year before he had had a number of large coloured plates of tropical fruit and flowers prepared for him by a Kew assistant. These he would often set up on a large screen, or put up on the walls, till the dingy schoolroom became a bar of superb blossom and luxuriant leaf, a glow of red and purple and orange. And then, still by the help of pictures, he would take his class on a tour through strange lands, talking to them of China or Egypt or South America, till they followed him up the Amazon or into the pyramids or through the Pampas or into the mysterious buried cities of Mexico, as the children of Hamlin followed the magic of the Pied Piper. Hardly any of those who came to him, adults or children, while almost all of the artisan class, were of the poorest class. He knew it, and had laid his plans for such a result. Such work as he had at heart has no chance with the lowest in the social scale, in its beginnings. It must have something to work upon, and must penetrate downwards. He only can receive who already hath. There is no profounder axiom. And meanwhile the months passed on and he was still brooding, still waiting. At last the spark fell. There, in the next street but one to Elgood Street, rose the famous Workmen's Club of North R. It had been started by a former liberal clergyman of the parish, whose main object, however, had been to train the workmen to manage it for themselves. His training had been, in fact, too successful. Not only was it now wholly managed by artisans, but it had come to be a centre of active, nay brutal, opposition to the church and faith which had originally fostered it. In organic connection with it was a large debating hall, in which the most notorious secularist lecturers held forth every Sunday evening, and next door to it, under its shadow and patronage, was a little dingy shop filled to overflowing with the coarsest free-thinking publications, Colonel Ingersoll's books occupying the place of honour in the window, and freethinker placard flaunting at the door. Inside, there was still more highly seasoned literature even than the freethinker to be had. There was in particular a small halfpenny paper which was understood to be in some sense the special organ of the North R Club, which was at any rate published close by and edited by one of the workmen founders of the club. This unsavoury sheet began to be more and more defiantly advertised through the parish as Lent drew on towards Passion Week, and the exertions of St. Wilfrid's and of the other churches, 
which had been spurred on by the ritualist's success, became more apparent. Soon it seemed to Robert that every bit of hoarding and every waste wall was filled with the announcement, Read Faith and Fools! Enormous success! Our comic life of Christ now nearly completed! Quite the best thing of its kind going! Would cut this week? Transfiguration! His heart grew fierce within him. One night in Passion Week he left the night school about ten o'clock. His way led him past the club, which was brilliantly lit up, and evidently in full activity. Round the door there was a knot of workmen lounging. It was a mild, moonlit April night, and the air was pleasant. Several of them had copies of Faith and Fools, and were showing the week's woodcut to those about them, with chuckles and spurts of laughter. Robert caught a few words as he hurried past them, and, stirred by a sudden impulse, turned into the shop beyond, and asked for the paper. The woman handed it to him, and gave him his change with a business-like sang-froid, which struck on his tired nerves almost more painfully than the laughing brutality of the men he had just passed. Directly he found himself in another street, he opened the paper under a lamp-post. It contained a caricature of the crucifixion, the scroll emanating from Mary Magdalene's mouth in particular, containing obscenities which cannot be quoted here. Robert thrust it into his pocket and strode on, every nerve quivering. "'This is Wednesday in Passion Week,' he said to himself. "'The day after tomorrow is Good Friday.' He walked fast in a northwesterly direction, and soon found himself within the city, where the streets were long since empty and silent. But he noticed nothing around him. His thoughts were in the distant east, among the flat roofs and white walls of Nazareth, the olives of Bethany, the steep streets and rocky ramparts of Jerusalem. He had seen them with the bodily eye, and the fact had enormously quickened his historical perception. The child of Nazareth, the moralist and teacher of Capernaum and Gennesaret, the strenuous seer and martyr of the later Jerusalem preaching, all these various images sprang into throbbing poetic life within him. That anything in human shape should be found capable of dragging this life and this death through the mire of a hideous and befouling laughter. Who was responsible? To what cause could one trace such a temper of mind towards such an object, present and militant as that temper is in all the crowded centres of working life throughout modern Europe? The toiler of the world, as he matures, may be made to love Socrates, or Buddha, or Marcus Aurelius. It would seem often as though he could not be made to love Jesus. Is it the nemesis that ultimately discovers and avenges the sublimest, the least conscious departure from simplicity and verity? Is it the last and most terrible illustration of a great axiom, faith has a judge in truth? He went home and lay awake half the night pondering if he could but pour out his heart. But though Catherine, the wife of his heart, of his youth, is there, close beside him, doubt and struggle and perplexity are alike frozen on his lips. He cannot speak without sympathy, and she will not hear except under a moral compulsion which he shrinks more and more painfully from exercising. The next night was a story-telling night. He spent it in telling the legend of St. Francis. When it was over, he asked the audience to wait a moment, and there and then, with the tender, imaginative Franciscan atmosphere, as it were, still about them, he delivered a short and vigorous protest in the name of decency, good feeling, and common sense, against the idiotic profanities with which the whole immediate neighbourhood seemed to be reeking. It was the first time he had approached any religious matter directly. A knot of workmen sitting together at the back of the room looked at each other with a significant grimace or two. When Robert ceased speaking, one of them, an elderly watchmaker, got up and made a dry and cynical little speech, nothing moving but the thin lips in the shriveled mahogany face. Robert knew the man well. He was a Genovese by birth, Calvinist by blood, revolutionist by development. He complained that Mr. Ellesmere had taken his audience by surprise, that a good many of those present understood the remarks he had just made as an attack upon an institution in which many of them were deeply interested, and that he invited Mr. Ellesmere to a more thorough discussion of the matter in a place where he could be both heard and answered. The room applauded with some signs of suppressed excitement. 
Most of the men there were accustomed to disputation of the sort which any Sunday visitor to Victoria Park may hear going on there week after week. Ellesmere had made a vivid impression, and the prospect of a fight with him had an unusual piquancy. Robert sprang up. "'When you will,' he said. "'I'm ready to stand by what I have just said in the face of you all, if you care to hear it.' Place and particulars were hastily arranged, subject to the approval of the club committee, and Ellesmere's audience separated in a glow of curiosity and expectation. "'Didn't I tell ye?' the Gasfitter's snarling friend said to him. "'Scratch him and you find the parson. These upper-class folk, when they come among us poor ones, always seem to me just hunting for souls, as those Injuns he was talking about last week hunt for scalps. They can't get to heaven without a certain number of them slung about em. "'Wait a bit,' said the Gasfitter, his quick dark eyes betraying a certain raised inner temperature. Next morning the North R Club was placarded with announcement that on Easter Eve next Robert Ellesmere, Esquire, would deliver a lecture in the debating hall on The Claim of Jesus Upon Modern Life, to be followed, as usual, by general discussion. End of Book 6, Chapter 38 Book 6, Chapter 39 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 6, Chapter 39 It was the afternoon of Good Friday. Catherine had been to church at St Paul's, and Robert, though not without some inward struggle, had accompanied her. Their midday meal was over, and Robert had been devoting himself to Mary, who had been tottering round the room in his wake, clutching one finger tight with her chubby hand. In particular, he had been coaxing her into friendship with a wooden Japanese dragon, which wound itself in awful yet most seductive coils round the cabinet at the end of the room. It was Mary's weekly task to embrace this horror, and the performance went by the name of Kissing the Jabberwock. It had been triumphantly achieved, and as the reward of bravery, Mary was being carried round the room on her father's shoulder, holding on mercilessly to his curls, her shining blue eyes darting scorn at the defeated monster. At last Robert deposited her on the rug beside a fascinating farmyard which lay there spread out for her, and stood looking, not at the child, but at his wife. "'Catherine, I feel so much as Mary did three minutes ago.' She looked up, startled. The tone was light, but the sadness, the emotion of the eyes, contradicted it. "'I want courage,' he went on. "'Courage to tell you something that may hurt you. And yet I ought to tell you.' Her face took the shrinking expression which was so painful to him, but she waited quietly for what he had to say. "'You know, I think,' he said, looking away from her to the grey museum outside, "'that my work in R hasn't been religious as yet at all. Oh, of course, I've said things here and there, but I haven't delivered myself in any way. Now there has come an opening.' And he described to her, while she shivered a little and drew herself together, the provocations which were leading him into a tussle with the North R Club. They have given me a very civil invitation. They are the sort of men, after all, whom it pays to get hold of, if one can. Among their fellows they are the men who think. One longs to help them to think to a little more purpose. "'What have you to give them, Robert?' asked Catherine, after a pause, her eyes bent on the child's stocking she was knitting. Her heart was full enough already, poor soul. Oh, the bitterness of this passion week! He'd been at her side often in church, but through all his tender silence and consideration she had divined the constant struggle in him between love and intellectual honesty, and it had filled her with a dumb irritation and misery indescribable. Do what she would, wrestle with herself as she would, there was constantly emerging in her now a note of anger, not with Robert, but, as it were, with those malign forces of which he was the prey. "'What have I to give them?' he repeated sadly. "'Very little, Catherine, as it seems to me to-night. But come and see.' His tone had a melancholy which went to her heart. In reality he was in that state of depression which often precedes a great effort. But she was startled by his suggestion. "'Come with you, Robert, to the meeting of a secularist club?' "'Why not?' I shall be there to protest against outrage to what both you and I hold dear, 
and the men are decent fellows. There will be no disturbance. "'What are you going to do?' she asked in a low voice. "'I have been trying to think it out,' he said with difficulty. "'I want simply, if I can, to transfer to their minds that image of Jesus of Nazareth which thought and love and reading have left upon my own. I want to make them realise for themselves the historical character, so far as it can be realised, to make them see for themselves the real figure, as it went in and out amongst men, so far as our eyes can now discern it. The words came quicker towards the end, while the voice sank, took the vibrating characteristic note the wife knew so well. "'How can that help them?' she said abruptly. "'Your historical Christ, Robert, will never win souls. "'If he was God, every word you speak will insult him. "'If he was man, he was not a good man.' "'Come and see,' was all he said, holding out his hand to her. "'It was in some sort a renewal of the scene at Les Avants, "'the inevitable renewal of an offer he felt bound to make, "'and she felt bound to resist.' She let her knitting fall, and placed her hand in his. The baby on the rug was alternately caressing and scourging a woolly bar lamb, which was the fetish of her childish worship. Her broken, incessant baby talk, and the ringing kisses with which she atoned to the bar lamb for each successive outrage, made a running accompaniment to the moved undertones of the parents. "'Don't ask me, Robert, don't ask me. Do you want me to come and sit thinking of last year's Easter Eve?' "'Heaven knows I was miserable enough last Easter Eve,' he said slowly. "'And now,' she exclaimed, looking at him with a sudden agitation of every feature, "'now you are not miserable? You are quite confident and sure? "'You are going to devote your life to attacking the few remnants of faith "'that still remain in the world?' "'Never in her married life had she spoken to him with this accent of bitterness and hostility. "'He started and withdrew his hand.' and there was a silence. "'I held once a wife in my arms,' he said presently, with a voice hardly audible, who said to me that she would never persecute her husband. But what is persecution if it is not the determination not to understand?' She buried her face in her hands. "'I could not understand,' she said sombrely. "'And rather than try,' he insisted, "'you will go on believing that I am a man without faith?' "'seeking only to destroy?' "'I know you think you have faith,' she answered. "'But how can it seem faith to me? "'He that will not confess me before men, "'him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. "'Your unbelief seems to me more dangerous "'than these horrible things which shock you. "'For you can make it attractive, you can make it loved, "'as you once made the faith of Christ loved.' He was silent. She raised her face presently, whereon were the traces of some of those quiet, difficult tears which were characteristic of her, and went softly out of the room. He stood a while leaning against the mantelpiece, deaf to little Mary's clamour, and to her occasional clutches at his knees, as she tried to raise herself on her tiny, tottering feet. A sense as though some fresh disaster was upon him. His heart was sinking, sinking within him. And yet none knew better than he that there was nothing fresh. It was merely that the scene had recalled to him anew some of those unpalatable truths which the optimist is always much too ready to forget. Heredity, the moulding force of circumstance, the iron hold of the past upon the present. A man like Ellesmere realises the working of these things in other men's lives with a singular subtlety and clearness, and is for ever overlooking them, running his head against them in his own. He turned, and laid his arms on the chimney-piece, burying his head on them. Suddenly he felt a touch on his knee, and looking down, saw Mary peering up, her masses of dark hair streaming back from the straining little face, the grave open mouth, and alarmed eyes. "'Father tis! Father tis!' she said imperatively. He lifted her up, and covered the little brown cheeks with kisses. But the touch of the child only woke in him a fresh dread, the like of something he had often divined of late in Catherine. Was she actually afraid now that he might feel himself bound in future to take her child spiritually from her? The suspicion of such a fear in her woke in him a fresh anguish. 
it seemed a measure of the distance they had travelled from that old, perfect unity. "'She thinks I could even become in time her tyrant and torturer,' he said to himself, with measureless pain. "'And who knows? Who can answer for himself? Oh, the puzzle of living!' When she came back into the room, pale and quiet, Catherine said nothing, and Robert went to his letters. But after a while she opened his study door. "'Robert, will you tell me what your stories are to be next week, and let me put out the pictures?' It was the first time she had made any such offer. He sprang up with a flash in his grey eyes, and brought her a slip of paper with a list. She took it without looking at him. But he caught her in his arms, and for a moment in that embrace the soreness of both hearts passed away. But if Catherine would not go, Ellesmere was not left on this critical occasion without auditors from his own immediate circle. On the evening of Good Friday, Flaxman had found his way to Bedford Square, and as Catherine was out, was shown into Ellesmere's study. "'I have come,' he announced, "'to try and persuade you and Mrs. Ellesmere to go down with me to Greenlaws to-morrow. My Easter party has come to grief, and it would be a real charity on your part to come and resuscitate it. Do. You look abominably fagged, and as if some country would do you good.' "'But I thought,' began Robert, taken aback. "'You thought,' repeated Flaxman coolly, that your two sisters-in-law were going down there with Lady Helen to meet some musical folk. Well, they're not coming. Miss Laban thinks your mother-in-law is not very well today, and doesn't like to come. And your younger sister prefers also to stay in town. Annie is much disappointed, so am I. But—and he shrugged his shoulders. Robert found it difficult to make a suitable remark. His sisters-in-law were certainly inscrutable young women. This Easter party at Greenlaws, Mr. Flaxman's country house, had been planned, he knew, for weeks. And certainly nothing could be very wrong with Mrs. Laban, or Catherine would have been warned. "'I am afraid your plans must be greatly put out,' he said, with some embarrassment. "'Of course they are,' replied Flaxman, with a dry smile. He stood opposite Ellesmere, his hands in his pockets. "'When you have a confidence,' the bright eyes seemed to say, "'I am quite ready.' "'Claim it if you like.' But Ellesmere had no intention of claiming it. The position of all Rose's kindred, indeed, at the present moment, was not easy. None of them had the least knowledge of Rose's mind. Had she forgotten Langham? Had she lost her heart afresh to Flaxman? No one knew. Flaxman's absorption in her was clear enough, but his love-making, if it were such, was not of an ordinary kind, and did not always explain itself. And moreover, his wealth and social position were elements in the situation calculated to make people like the Ellesmeres particularly diffident and discreet. Impossible for them, much as they liked him, to make any of the advances. No, Robert wanted no confidences. He was not prepared to take the responsibility of them. So, letting Rose alone, he took up his visitors' invitation to themselves and explained the engagement for Easter Eve which tied them to London. Phew, said Hugh Flaxman, but that would be a shindy worth seeing. I must come. Nonsense, said Robert, smiling. Go down to Greenlaws and go to church. That will be much more in your line. As for church, said Flaxman meditatively, if I put off my party altogether and stay in town, there will be this further advantage that, after hearing you on Saturday night, I can, with a blameless impartiality, spend the following day in St. Andrew's Well Street. Yes. I telegraph to Helen, she knows my ways, and I come down to protect you against an atheistical mob to-morrow night. Robert tried to dissuade him. He did not want Flaxman. Flaxman's Epicureanism, the easy tolerance with which, now that the effervescence of his youth had subsided, the man harboured and dallied with a dozen contradictory beliefs, were at time peculiarly antipathetic to Ellesmere. They were so now just as heart and soul were nerved to an effort which could not be made at all without the nobler sort of self-confidence. But Flaxman was determined. No, he said, this one day will give to heresy. Don't look so forbidding. In the first place you won't see me. In the next, if you did, you would feel me as wax in your hands. I am like the man in Sophocles, always the possession of the last speaker. One day I am all for the church, 
certain number of chances in the hundred there still are, you will admit that she is in the right of it. And if so, why should I cut myself off from a whole host of beautiful things not to be got out of her? But the next day, vive Ellesmere and the revolution. If only Ellesmere could persuade me intellectually. But I never yet came across a religious novelty that seemed to me to have a leg of logic to stand on. He laid his hand on Robert's shoulder, his eyes twinkling with a sudden energy. Robert made no answer. He stood erect, frowning a little, his hands thrust far into the pockets of his light grey coat. He was in no mood to disclose himself to Flaxman. The inner vision was fixed with extraordinary intensity on quite another sort of antagonist, with whom the mind was continuously grappling. "'Ah, well, till tomorrow,' said Flaxman, with a smile, shook hands, and went. Outside he hailed a cab and drove off to Lady Shardard's. He found his aunt and Mr. Winstay in the drawing-room alone, one on either side of the fire. Lady Shardard was reading the latest political biography with an apparent profundity of attention. Mr. Winstay was lounging and caressing the cat. But both his aunt's absorption and Mr. Winstay's nonchalance seemed to Flaxman overdone. He suspected a domestic breeze. Lady Charlotte made him effusively welcome. He had come to propose that she should accompany him the following evening to hear Ellesmere lecture. "'I advise you to come,' he said. "'Ellesmere will deliver his soul, and the amount of soul he has to deliver in these dull days is astounding. A dowdy dress and a veil, of course. I will go down beforehand and see someone on the spot, in case there should be difficulties about getting in. Perhaps Miss Laban, too, might like to hear her brother-in-law.' "'Really, Hugh?' cried Lady Charlotte impatiently. "'I think you might take your snubbing with dignity. "'Her refusal this morning to go to Greenlaws was brusqueness itself. "'To my mind that young person gives herself airs.' "'And the Duke of Semper's sister drew herself up with a rustle of all her ample frame. "'Yes, I was snubbed,' said Flaxman, unperturbed. "'That, however, is no reason why she shouldn't find it attractive to go to-morrow night.' "'And you will not let her see that, just because you couldn't get hold of her, "'you've given up your Easter party and left your sister in the lurch?' "'I never had excessive notions of dignity,' he replied composedly. "'You may make up any story you please. "'The real fact is that I want to hear Ellesmere.' "'You'd better go, my dear,' said her husband sardonically. "'I cannot imagine anything more piquant than an atheistic slum on Easter Eve.' "'Nor can I,' she replied her combativeness rousing at once. "'Much obliged to you, Hugh. I will borrow my housekeeper's dress and be ready to leave here at half-past seven. Nothing more was said of Rose, but Flaxman knew that she would be asked, and let it alone. "'Who? Ellesmere's? My dear aunt, when you happen to be the orthodox wife of a rising heretic, your husband's opinions are not exactly the spectacular performance they are to you and me. I think it most unlikely.' "'Oh, she persecutes him, does she?' "'She wouldn't be a woman if she didn't,' observed Mr. Winstay, sotto voce. The small dark man was lost in a great armchair, his delicate painter's hands playing with the fur of a huge Persian cat. Lady Charlotte threw him an eagle glance, and he subsided, for the moment. Flaxman, however, was perfectly right. There had been a breeze— it had just been announced to the master of the house by his spouse that certain socialist celebrities, who might any day be expected to make acquaintance with the police, were coming to dine at his table, to finger his spoons, and mix their diatribes with his champagne, on the following Tuesday. A vert rebellion had never served him yet, and he knew perfectly well that when it came to the point he should smile more or less affably upon these gentry, as he had smiled upon others of the same sort before but it had not yet come to the point, and his intermediate state was explosive in the extreme. Mr. Flaxman dexterously continued the subject of the Ellesmeres. Dropping his bantering tone, he delivered of himself a very delicate critical analysis of Catherine Ellesmere's temperament and position, as in the course of several months his intimacy with her husband had revealed them to him. He did it well, with acuteness and philosophical relish. The situation presented itself to him as an extremely refined and yet tragic phase of the religious difficulty, 
and it gave him intellectual pleasure to draw it out in words. Lady Charlotte sat listening, enjoying her nephew's crisp phrases, but also gradually gaining a perception of the human reality behind this word-play of Hughes. That good heart of hers was touched. The large imperious face began to frown. "'Dear me,' she said with a little sigh, "'don't go on, Hugh. I suppose it's because we all of us believe so little that the poor thing's point of view seems to one so unreal. All the same, however,' she added, regaining her usual role of magisterial common sense, "'a woman, in my opinion, ought to go with her husband in religious matters.' "'Provided, of course, she sets him at naught in all others,' put in Mr. Winstay, rising and daintily depositing the cat. "'Many men, however, my dear, might be willing to compromise it differently. Granted a certain modicum of worldly conformity, they would not be at all indisposed to a conscience clause.' He lounged out of the room, while Lady Charlotte shrugged her shoulders with a look at her nephew in which there was an irrepressible twinkle. Mr. Flaxman neither heard nor saw. Life would have ceased to be worth having long ago had he ever taken sides in the smallest degree in this menage. Flaxman walked home again, not particularly satisfied with himself and his manoeuvres. Very likely it was quite unwise of him to have devised another meeting between himself and Rose Laban so soon. Certainly she had snubbed him, there could be no doubt of that. Nor was he in much perplexity as to the reason. He had been forgetting himself, forgetting his role and the whole lie of the situation, and if a man would be an idiot he must suffer for it. He had distinctly been put back a move. The facts were very simple. It was now nearly three months since Langham's disappearance. During that time Rose Laban had been, to Flaxman's mind, enchantingly dependent on him. He played his part so well that the beautiful, high-spirited child had suited herself so naively to his acting. Evidently she had said to herself that his age, his former marriage, his relation to Lady Helen, his constant kindness to her and her sister, made it natural that she should trust him, make him her friend, and allow him an intimacy she allowed to no other male friend. And when once the situation had been so defined in her mind, how the girl's true self had come out! What delightful moments that intimacy had contained for him! He remembered how on one occasion he had been reading some browning to her and Helen, in Helen's crowded, belittered drawing-room, which seemed all piano and photographs and lilies of the valley. He never could exactly trace the connection between the passage he had been reading and what happened. Probably it was merely Browning's poignant, passionate note that had affected her. In spite of all her proud, bright reserve, both he and Helen often felt through these weeks that just below this surface there was a heart which quivered at the least touch. He finished the lines and laid down the book. Lady Helen heard her three-year-old boy crying upstairs and ran up to see what was the matter. He and Rose were left alone in the scented, far-lit room. And a jet of flame suddenly showed him the girl's face, turned away, convulsed with a momentary struggle for self-control. She raised her hand an instant to her eyes, not dreaming evidently that she could be seen in the dimness, and her gloves dropped from her lap. He moved forward, stooped on one knee, and as she held out her hand for the gloves, he kissed the hand very gently, detaining it afterwards as a brother might. There was not a thought of himself in his mind. Simply he could not bear that so bright a creature should ever be sorry. It seemed to him intolerable against the nature of things. If he could have procured for her at that moment a coerced and transformed Langham, a Langham fitted to make her happy, he could almost have done it. And, short of such radical consolation, the very least he could do was to go on his knee to her and comfort her in tender, brotherly fashion. She did not say anything. She let her hand stay a moment, and then she got up, put on her veil, left a quiet message for Lady Helen, and departed. Her whole manner to him was a full of a shy, shrinking sweetness. And when Rose was shy and shrinking, she was adorable. Well, and now he had never again gone nearly so far as to kiss her hand, and yet, because of an indiscreet moment, everything was changed between them. She had turned resentful standoff, 
nay, as nearly rude as a girl under the restraints of modern manners, can manage to be. He almost laughed as he recalled Helen's report of her interview with Rose that morning, in which he had tried to persuade a young person outrageously on her dignity to keep an engagement she had herself spontaneously made. "'I'm very sorry, Lady Helen,' Rose had said, her slim figure drawn up so stiffly that the small Lady Helen felt herself totally effaced beside her. "'But I'd rather not leave London this week. I think I will stay with Mamma and Agnes.' Nothing Lady Helen could say moved her or modified her formula of refusal. "'What have you been doing, Hugh?' his sister asked him, half dismayed, half provoked. Flaxman shrugged his shoulders and vowed he had been doing nothing. But in truth he knew very well that the day before he had overstepped the line. There had been a little scene between them, a quick passage of speech, a rash look and gesture on his part, which had been quite unpremeditated, but which had nevertheless transformed their relation. Rose had flushed up, had said a few incoherent words, which he had understood to be words of reproach, had left Lady Helen's as quickly as possible, and next morning his Greenlaw's party had fallen through. "'Check, certainly,' said Flaxman to himself ruefully, as he pondered these circumstances. "'Not mate, I hope, if one can but find out how not to be a fool in future.' And over his solitary fire he meditated far into the night. Next day, at half-past seven in the evening, he entered Lady Charlotte's drawing-room, gayer, brisker, more alert than ever. Rose started visibly at the sight of him, and shot a quick glance at the unblushing Lady Charlotte. "'I thought you were at Greenlaw's,' she could not help saying to him, as she coldly offered him her hand. Why had Lady Charlotte never told her he was to escort them? Her irritation rose anew. "'What can one do?' he said lightly. If Ellesmere will fix such a performance for Easter Eve. My party was at its last gasp, too. It only wanted a telegram to Helen to give it his coup de grace. Rose flushed up, but he turned on his heel at once, and began to banter his aunt on the housekeeper's bonnet and veil, in which she had a, a little too obviously disguised herself. And certainly, in the drive to the East End, Rose had no reason to complain or for importunity on his part. Most of the way he was deep in talk with Lady Charlotte as to a certain loan exhibition in the East End, to which he and a good many of his friends were sending pictures. Rose, leaning back silent in her corner, was presently seized with the little shock of surprise that there should be so many interests and relations in his life of which she knew nothing. He was talking now as the man of possessions and influence. She saw a glimpse of him as he was in his public aspect, and the kindness, the disinterestedness, the quiet sense, and the humour of his talk insensibly affected her as she sat listening. The mental image of him which had been dominant in her mind altered a little. Nay, she grew a little hot over it. She asked herself scornfully whether she were not as ready as any bread-and-butter miss of her acquaintance to imagine every man she knew in love with her. Very likely he had meant what he said quite differently, and she, Oh, humiliation! Have flown into a passion with him for no reasonable cause. Supposing he had meant two days ago that if they were to go on being friends, she must let him be her lover too. It would, of course, have been unpardonable. How could she let any one talk to her of love yet? Especially Mr. Flaxman, who guessed, as she was quite sure, what had happened to her. He must despise her to have imagined it. His outbursts have filled her with the oddest, most petulant resentment. Were all men self-seeking? Did all men think women shallow and fickle? Could a man and a woman never be honestly and simply friends? If he had made love to her, he could not possibly, and there was the sting of it, feel towards her maiden dignity that romantic respect which she herself cherished towards it. For it was incredible that any delicate-minded girl should go through such a crisis as she had gone through, and then fall calmly into another lover's arms a few weeks later, as though nothing had happened. How we all attitudinize to ourselves! The whole of life often seems one long, dramatic performance, in which one half of us is for ever posing to the other half. But had he really made love to her? Had he meant what she'd assumed him to mean? 
The girl lost herself in a torment of memory and conjecture. And meanwhile Mr. Flaxman sat opposite, talking away, and looking certainly as little lovesick as any man can well look. As the lamps flashed into the carriage, her attention was often caught by his profile and finely balanced head, by the hand lying on his knee, or the little gestures, full of life and freedom, with which he met some raid of Lady Charlotte's on his opinions, or opened a corresponding one on hers. There was certainly power in the man, a bright human sort of power, which inevitably attracted her, and that he was good, too, she had special grounds for knowing. But what an aristocrat he was, after all! What an, what an over-prosperous, exclusive set he belonged to! She lashed herself into anger as the other two chatted and sparred, with all these names of wealthy cousins and relations, with their parks and their pedigrees and their pictures. The aunt and nephew were debating how they could have best bleed the family, in its various branches, of the art treasures belonging to it, for the benefit of the East Enders. Therefore the names were inevitable. But Rose curled her delicate lip over them. And was it the best breeding, she wondered, to leave a third person so ostentatiously outside the conversation? "'Miss Leban, why are you coughing?' said Lady Charlotte suddenly. "'There is a great draught," said Rose, shivering a little. "'So there is,' cried Lady Charlotte. "'Why, we have got both the windows open. Hugh, draw up Miss Leban's.' He moved over to her and drew it up. "'I thought you liked a tornado.' he said to her, smiling. "'Will you have a shawl? There is one behind me.' "'No, thank you,' she replied rather stiffly, and he was silent, retaining his place opposite to her, however. "'Have you reached Mr. Ellesmere's part of the world yet?' asked Lady Charlotte, looking out. "'Yes, we are not far off. The river is to our right. We shall pass St. Wilfrid soon.' The coachman turned into a street where an open-air market was going on. The roadway and pavements were swarming. The carriage could barely pick its way through the masses of human beings. Flaming gas-jets threw it all into strong satanic light and shade. At the corner of a dingy alley, Rose could see a fight going on. The begrimed, ragged children, regardless of the April rain, swooped backwards and forwards under the very hoofs of the horses, or flattened their noses against the windows whenever the horses were forced into a walk. The young girl figure in grey with the grey-feathered hat, seemed specially to excite their notice. The glare of the street brought out the lines of the face, the gold of the hair. The Arabs outside made loutishly flattering remarks once or twice, and Rose, colouring, drew back as far as she could into the carriage. Mr. Flaxman seemed not to hear. His aunt, with that obtrusive thirst for information which is so fashionable now among all women of position, was cross-questioning him as to the trades and population of the district, and he was dryly responding. In reality, his mind was full of a whirl of feeling, of a wild longing to break down a futile barrier and trample on a baffling resistance, to take that beautiful, tameless creature in strong, coercing arms, scold her, crush her, love her. But why does she make happiness so difficult? What right has she to hold devotion so cheap? He, too, grows angry. She was not in love with that spectral creature, the inner self declares with energy. I will vow she never was. But she is like all the rest, a slave to the merest forms and trappings of sentiment. Because he ought to have loved her, and didn't, because she fancied she loved him, and didn't, my love is to be an offence to her. Monstrous! Unjust! Suddenly they sped past St. Wilfrid's, resplendent with lights, the jewelled windows of the choir rising above the squalid walls and roofs into the rainy darkness, as the mystical chapel of the Graal, with its torches glimmering fair, flashed out of the mountain storm and solitude on to Galahad's seeking eyes. Rose bent forward involuntarily. "'What angels singing?' she said, dropping the window again to listen to the retreating sounds, her artist's eye kindling. Did you hear it? It was the last chorus in the St. Matthew Passion music. I did not distinguish it, he said, but their music is famous. His tone was distant. There was no friendliness in it. It would have been pleasant to her if he would have taken up her little remark and let bygones be bygones. But he showed no readiness to do so. 
the subject dropped, and presently he moved back to his former seat and Lady Charlotte, and he resumed their talk. Rose could not but see that his manner towards her was much changed. She herself had compelled it, but all the same she saw him leave her with a capricious little pang of regret, and afterwards the drive seemed to her more tedious and the dismal streets more dismal than before. She tried to forget her companions altogether. Ah, what would Robert have to say? She was unhappy, restless. In her trouble, lately it had often pleased her to go quite alone to strange churches, where for a moment the burden of the self had seemed lightened. But the old things were not always congenial to her, and there were modern ferments at work in her. No one of her family, unless it were Agnes, suspected what was going on. But in truth the rich, crude nature had been touched at last, as Roberts had been long ago in Mr. Gray's lecture-room, by the piercing undervoices of things, the moral message of the world. "'What will you have to say?' she asked herself again, feverishly, and as she looked across to Mr. Flaxman, she felt a childish wish to be friends again with him, with everybody. Life was too difficult as it was, without quarrels and misunderstandings, to make it worse. End of Book Six Chapter 39Book Six, Chapter Forty of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Forty. A long street of warehouses, and at the end of it the horses slackened. I saw the president of the club yesterday," said Flaxman, looking out. "He's an old friend of mine, a most intelligent fanatic. Met him on a mansion house fund committee last winter. He promised we should be looked after, but we should only get back seats, and you'll have to put up with the smoking. They don't want ladies, and we should only be there on sufferance. The carriage stopped. Mr. Flaxman guided his charges with some difficulty through the crowd about the steps, who inspected them and their vehicle with a frank and not over-friendly curiosity. At the door they found a man who had been sent to look for them, and were immediately taken possession of. He ushered them into the back of a large, bare hall, glaringly lit, lined with white brick, and hung at intervals with political portraits and a few cheap engravings of famous men, Jesus of Nazareth taking his turn with Buddha, Socrates, Moses, Shakespeare, and Paul of Tarsus. "'Can't put you any further, I'm afraid,' said their guide, with a shrug of the shoulders. "'The committee don't like strangers coming, and Mr. Collett, he got all over the coals for letting you in this evening.' a new position for Lady Charlotte to be anywhere on sufferance. However, in the presence of three hundred smoking men, who might all of them be political assassins in disguise for anything she knew, she accepted her fate with meekness, and she and Rose settled themselves into their back seat under a rough sort of gallery, glad of their veils, and nearly blinded with the smoke. The hall was nearly full, and Mr. Flaxman looked curiously round upon its occupants. The majority of them were clearly artisans, a spare, stooping, sharp-featured race. Here and there were a knot of stalwart dock labourers, strongly marked out in physique from the watchmakers and the potters, or an occasional seaman out of work, ship-steward, boatswain, or what not, generally bronzed, quick-eyed, and comely, save where the film of excess had already deadened colour and expression. Almost every one had a pot of beer before him, standing on long wooden flaps attached to the benches. The room was full of noise, coming apparently from the farther end, where some political bravo seemed to be provoking his neighbours. In their own vicinity the men scattered about were for the most part tugging silently at their pipes, alternately eyeing the clock and the newcomers. There was a stir of feet round the door. And "'There he is,' said Mr. Flaxman, craning round to see, and Robert entered. He started as he saw them, flashed a smile to Rose, shook his head at Mr. Flaxman, and passed up the room. "'He looks pale and nervous,' said Lady Charlotte grimly, pouncing at once on the unpromising side of things. "'If he breaks down, are you prepared, Hugh, to play Elisha?' Flaxman was far too much interested in the beginnings of the performance to answer. Robert was standing forward on the platform, the chairman of the meeting at his side, members of the committee sitting behind on either hand. A good many men put down their pipes, and the hubbub of talk ceased. Others smoked on stolidly. 
the chairman introduced the lecturer. The subject of the address would be, as they already knew, the claim of Jesus upon modern life. It was not very likely, he imagined, that Mr. Ellesmere's opinions would square with those dominant in the club, but whether or no, he claimed for him, as for everybody, a patient hearing, and the Englishman's privilege of fair play. The speaker, a cabinet-maker dressed in a decent brown suit, spoke with fluency, and at the same time with that accent of moderation and savoir-faire which some Englishmen, in all classes, have obviously inherited from centuries of government by discussion. Lady Charlotte, whose liberalism was the mere varnish of an essentially aristocratic temper, was conscious of a certain dismay at the culture of the democracy as the man sat down. Mr. Flaxman, glancing to the right, saw a group of men standing, and amongst them a slight, sharp-featured thread-paper of a man with a taller companion, whom he identified as the pair he had noticed on the night of the storytelling. The little gas-fitter was clearly all nervous fidget and expectation, the other large and gaunt in vigour, with a square and impassive face and close-shut lips that had a perpetual mocking twist in the corners, stood beside him like some clumsy modern version in a commoner clay of Goethe's spirit that denies. Robert came forward with a roll of papers in his hand. His first words were hardly audible. Rose felt her colour rising. Lady Charlotte glanced at her nephew. The standing group of men cried, "'Speak up!' The voice in the distance rose at once, braced by the touch of difficulty, and what it said came firmly down to them. In after days Flaxman could not often be got to talk of the experience of this evening. When he did, he would generally say, briefly, that as an intellectual effort he had never been inclined to rank this first public utterance very high among Ellesmere's performances. The speaker's own emotion had stood somewhat in his way. A man argues better, perhaps, when he feels less. "'I have often heard him put his case, as I thought, more cogently in conversation,' Flaxman would say, though only to his most intimate friends. "'But what I never saw before or since was such an effect of personality as he produced that night. From that moment, at any rate, I loved him, and I understood his secret.' Elsmere began with a few words of courteous thanks to the club for the hearing they had promised him. Then he passed on to the occasion of his address, the vogue in the district of certain newspapers which, I understand, are specially relished and patronised by your association. And he laid down on a table beside him the copies of The Free Thinker and Of Faith and Fools, which he had brought with him, and faced his audience again, his hands on his sides. Well, I'm not here tonight to attack those newspapers. I want to reach your sympathies, if I can, in another way. If there is anybody here who takes pleasure in them, who thinks that such writing and such witticisms as he gets pervade to him in these sheets do really help the cause of truth and intellectual freedom, I shall not attack his position from the front. I shall try to undermine it. I shall aim at rising in him such a state of feeling as may suddenly convince him that what is injured by writing of this sort is not the orthodox Christian, or the Church, or Jesus of Nazareth, but always, and inevitably, the man who writes it and the man who loves it. His mind is possessed of an inflaming and hateful image, which drives him to mockery and violence. I want to replace it, if I can, by one of calm, of beauty and tenderness, which may drive him to humility and sympathy. And this, indeed, is the only way in which opinion is ever really altered, by the substitution of one mental picture for another. But in the first place, resumed the speaker, after a moment's pause, changing his note a little. A word about myself. I am not here to-night quite of the position of the casual stranger coming down to your district for the first time. As some of you know, I am endeavouring to make what is practically a settlement among you, asking you working men to teach me, if you will, what you have to teach as to the wants and prospects of your order, and offering you in return whatever there is in me which may be worth your taking. Well, I imagine I should look at a man who preferred a claim of that sort with some closeness. You may well ask me for antecedents, and I should like, if I may, to give them to you very shortly. Well, then, though I came down to this place under the wing of Mr. Edwards, some cheery, who is so greatly liked and respected here, I am not a Unitarian, nor am I an English churchman. A year ago I was the vicar of an English country parish, where I should have been proud 
so far as personal happiness went, to spend my life. Last autumn I left it, and resigned my orders, because I could no longer accept the creed of the English Church. Unconsciously, the thin, dignified figure drew itself up. The voice took a certain dryness. All this was distasteful, but the orator's instinct was imperious. As he spoke, about a score of pipes which had been till now active in Flaxman's neighbourhood went down. The silence in the room became suddenly of a perceptibly different quality. Since then, I have joined no other religious association, but it is not, God forbid, because there is nothing left me to believe, but because in this transition England it is well for a man who has broken with the old things to be very patient. No good can come of forcing opinion or agreement prematurely. A generation, nay more, may have to spend itself in mere waiting and preparing for those new leaders and those new forms of corporate action which any great revolution of opinion, such as that we are now living through, has always produced in the past, and will, we are justified in believing, produce again. But the hour and the men will come, and they also serve who only stand and wait. Voice and look had kindled into fire. Consciousness of his audience was passing from him. The world of ideas was growing clearer. So much, then, for personalities of one sort. There are some of another, however, which I must touch upon for a moment. I am to speak to you to-night of the Jesus of history, but not only as an historian. History is good, but religion is better. And if Jesus of Nazareth concerned me, and in my belief concerned you, only as an historical figure, I should not be here to-night. But if I am to talk religion to you, and I have begun by telling you I am not this, not that, it seems to me that for mere clearness' sake, for the sake of that round and whole image of thought which I want to present to you, you must let me run through a preliminary confession of faith, as short and simple as I can make it. You must let me describe certain views of the universe and of man's place in it, which make the framework, as it were, into which I shall ask you to fit the picture of Jesus which will come after. Robert stood a moment, considering. An instant's nervousness, a momentary sign of self-consciousness, would have broken the spell and set the room against him. He showed neither. "'My friends,' he said at last, speaking to the crowded benches of London workmen, with the same plimplicity he would have used towards his boys at Muirwell, "'the man who is addressing you to-night believes in God.' and in conscience, which is God's witness to the soul, and in experience, which is at once the record and the instrument of man's education at God's hands. He places his whole trust, for life and death, in God the Father Almighty, in that force at the root of things which is revealed to us whenever a man helps his neighbour, or a mother denies herself for her child, whenever a soldier dies without a murmur for his country or a sailor puts out in the darkness to rescue the perishing. Whenever a workman throws mind and conscience into his work, or a statesman labours not for his own gain, but for that of the state. He believes in an eternal goodness, and an eternal mind, of which nature and man are the continuous and the only revelation. The room grew absolutely still, and into the silence there fell, one by one, the short, terse sentences, in which the seer, the believer, struggled to express what God has been, is, and will ever be to the soul which trusts him. In them the whole effort of the speaker was really to restrain, to moderate, to depersonalise the voice of faith. But the intensity of each word burnt it into the hearer as it was spoken. Even Lady Charlotte turned a little pale. The tears stood in her eyes. Then, from the witness of God in the soul and in the history of man's moral life, Ellesmere turned to the glorification of experience, of that unvarying and rational order of the world which has been the appointed instrument of man's training since life and thought began. There, he said slowly, in the unbroken sequences of nature, in the physical histories of the world, in the long history of man, physical, intellectual, moral, there lies a revelation of God. There is no other, my friends. Then, while the room hung on his words, he entered on a brief exposition of the text, Miracles do not happen, restating Hume's old argument, and adding to it some of the most cogent of those modern arguments drawn from literature, 
from history, from the comparative study of religions and religious evidence, which were not practically at Hume's disposal, but which are now affecting the popular mind, as Hume's reasoning could never have affected it. We are now able to show how miracles, or the belief in it, which is the same thing, comes into being. The study of miracle in all nations and under all conditions yields everywhere the same results. Miracle may be the child of imagination, of love, nay, of a passionate sincerity, but invariably it lives with ignorance and is withered by knowledge. And then, with lightning unexpectedness, he turned upon his audience as though the ardent soul reacted at once against a strain of mere negation. But do not let yourselves imagine for an instant that, because in a rational view of history there is no place for a resurrection and ascension, therefore you may profitably allow yourself a mean and miserable mirth of this sort over the past. And his outstretched hand struck the newspapers beside him with a passion. Do not imagine for an instant that what is binding, adorable, beautiful in that past is done away with when miracle is given up. No, thank God. We still live by admiration, hope, and love. God only draws closer. Great men become greater. Human life more wonderful as miracle disappears. Woe to you if you cannot see it. It is the testing truth of our day. And besides, do you suppose that mere violence, mere invective, and savage mockery ever accomplished anything? Nay, what is more to the point, ever destroyed anything in human history? No, an idea cannot be killed from without. It can only be supplanted, transformed by another idea, and that one of equal virtue and magic. Strange paradox. In the moral world you cannot pull down except by gentleness. You cannot revolutionise except by sympathy. Jesus only superseded Judaism by absorbing and recreating all that was best in it. There are no inexplicable gaps and breaks in the story of humanity. The religion of today, with all its faults and mistakes, will go on unshaken, so long as there is nothing else of equal loveliness and potency to put in its place. The Jesus of the churches will remain paramount, so long as the man of today imagines himself dispensed by any increase of knowledge from loving the Jesus of history. But why, you will ask me, what does the Jesus of history matter to me? And so he was brought to the place of great men in the development of mankind, to the part played by the human story by those lives in which men have seen all their noblest thoughts of God, of duty, and of law embodied, realised before them with a shining and incomparable beauty. You think, because it is becoming plain to the modern eye that the ignorant love of his first followers wreathed his life in legend, that therefore you can escape from Jesus of Nazareth, you can put him aside as though he had never been. Folly! Do what you will, you cannot escape him. His life and death underlie our institutions as the alphabet underlies our literature. Just as the lives of Buddha and of Mohammed are wrought ineffaceably into the civilizations of Africa and Asia, so the life of Jesus is wrought ineffaceably into the higher civilization, the nobler social conceptions of Europe. It is wrought into your being and into mine. We are what we are tonight as Englishmen and as citizens, largely because a Galilean peasant was born and grew to manhood and preached and loved and died. And you think that a fact so tremendous can be just scoffed away, that we can get rid of it and of our share in it by a ribald paragraph and a caricature. No. Your hatred and your ridicule are parlous. And thank God they are parlous. There is no wanton waste in the moral world any more than in the material. There is only fruitful change and beneficent transformation. Granted that the true story of Jesus of Nazareth was from the beginning obscured by error and mistake. Granted that those errors and mistakes which were once the strength of Christianity are now its weakness, and by the slow march and sentence of time are now threatening, unless we can clear them away to lessen the hold of Jesus on the love and remembrance of men. What then? The fact is merely a call to you and me, who recognise it, to go back to the roots of things, to reconceive the Christ, to bring him afresh into our lives, to make the life so freely given for man minister again in new ways to man's new needs. 
Every great religion is, in truth, a concentration of great ideas, capable, as all ideas are, of infinite expansion and adaptation. And woe to our human weakness if it loose its hold one instant before it must on any one of those rare and precious possessions which have helped it in the past, and may again inspire it in the future. To reconceive the Christ. It is the special task of our age, though in some sort and degree it has been the ever-recurring task of Europe since the beginning. He paused, and then very simply, and so as to be understood by those who heard him, he gave a rapid sketch of that great operation worked by the best intellect of Europe during the last half-century, broadly speaking, on the facts and documents of primitive Christianity. From all sides, and by the help of every conceivable instrument, those facts have been investigated, and now at last the great result, the revivified, reconceived truth, seems ready to emerge. Much may still be known, much can never be known, but if we will we may now discern the true features of Jesus of Nazareth, as no generation but our own has been able to discern them, since those who have seen and handled passed away. Let me try, however feebly, and draw it afresh for you, that life of lives, that story of stories, as the labour of our own age in particular has patiently revealed it to us. Come back with me through the centuries. Let us try and see the Christ of Galilee and the Christ of Jerusalem as he was, before a credulous love and Jewish tradition and Greek subtlety had at once dimmed and glorified the truth. Ha! Do what we will, it is so scanty and poor, this knowledge of ours, compared with all that we yearn to know. But such as it is, let me, very humbly and very tentatively, endeavour to put it before you. At this point, Flaxman's attention was suddenly distracted by a stir round the door of entrance on his left hand. Looking round, he saw a ritualist priest in cassock and cloak, disputing in hurried undertones with the men about the door. At last he gained his point, apparently, for the men, with half-angry, half-quizzing looks at each other, allowed him to come in, and he found a seat. Flaxman was greatly struck by the face, by its ascetic beauty, the stern and yet delicate whiteness and emaciation of it. He sat with both hands resting on the stick he held in front of him, intently listening, the perspiration of physical weakness on his brow and round his finely curved mouth. Clearly he could hardly see the lecturer, for the room had become inconveniently crowded, and the men about him were mostly standing. "'One of the St. Wilfrid's priests, I suppose,' Flaxman said to himself. "'What on earth is he doing, dans cette galère? Are we to have a disputation? That would be dramatic.' He had no attention, however, to spare, and the intruder was promptly forgotten. When he turned back to the platform, he found that Robert, with Mackay's help, had hung on a screen to his right four or five large drawings of Nazareth, of the lake of Gennesaret, of Jerusalem, and the temple of Herod, of the ruins of that synagogue on the probable site of Capernaum in which conceivably Jesus may have stood. They were bold and striking, and filled the bare hall at once with suggestions of the East. He used them often at Meowell. Then, adopting a somewhat different tone, he plunged into the life of Jesus. He brought to it all his trained historical power, all his story-telling faculty, all his sympathy with the needs of feeling. And bit by bit, as the quick, nervous sentences issued and struck, each like the touch of a chisel, the majestic figure emerged, set against its natural background, instinct with some fraction at least of the magic of reality, most human, most persuasive, most tragic. He brought out the great words of the new faith, to which, whatever may be their literal origin, Jesus, and Jesus only, gave currency and immortal force. He dwelt on the magic, the permanence, the expansiveness of the young Nazarene's central conception, the spiritualized, universalized kingdom of God. Elsmer's thought, indeed, knew nothing of a perfect man as he knew nothing of an incarnate God. He shrank from nothing that he believed true, but every limitation Every reserve he allowed himself did but make the whole more poignantly real and the claim of Jesus more penetrating. The world has grown since Jesus preached in Galilee and Judea, 
We cannot learn the whole of God's lesson from him now. Nay, we could not then. But all that is most essential to man, all that saves the soul, all that purifies the heart, that he has still for you and me, as he had it for the men and women of his own time. Then he came to the last scenes. His voice sank a little, his notes dropped from his hand, and the silence grew more oppressive. The dramatic force, the tender passionate insight, the fearless modernness with which the story was told, made it almost unbearable. Those listening saw the trial, the streets of Jerusalem, that desolate place outside the northern gate. They were spectators of the torture, they heard the last cry. No one present had ever so seen, so heard before. Rose had hidden her face. Flaxman, for the first time, forgot to watch the audience. The men had forgotten each other, and for the first time that night, in many a cold, embittered heart, there was born that love of the Son of Man which Nathaniel felt, and John, and Mary of Bethany, and which has in it now, as then, the promise of the future. He laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock, and he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. The ashes of Jesus of Nazareth mingled with the earth of Palestine. Far hence he lies in the lawn Syrian town, and on his grave with shining eyes the Syrian stars look down. He stopped. The melancholy cadence of the verse died away. Then a gleam broke over the pale, exhausted face, a gleam of extraordinary sweetness. And in the days and weeks that followed the devout and passionate fancy of a few mourning Galileans begat the exquisite fable of the resurrection. How natural, and amid all its falseness, how true is that naive and contradictory story! The rapidity with which it spread is a measure of many things. It is above all a measure of the greatness of Jesus, of the force with which he had drawn to himself the hearts and imaginations of men. And now, my friends, what of all this? If these things I have been saying to you are true, what is the upshot of them for you and me? Simply this, as I conceive it, that instead of wasting your time and degrading your souls by indulgence in such grime as this, and he pointed to the newspapers, it is your urgent business, and mine, at this moment, to do our very utmost to bring this life of Jesus, our precious, invaluable possession as a people, back into some real and cogent relation with our modern lives and beliefs and hopes. Do not answer me that such an effort is a mere dream and futility, conceived in the vague, apart from reality. The men must have something to worship, and that if they cannot worship Jesus they will not trouble to love him. Is the world desolate, with God still in it, and does it rest merely with us to love or not to love? Love and revere something we must, if we are to be men and not beasts. At all times and in all nations, as I have tried to show you, man has helped himself by the constant and passionate memory of those great ones of his race who have spoken to him most audibly of God and of his eternal hope. And for us Europeans and Englishmen, as I have also tried to show you, History and inheritance have decided. If we turn away from the true Jesus of Nazareth because he has been disfigured and misrepresented by the churches, we turn away from that in which our weak wills and desponding souls are meant to find their most obvious and natural help and inspiration, from that symbol of the divine which of necessity means most to us. No, give him back your hearts. Be ashamed that you have ever forgotten your debt to him. Let combination and brotherhood do for the newer and simpler faith which they did once for the old. Let them give it a practical shape, a practical grip on human life. Then we too shall have our Easter. We too shall have the right to say, He is not here, He is risen. Not here in legend, in miracle, in the beautiful outworn forms and crystallizations of older thought. He is risen in a wiser reverence and a more reasonable love. Risen in new forms of social help, inspired by his memory, called afresh by his name. Risen, if you and your children will it, in a church or company of the faithful, over the gates of which two sayings of man's past, into which man's present has breathed new meanings, shall be written. In thee, O Eternal, have I put my trust, and this do in remembrance of me. 
the rest was soon over. The audience woke from the trance in which it had been held with a sudden burst of talk and movement. In the midst of it, and as the majority of the audience were filing out into the adjoining rooms, the gasfitter's tall companion, Andrews, mounted the platform, while the gasfitter himself, with an impatient shrug, pushed his way into the outgoing crowd. Andrews went slowly and deliberately to work, dealing out his long, cantankerous sentences with a natal sang froid which seemed to change in a moment the whole aspect and temperature of things. He remarked that Mr. Ellesmere had talked of what great scholars had done to clear up this matter of Christ and Christianity. Well, he was free to maintain that old Tom Paine was as good a scholar as any of them, and most of them in that hall knew what he thought about it. Tom Paine hadn't anything to say against Jesus Christ, and he hadn't. He was a workman and a fine sort of man, and if he'd been alive now, he'd have been a socialist, as most of us are, and he'd have made it hot for the rich loafers and the sweaters and the middlemen, as we'd like to make it hot for them. But as for those people who got up the church, mythologists, Tom Paine called them, and the miracles, and made an uncommonly good thing out of it, pecuniarily speaking, he didn't see what they got to do with keeping up or mending or preserving their precious bit of work. The world have found them out, and serve them right. And he wound up with a fierce denunciation of priests, not without a harsh savour and eloquence, which was much clapped by the small knot of workmen amongst whom he had been standing. Then there followed a socialist, an eager, ugly, black-bearded little fellow, who preached the absolute necessity of doing without any cultus whatsoever, through scorn on both the Christians and the positivists, for refusing so to deny themselves, and appealed earnestly to his group of hearers to help in bringing religion back from heaven to earth where it belongs. Mr. Ellesmere's new church, if he ever got it, would only be a fresh instrument in the hands of the bourgeoisie and when the people have got their rights and brought down the capitalists, they are not going to be such fools as to put their necks under the heels of what were called the educated classes. The people who wrote the newspapers Mr. Ellesmere objected to knew quite enough for the working man, and people should not be too smooth-spoken. What the working class wanted beyond everything just now was grit. A few other short speeches followed, mostly of the common secularist type, in defence of the newspapers attacked but the defence, on the whole, was shuffling and curiously half-hearted. Robert, sitting by with his head on his hand, felt that there, at any rate, his onslaught had told. He said a few words in reply, in a low, husky voice, without a trace of his former passion, and the meeting broke up. The room had quickly filled when it was known that he was up again, and as he descended the steps of the platform, after shaking hands with the chairman, the hundreds present broke into a sudden burst of cheering. Lady Charlotte pressed forward to him through the crowd, offering to take him home. "'Come with us, Mr. Ellesmere. You look like a ghost.' But he shook his head, smiling. "'No, thank you, Lady Charlotte. I must have some air.' And he took her out on his arm, while Flaxman followed with Rose. It once occurred to Flaxman to look round for the priest he had seen come in, but there was no signs of him. I had an idea he would have spoken, he thought. Just as well, perhaps, we should have had a row. Lady Charlotte threw herself back in the carriage as they drove off, with a long breath and the inward reflection. So his wife wouldn't come and hear him. Must be a woman with a character, that. A Strafford in petticoats. Robert turned up the street to the city, the tall, slight figure seeming to shrink together as he walked. After his passionate effort, indescribable depression had overtaken him. "'Words, words,' he said to himself, striking out his hands in a kind of feverish protest as he strode along, against his own powerlessness, against that weight of the present and the actual which seems to the enthusiast alternately light as air or heavy as the mass of Etna on the breast of Enceladus. Suddenly, at the corner of a street, a man's figure in a long black robe stopped him and laid a hand on his arm. "'Newcombe!' cried Robert, standing still. "'I was there,' said the other, bending forward and looking close into his eyes. "'I heard almost all. I went to confront, to denounce you.' By the light of a lamp not far off, Robert caught the attenuated whiteness and sharpness of the well-known face, to which weeks of fasting and mystical excitement had given a kind of unearthly remoteness. 
He gathered himself together with an inward groan. He felt as though there were no force in him at that moment wherewith to meet reproaches, to beat down fanaticism. The pressure on nerve and strength seemed unbearable. Newcombe, watching him with eagle eye, saw the sudden shrinking and hesitation. He had often in old days felt the same sense of power over the man who yet, in what seemed his weakness, had always escaped him in the end. "'I went to denounce,' he continued, in a strange, tense voice, "'and the Lord refused it to me. He kept me watching for you here. These words are not mine, I speak. I waited patiently in that room till the Lord should deliver his enemy into my hand. My wrath was hot against the deserter that could not even desert in silence, hot against his dupes. Then suddenly words came to me. They have come to me before. They burn up the very heat and marrow in me. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, and the Lord commandeth it not? There they were in my ears, written on the walls, the air. The hand dropped from Robert's arm. A dull look of defeat, of regret, darkened the gleaming eyes. They were standing in a quiet, deserted street, but through a side opening the lights, the noise, the turbulence of the open-air market came drifting to them through the rainy atmosphere which blurred and magnified everything. Ay, after days and nights in his most blessed sanctuary, Newcombe resumed slowly, I came by his commission, as I thought, to fight his battle with a traitor, and at the last moment his strength, which was in me, went from me. I sat there dumb. His hand was heavy upon me. His will be done. The voice sank. The priest drew his thin, shaking hand across his eyes, as though the awe of a mysterious struggle was still upon him. Then he turned again to Ellesmere, his face softening, radiating. Ellesmere, take the sign, the message. I thought it was given to me to declare the Lord's wrath. Instead, he sends you once more by me, even now, even fresh from this new defiance of his mercy, the tender offer of his grace. He lies at rest to-night, my brother. What sweetness in the low vibrating tones! After all the anguish, let me draw you down on your knees beside him. It is you, you who have helped to drive in the nails, to embitter the agony. It is you who in his loneliness have been robbing him of the souls that should be his. It is you who have been doing your utmost to make his cross and passion of no effect. Oh, let it break your heart to think of it. Watch by him to-night, my friend, my brother, and to-morrow let the risen Lord reclaim his own. Never had Robert seen any mortal face so persuasively beautiful. Never surely did saint or ascetic plead with a more penetrating gentleness. After the storm of those opening words, the change was magical. The tears stood in Ellesmere's eyes. But his quick insight, in spite of himself, divined the subtle, natural facts behind the outburst, the strained physical state, the irritable brain, all the consequences of a long defiance of physical and mental law. The priest repelled him. The man drew him like a magnet. "'What can I say to you, Newcombe?' he cried despairingly. "'Let me say nothing, dear old friend. I'm tired out, so I expect to you. I know what this week has been to you. Walk with me a little. Leave these great things alone. We cannot agree. Be content, God knows. Tell me about the old place and the people. I long for news of them.' A sort of shudder passed through his companion. Newcombe stood wrestling with himself. It was like the slow departure of a possessing force. Then he sombrely assented, and they turned towards the city. But his answers, as Robert questioned him, were sharp and mechanical, and presently it became evident that the demands of the ordinary talk to which Ellesmere rigorously held him were more than he could bear. As they reached St. Paul's, towering into the watery moonlight of the clouded sky, he stopped abruptly and said, "'Good night.' "'You came to me in the spirit of war,' said Robert, with some emotion, as he held his hand. "'Give me instead the grasp of peace.' The spell of his manner, his presence, prevailed at last. 
a melancholy, quivering smile dawned on the priest's delicate lip. "'God bless you. God restore you,' he said sadly, and was gone. End of Book Six, Chapter Forty Book Six, Chapter Forty One of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Forty One. A week later, Ellesmere was startled to find himself detained after his storytelling by a trio of workmen asking on behalf of some thirty or forty members of the North R Club that he would give them a course of lectures on the New Testament. One of them was the gasfitter Charles Richards. Another was the watchmaker Lestrange, who had originally challenged Robert to deliver himself, and the third was a tough old Scotchman of sixty with a philosophical turn, under whose spoutings of Hume and Locke, of Reed and Dugald Stewart, delivered in the shrillest of cracked voices, the club had writhed many an impatient half-hour on debating nights. He had an unexpected artistic gift, a kind of sport as compared with the rest of his character, which made him a valued designer in the pottery works. But his real interests were speculative and argumentative, concerned with common nations and the primary elements of reason, and the appearance of Robert in the district seemed to offer him at last a foeman worthy of his steel. Ellesmere shrewdly suspected that the last two looked forward to any teaching he might give, mostly as a new and favourable exercising ground for their own wits. But he took the risk, gladly accepted the invitation, and fixed Sunday afternoons for a weekly New Testament lecture. His first lecture, which he prepared with great care, was delivered to thirty-seven men a fortnight later. It was on the political and social state of Palestine and the East at the time of Christ's birth, and Robert, who was as fervent a believer in large maps as Lord Salisbury, had prepared a goodly store of them for the occasion, together with a number of drawings and photographs which formed part of the collection he had been gradually making since his own visit to the Holy Land. There was nothing he laid more stress on than these helps to the eye and imagination in dealing with the Bible. He was accustomed to maintain in his arguments with Hugh Flaxman that the orthodox traditional teaching of Christianity would become impossible as soon as it should be the habit to make a free and modern use of history and geography and social material in connection with the Gospels. Nothing tends so much, he would say, to break down the irrational barrier which men have raised about this particular tract of historical space. Nothing helps so much to let in the light and air of scientific thought upon it, and therefore Nothing prepares the way so effectively for a series of new conceptions. By a kind of natural selection, Richards became Ellesmere's chief helper and adjutant in the Sunday lectures. With regard to all such matters as beating up recruits, keeping guard over portfolios, handing round maps and photographs, etc., supplanting in this function the jealous and sensitive Mackay, who, after his original opposition, had now arrived at regarding Robert as his own particular property, and the lecturer's quick smile of thanks for services rendered as his own especial right. The bright, quicksilvery, irascible little workman, however, was irresistible, and had his way. He had taken a passion for Robert as for a being of another order and another world. In the discussions which generally followed the lecture, he showed a receptiveness and intelligence which were in reality a matter not of the mind, but of the heart. He loved, therefore he understood. At the club he stood for Ellesmere with a quivering spasmodic eloquence, as against Andrews and the secularists. One thing only puzzled Robert. Among all the little fellow's sallies and indiscretions, which were not infrequent, no reference to his home life was ever included. Here he kept even Robert absolutely at arm's length. Robert knew that he was married and had children, nothing more. The old Scotchman, MacDonald, came out after the first lecture somewhat crestfallen. "'Not the sort of stuff I'd expected,' he said with a shade of perplexity on his rugged face. "'He doesn't talk enough in the abstract for me.' But he went again, and the second lecture, on the origin of the Gospels, got hold of him, especially as it supplied him with a whole armoury of new arguments in support of Hume's doctrine of conscience, and in defiance of that blighting creature read. The thesis with which Robert drawing on some of the stores supplied him by the squire's book, began his account, 
i.e. the gradual growth within the limits of history of man's capacity for telling the exact truth, fitted in to the Scotsman's thinking, so providentially with his own favourable experimental doctrines, as against the intuition folks, who will have it that a baby's got as much mind as Mr. Gladstone if he only knew it, that afterwards he never missed a lecture. Lestrange was more difficult. He had the inherited temperament of the Genevese frondeur, which made Geneva the headquarters of Calvinism in the sixteenth century, and bids fair to make her the headquarters of continental radicalism in the nineteenth. Robert never felt his wits so much stretched and sharpened as when, after the lecture, Lestrange was putting questions and objections with an acrid subtlety and persistence worthy of a descendant of that burgher class which first built up the Calvinistic system and then produced the destroyer of it in Rousseau. Robert bore his heckling, however, with great patience and adroitness. He had need of all he knew, as Murray Edwards had warned him. But luckily he knew a great deal. His thought was clearing and settling month by month, and whatever he may have lost at any moment by the turn of a little argument, he recovered immediately afterwards by the force of personality, and of a single-mindedness in which there was never a trace of personal grasping. Week by week the lecture became more absorbing to him, the men more pliant, his hold on them firmer. His disinterestedness, his brightness and resource, perhaps too the signs about him of a light and frail physical organisation, the novelty of his position, the inventiveness of his method, gave him little by little an immense power in the place. After the first two lectures, Murray Edwards became his constant and enthusiastic hearer on Sunday afternoons, and, catching some of Robert's ways and spirit, he gradually brought his own chapel and teaching more and more into line with the Elgood Street undertaking so that the venture of the two men began to take even larger proportions, and, kindled by the growing interest and feeling about him, dreams began to rise in Ellesmere's mind, which as yet he hardly dared to cherish, which came and went, however, weaving a substance for themselves out of each successive incident and effort. Meanwhile, he was at work on an average three evenings in the week, besides the Sunday. In West End drawing-rooms, his personal gift had begun to tell no less than then this crowded, squalid East, and as his aims became known, other men, finding the thoughts of their own hearts revealed in him, or touched with that social compunction which is one of the notes of our time, came down and became his helpers. Of all the social projects of which that Elgood Street room became the centre, Ellesmere was, in some sense, the life and inspiration. But it was not these projects themselves which made this period of his life remarkable. London, at the present moment, if it be honeycombed with vice and misery, is also honeycombed with the labour of an ever-expanding charity. Week by week, men and women of like gifts and energies with Ellesmere spend themselves, as he did, in the constant effort to serve and to alleviate. What was noticeable, what was remarkable in this work of his, was the spirit the religious passion which, radiating from him, began after a while to kindle the whole body of men about him. It was from his Sunday lectures and his talks with the children, boys and girls, who came in after the lecture to spend a happy hour and a half with him on Sunday afternoons, that in later years hundreds of men and women will date the beginnings of a new, absorbing life. There came a time, indeed, when instead of meeting criticism by argument, Robert was able simply to point to accomplished facts. You ask me, he would say in effect, to prove to you that men can love, can make a new and fruitful use for daily life and conduct of a merely human Christ. Go amongst our men, talk to our children, and satisfy yourself. A little while ago scores of these men either hated the very name of Christianity, or were entirely indifferent to it. To scores of them now the name of the teacher of Nazareth, the victim of Jerusalem, is dear and sacred. His life, his death, his words, are becoming once more a constant source of moral effort and spiritual hope. See for yourself. However, we are anticipating. Let us go back to May. One beautiful morning, Robert was sitting working in his study, his windows open to the breezy blue sky and the budding plane trees outside, when the door was thrown open and Mr. Wendover was announced. The squire entered. But what a shrunken and aged squire! The gate was feeble. The bearing had lost all its old erectness. 
The bronzed strength of the face had given place to a waxen and ominous pallor. Robert, springing up with joy to meet the great gust of mural air, which seemed to blow about him with the mention of the squire's name, was struck, arrested. He guided his guest to a chair with an almost filial carefulness. "'I don't believe, squire,' he exclaimed, "'you ought to be doing this, wandering about London by yourself.' But the squire, as silent and angular as ever when anything personal to himself was concerned, would take no notice of the implied anxiety and sympathy. He grasped his umbrella between his knees with a pair of brown, twisted hands, and sitting very upright, looked critically round the room. Robert, studying the dwindled figure, remembered with a pang the saying of another Oxford scholar, apropos of the death of a young man of extraordinary promise. What learning has perished with him? How vain seems all toil to acquire! And the words, as they passed through his mind, seemed to him to ring another death knell. But after the first painful impression, he could not help losing himself in the pleasure of the familiar face, the mural associations. How is the village and the institute? And what sort of man is my successor? The man, I mean, who came after Armistead. I had him once to dinner, said the squire briefly. He made a false quantity, and asked me to subscribe to the Church Missionary Society. I haven't seen him since. He and the village have been at loggerheads about the Institute, I believe. He wanted to turn out the dissenters. Bateson came to me, and we circumvented him, of course. But the man's an ass. Don't talk of him." Robert sighed a long sigh. Was all his work undone? It wrung his heart to remember the opening of the Institute, the ardour of his boys. He asked a few questions about individuals, but soon gave it up as hopeless. The squire neither knew nor cared. "'And Mrs. Darcy?' "'My sister had tea in her thirtieth summer-house last Sunday,' remarked the squire grimly. "'She wished me to communicate the fact to you and Mrs. Ellesmere. Also that the worst novel of the century will be out in a fortnight, and she trusts you to see it well reviewed in all the leading journals.' Robert laughed but it was not very easy to laugh. There was a sort of ghastly undercurrent in the squire's sarcasms that affectionately deprived him of anything mirthful. "'And your book?' Oh, is in abeyance. I shall bequeath you the manuscript of my will to do what you like with.' "'Squire!' "'Quite true. If you'd stayed, I should have finished it, I suppose. But after a certain age, the toil of spinning cobwebs entirely out of his own brain becomes too much for a man.' It was the first thing of the sort that Arn Mouth had ever said to him. Ellesmere was painfully touched. "'You must not, you shall not give it up,' he urged. "'Publish the first part alone, and ask me for any help you please.' The squire shook his head. "'Well, let it be. Your paper in the nineteenth century showed me that the best thing I could do is to hand on my materials to you. Though I am not sure that, when you have got them, you will make the best use of them.' You and Grey between you call yourselves liberals, and imagine yourselves reformers, and all the while you are doing nothing but playing into the hands of the blacks. All this theistic philosophy of yours only means so much grist to the mill in the end." "'They don't see it in that light themselves,' said Robert, smiling. "'No,' returned the squire, "'because most men are puzzle-heads. Why,' he added, looking darkly at Robert, while the great head fell forward on his breast in the familiar mural attitude. Why can't you do your work and let the preaching alone?" "'Because,' said Robert, "'the preaching seems to me my work. There is the great difference between us, squire. You look upon knowledge as an end in itself. It, it may be so. But to me knowledge has always been valuable, first and foremost, for its bearing on life.' "'Fatal twist, that,' returned the squire, harshly. "'Yes, I know it was always in you. Well, are you happy?' that this new crusade of yours give you pleasure?" "'Happiness,' replied Robert, leaning against the chimney-piece and speaking in a low voice, "'is always relative. No one knows it better than you. Life is full of oppositions. But the work takes my whole heart and all my energies.' The squire looked at him in disapproving silence for a while. "'You will bury your life in it miserably,' he said at last. It would be a toil of Sisyphus, leaving no trace behind it, whereas such a book as you might write, if you gave your life to it, might live and work and harry the enemy when you were gone." Robert forbore the natural retort. 
The squire went round his library, making remarks, with all the caustic shrewdness natural to him, on the new volumes that Robert had acquired since their walks and talks together. "'The Germans,' he said at last, putting back a book into the shelves, with a new accent of distaste and weariness, "'are beginning to founder in the sea of their own learning. Sometimes I think I will read no more German. It is a nation of learned fools, none of whom ever sees an inch beyond his own professorial nose.' Then he stayed to luncheon, and Catherine, moved by many feelings, perhaps in subtle striving against her own passionate sense of wrong at this man's hands, was kind to him, and talked and smiled indeed so much that the squire for the first time in his life took individual notice of her, and as he parted with Ellesmere in the hall, made the remark that Mrs. Ellesmere seemed to like London, to which Robert, busy in an opportune search for his guest's coat, made no reply. "'When are you coming to Muirwell?' the squire said to him abruptly, as he stood at the door, muffled up as though it were December. "'There are a good many points in that last article you want talking to about. Come next month with Mrs. Ellesmere.' Robert drew a long breath, inspired by many feelings. "'I will come, but not yet. I must get broken in here more thoroughly first. Muirwell touches me too deeply, and my wife. You are going abroad in the summer, you say. Let me come to you in the autumn.' The squire said nothing, and went his way, leaning heavily on his stick across the square. Robert felt himself a brute to let him go, and almost ran after him. That evening Robert was disquieted by the receipt of a note from a young fellow of St. Anselm's, an intimate friend and occasional secretary of Gray. Gray, the writer said, had received Robert's last letter, was deeply interested in his account of his work, and begged him to write again. He would have written but that he was himself in the doctor's hands, suffering from various ills, probably connected with an attack of malarial fever which had befallen him in Rome the year before. Catherine found him poring over the letter, and as it seemed to her, oppressed by an anxiety out of all proportion to the news itself. "'They are not really troubled, I think,' she said, kneeling down beside him and laying her cheek against his. "'He will soon get over it, Robert.' But alas, this mood, the tender, characteristic mood of the old Catherine, was becoming rarer and rarer with her. As the spring expanded, as the sun and the leaves came back, poor Catherine's temper had only grown more wintry and more rigid. Her life was full of moments of acute suffering. Never, for instance, did she forget the evening of Robert's lecture to the club. All the time he was away she had sat brooding by herself in the drawing-room, divining with a bit of clairvoyance all that scene in which he was taking part, her being shaken with a tempest of misery and repulsion. And together with that torturing image of a glaring room in which her husband, once Christ's loyal minister, was employing all his powers of mind and speech to make it easier for ignorant men to desert and fight against the Lord who brought them, there mingled a hundred memories of her father, which were now her constant companions. In proportion, as Robert and she became more divided, her dead father resumed a ghostly hold upon her. There were days when she went about rigid and silent, in reality living altogether in the past, among the grey farms, the crags, and the stony ways of the mountains. At such times her mind would be full of pictures of her father's ministrations, his talks with the shepherds on the hills, with the women at their doors, his pale dreamer's face beside some wild deathbed, shining with the divine message, the visions which to her awestruck childish sense would often seem to hold him in their silent walks among the misty hills. Robert, taught by many small indications, came to recognise these states of feeling in her with a dismal clearness, and to shrink more and more sensitively while they lasted from any collision with her. He kept his work, his friends, his engagements, to himself, talking resolutely of other things, she trying to do the same, but with less success, as her nature was less pliant than his. Then there would come moments when the inward preoccupation would give way, and that strong need of loving, which was, after all, the basis of Catherine's character, would break hungrily through, and the wife of their early married days would reappear, though still only with limitations. A certain nervous physical dread of any approach to a particular range of subjects with her husband was always present in her. 
Nay, through all these months it gradually increased in morbid strength. Shock had produced it. Perhaps shock alone could loosen the stifling pressure of it. But still every now and then her mood was brighter, more caressing, and the area of common mundane interests seemed suddenly to broaden for them. Robert did not always make a wise use of these happier times. He was incessantly possessed with his old idea that if she only would allow herself some very ordinary intercourse with his world, her mood would become less strained, his occupations and his friends would cease to be such bugbears to her, and, for his comfort and hers, she might ultimately be able to sympathise with certain sides, at any rate, of his work. So, again and again, when her manner no longer threw him back on himself, he made efforts and experiments but he managed them far less cleverly than he would have managed anybody else's affairs, as generally happens. For instance, at a period when he was feeling more enthusiasm than usual for his colleague Wardlaw, and when Catherine was more accessible than usual, it suddenly occurred to him to make an effort to bring them together. Brought face to face, each must recognise the nobleness of the other. He felt boyishly confident of it. So he made it a point, tenderly but insistently, that Catherine should ask Wardlaw and his wife to come and see them. And Catherine, driven obscurely by a longing to yield in something which recurred and often terrified herself, yielded in this. The Wardlaws, who in general never went into society, were asked to a quiet dinner in Bedford Square, and came. Then, of course, it appeared that Robert, with the idealist blindness, had forgotten a hundred small differences of temperament and training which must make it impossible for Catherine, in a state of tension, to see the hero in James Wardlaw. It was an unlucky dinner. James Wardlaw, with all his heroisms and virtues, had long ago dropped most of those delicate intuitions and divinations which make the charm of life in society along the rough paths of a strenuous philanthropy. He had no tact, and, like most saints, he drew a certain amount of inspiration from a contented ignorance of his neighbour's point of view. Also, he was not a man who made much of women, and he held strong views as to the subordination of wives. It never occurred to him that Robert might have a dissenter in his own household, and as, in spite of their speculative differences, he had always been accustomed to talk freely with Robert, he now talked freely to Robert plus his wife, assuming, as every good comptist does, that the husband is the wife's pope. Moreover, a solitary, eccentric life, far from the society of his equals, had developed in him a good many crude Jacobinisms. His experience of London clergymen, for instance, had not been particularly favourable, and he had a store of anecdotes on the subject which Robert had heard before, but which now, repeated in Catherine's presence, seemed to have lost every shred of humour they once possessed. Poor Ellesmere tried with all his might to divert the stream but it showed a tormenting tendency to recur to the same channel. And meanwhile the little spectacled wife, dressed in a high homemade cashmere, sat looking at her husband with a benevolent and smiling admiration. She kept all her eloquence for the poor. After dinner things grew worse. Mrs. Wardlaw had recently presented her husband with a third infant, and the ardent pair had taken advantage of the visit to London of an eminent French comptist to have it baptised with full comptist rights. Wardlaw stood astride on the rug, giving the assembled company a minute account of the ceremony observed, while his wife threw in gentle explanatory interjections. The manner of both showed a certain exasperating confidence, if not in the active sympathy, at least in the impartial curiosity of their audience, and in the importance to modern religious history of the incident itself. Catherine's silence grew deeper and deeper. The conversation fell entirely to Robert. At last Robert, by main force, as it were, got Wardlaw off into politics, but the new Irish coercion bill was hardly introduced before the irrepressible being turned to Catherine and said to her with smiling obtuseness, "'I don't believe I've seen you at one of your husband's Sunday addresses yet, Mrs. Ellesmere, and it isn't so far from this part of the world either.' Catherine slowly raised her beautiful large eyes upon him. Robert, looking at her with a qualm, saw an expression he was learning to dread flash across the face. "'I have my Sunday school at that time, Mr. Wardlaw. I am a churchwoman.' 
The tone had a touch of hauteur Robert had hardly ever heard from his wife before. Effectually stopped all further conversation. Wardlaw fell into silence, reflecting that he had been a fool. His wife, with a timid flush, drew out her knitting, and stuck to it for the twenty minutes that remained. Catherine immediately did her best to talk, to be pleasant, but the discomfort of the little party was too great. It broke up at ten, and the Wardlaws departed. Catherine stood on the rug while Elsmere went with his guests to the door, waiting restlessly for her husband's return. Robert, however, came back to her, tired, wounded, and out of spirits, feeling that the attempt had been wholly unsuccessful, and shrinking from any further talk about it. He at once sat down to some letters for the late post. Catherine lingered a little, watching him, longing miserably, like any girl of eighteen, to throw herself on his neck and reproach him for their unhappiness, his friends, she knew not what. He all the time was intimately conscious of her presence, of her pale beauty, which now, at twenty-nine, in spite of its severity, had a subtler finish and attraction than ever, of the restless little movements so unlike herself which she made from time to time. But neither spoke except upon indifferent things. Once more the difficult conditions of their lives seemed too obvious, too oppressive. Both were ultimately conquered by the same sore impulse to let speech alone. End of Book Six, Chapter 41《Book Six, Chapter Forty Two of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Forty Two. And after this little scene, through the busy, exciting weeks of the season which followed, Robert, taxed to the utmost on all sides, yielded to the impulse of silence more and more. Society was another difficulty between them. Robert delighted in it so far as his East End life allowed him to have it. No one was ever more ready to take other men and women at their own valuation than he. Nothing was so easy to him as to believe in other people's goodness or cleverness or superhuman achievement. On the other hand, London is kind to such men as Robert Ellesmere. His talk, his writing, were becoming known and relished, and even the most rigid of the old school found it difficult to be angry with him. His knowledge of the poor and of social questions attracted the men of actions. His growing historical reputation drew the attention of the men of thought. Most people wished to know him and to talk to him, and Catherine, smiled upon for his sake and assumed to be his chief disciple, felt herself more and more bewildered and antagonistic as the season rushed on. For what pleasure could she get out of these dinners and these evenings, which supplied Robert with so much intellectual stimulus? With her, all the moral nerves were jarring and out of tune. At any time, Richard Laban's daughter would have found it hard to tolerate a society where everything is an open question and all confessions of faith are more or less bad taste. But now, when there was no refuge to fall back upon in Robert's arms, no certainty of his sympathy, nay, a certainty that, however tender and pitiful he might be, he would still think her wrong and mistaken. She went here and there obediently because he wished, but her youth seemed to be ebbing, the old mural gaiety entirely left her, and people in general wondered why Ellesmere should have married a wife older than himself, and apparently so unsuited to him in temperament. Especially was she tried at Madame de Netville's. For Robert's sake she tried for a time to put aside her first impression and to bear Madame de Netville's evenings little dreaming, poor thing, all the time that Madame de Nitville thought her presence at the famous Fridays an incubus only to put up with because her husband was becoming socially an indispensable. But after two or three Fridays, Catherine's endurance failed her. On the last occasion, she found herself late in the evening, hemmed in between Madame de Nitville and a distinguished African explorer, who was the lad of the evening. Eugenie de Nitville had forgotten her silent neighbour, and presently, with some biting little phrase or other, she asked the great man his opinion on a burning topic of the day, the results of church missions in Africa. The great man laughed, shrugged his shoulders, and ran lightly through a string of stories in which both missionaries and converts played parts which were either grotesque or worse. 
Madame de Netville thought the stories amusing, and as one ceased she provoked another, her black eyes full of a dry laughter, her white hand lazily plying her great ostrich fan. Suddenly a figure rose behind them. "'Oh, Mrs. Ellesmere!' said Madame de Netville, starting, and then coolly recovering herself. "'I had no idea you were there all alone. I am afraid our conversation has been disagreeable to you. I am afraid you are a friend of missions.' and at last, turning from Catherine to her companion, made a little malicious signal to him which only he detected, as though bidding him take note of a curiosity. "'Yes, I care for them. I wish for their success,' said Catherine, one hand which trembled slightly, resting on the table beside her, her great grey eyes fixed on Madame de Netville. "'No Christian has any right to do otherwise.' Poor, brave, goaded soul! She had a vague idea of bearing testimony, as her father would have borne it in like circumstances. But she turned very pale. Even to her the word Christian sounded like a bombshell in that room. The great traveller looked up astounded. He saw a tall woman in white, with a beautiful head, a delicate face, a something indescribably noble than unusual in her whole look and attitude. She looked like a Quaker prophetess, like Dinah Morris in society, like but his comparisons failed him. How did such a being come there? He was amazed. But he was a man of taste, and Madame de Netville caught a certain aesthetic approbation in his look. She rose, her expression hard and bright as usual. "'May one Christian pronounce for all?' she said, with a scornful affectation of meekness. "'Mrs. Ellesmere, please find some chair more comfortable than that ottoman. And Mr. Ansdale, "'Will you come and be introduced to Lady Aubrey?' "'After her guests had gone, "'Madame de Netville came back to the fire, "'flushed and frowning. "'It seemed to her that in that strange little encounter "'she had suffered, "'and she had never forgot or forgave "'the smallest social discomfiture. "'Can I put up with that again?' "'She asked herself, "'with a contemptuous hardening of the lip. "'I suppose I must if he cannot be got without her. "'But I have an instinct that it is over "'that she will not appear here again.' Dorday might make use of her. I can't. What a specimen! A boy and girl match, I suppose. What else could have induced that poor wretch to cut his throat in such fashion? He, of all men! And Eugenie de Netteville stood thinking, not apparently of the puritanical wife. The dangerous softness which overspread the face could have had no connection with Catherine. Madame de Netteville's instinct was just. Catherine Ellesmere never appeared again in her drawing-room. But with a little sad confession of her own invincible distaste, the wife pressed the husband to go without her. She urged it at a bitter moment, when it was clear to her that their lives must, of necessity, even in outward matters, be more separate than before. Elsmere resisted for a time, then, lured one evening towards the end of February by the prospect conveyed in a note from Madame de Netteville, wherein Catherine was mentioned in the most scrupulously civil terms, of meeting one of the most eminent of French critics, he went, and thenceforward went often. He had, so far, no particular liking for the hostess. He hated some of her habitués, but there was no doubt that in some ways she made an admirable holder of a salon, and that round about her there was a subtle mixture of elements, a liberty of discussion and comment, to be found nowhere else. And how bracing and refreshing was that free play of equal mind, to the man weary sometimes of his leader's role, and weary of himself. As to the woman, his social naivety, which was extraordinary, but in a man of his type most natural, made him accept her exactly as he found her. If there were two or three people in Paris or London who knew or suspected incidents of Madame de Netfield's young married days, which made her reception at some of the strictest English houses a matter of cynical amusement to them, not the remotest inkling of their knowledge was ever likely to reach Ellesmere. He was not a man who attracted scandals, nor was it anybody's interest to spread them. Madame de Neffel's position in London society was obviously excellent. If she had peculiarities of manner and speech, they were easily supposed to be French. Meanwhile, she was undeniably rich and distinguished, and gifted with a most remarkable power of protecting herself and her neighbours from boredom. At the same time, though Ellesmere was, in truth, more interested in her friends than in her, 
he could not possibly be insensible to the consideration shown for him in her drawing-room. Madame de Netville allowed herself plenty of jests with her intimates as to the young reformer's social simplicity, his dreams, his optimisms. But those intimates were the first to notice that as soon as he entered the room, these optimisms of his were adroitly respected. She had various delicate contrivances for giving him the lead. She exercised a kind of surveillance over the topics introduced, or in conversation with him she would play that most seductive part of the cynic, shamed out of cynicism by the neighbourhood of the enthusiast. Presently she began to claim a practical interest in his Elgood Street work. Her offers were made with a curious mixture of sympathy and mockery. Osmo could not take her seriously, but neither could he refuse to accept her money if she chose to spend it on a library for Elgood Street, or to consult with her about the choice of books. This whim of hers created a certain friendly bond between them which was not present before. And on Ellesmere's side it was strengthened when, one evening, in a corner of her inner drawing-room, Madame de Netville suddenly, but very quietly, told him the story of her life. Her English youth, her elderly French husband, the death of her only child, and her flight as a young widow to England during the war of 1870. She told the story of the child, as it seemed to Ellesmere, with a deliberate avoidance of emotion, nay, even with a certain hardness. But it touched him profoundly. And everything else that she said, though she professed no great regret for her husband, or for the break-up of her French life, and though everything was reticent and measured, deepened the impression of a real forlornness behind all the outward brilliance and social importance. He began to feel a deep and kindly pity for her, coupled with an earnest wish that he could help her to make her life more adequate and satisfying. And all this he showed in the look of his frank grey eyes, in the cordial grasp of the hand with which he said good-bye to her. Madame de Netfield's gaze followed him out of the room. The tall, boyish figure, the nobly carried head. The riddle of her flushed cheek and sparkling eye was hard to read, but there were one or two persons living who could have read it, and who could have warned you that the true story of Eugénie de Netfield's life was written not in her literary studies or her social triumphs, but in various recurrent outbreaks of unbridled impulse, the secret, and in one or two cases the shameful landmarks of her past. And as persons of experience, they could also have warned you that the cold intriguer, always mistress of herself, only exists in fiction, and of the certain poisoned and fevered interest in the religious leader, the young and pious priest, as such, is common enough among the corrupter women of all societies. Towards the end of May she asked Elsmere to dine, on petit comité, a gentleman's dinner, except for my cousin, Lady Aubrey Willett, to meet an eminent liberal Catholic, a friend of Monta Lambert's youth. It was a week or two after the failure of the Wardlaw experiment. Do what each would, the sore silence between the husband and wife was growing, was swallowing up more of life. "'Shall I go, Catherine?' he asked, handing her the note. "'It would interest you,' she said gently, giving it back to him scrupulously, as though she had nothing to do with it. He knelt down before her, and put his arms round her, looking at her with eyes which had a dumb and yet fiery appeal written in them. His heart was hungry for that old clinging dependence, that willing weakness of love her youth had yielded him so gladly, instead of this silent strength of antagonism. The memory of her mural self flashed miserably through him as he knelt there, of her delicate penitence towards him after her first sight of Newcombe, of their night walks during the Mile End epidemic. Did he hold now in his arms only the ghost and shadow of that mural Catherine? She must have read the reproach, the yearning of his look, for she gave a little shiver as though bracing herself with a kind of agony to resist. "'Let me go, Robert,' she said gently, kissing him on the forehead and drawing back. "'I hear Mary calling, and Nurse is out.' The days went on, and the date of Madame de Netfield's dinner-party had come round. About seven o'clock that evening Catherine sat with the child in the drawing-room, expecting Robert. He had gone off early in the afternoon to the East End with Hugh Flaxman to take part in a committee of workmen organised for the establishment of a choral union in R, the scheme of which had been Flaxman's chief contribution so far to the Elgood Street undertaking. 
It seemed to her as she sat there working, the windows opened onto the bit of garden, where the trees were already withered and begrimed, that the air without and her heart within were alike stifling and heavy with storm. Something must put an end to this oppression, this misery. She did not know herself. Her whole inner being seemed to her lessened and degraded by this silent struggle, this fever of the soul, which made impossible all those serenities and sweetnesses of thought in which her nature had always lived of old. The fight into which fate had forced her was destroying her. She was drooping like a plant cut off from all that nourishes its life. And yet she never conceived it possible that she should relinquish that fight. Nay, at times there sprang up in her now a dangerous and despairing foresight of even worse things in store. In the middle of her suffering she already began to feel at moments the ascetic's terrible sense of compensation. What, after all, is a Christian life but warfare? I came not to send peace, but a sword. Yes, in these June days Ellesmere's happiness was perhaps nearer wreck than it had ever been. All strong natures grow restless under such a pressure as was now weighing on Catherine. Shock and outburst become inevitable. So she sat alone this hot afternoon, haunted by presentiments, by vague terror for herself and him, while the child tottered about her, cooing, shouting, kissing, and all impulsively with a ceaseless energy like her father. The outer door opened, and she heard Robert's step, and apparently Mr. Flaxman's also. There was a hurried, subdued word or two in the hall, and the two entered the room where she was sitting. Robert came, pressing back the hair from his eyes with a gesture which with him was the invariable accompaniment of mental trouble. Catherine sprang up. "'Robert, you look so tired, and how late you are!' Then she came nearer to him. "'And your coat! Torn! Blood!' "'There is nothing wrong with me, dearest,' he said hastily, taking her hands. "'Nothing. But it has been an awful afternoon. Flaxman will tell you. I must go to this place, I suppose. I hate the thought of it. Plaxman, will you tell her all about it?' And loosing his hold, he went heavily out of the room and upstairs. "'It has been an accident.' said Flaxman gently, coming forward, to one of the men of his class. Maybe sit down, Mrs. Ellesmere. Your husband and I have gone through a good deal these last two hours. He sat down with a long breath, evidently trying to regain his ordinary even manner. His clothes, too, were covered with dust, and his hand shook. Catherine stood before him in consternation, while a nurse came for the child. We had just begun our committee at four o'clock he said at last. The only about half of the men had arrived, when there was a great shouting and commotion outside, and a man rushed in, calling for Ellesmere. He ran out, found a great crowd, a huge brewer's dray standing in the street, and a man run over. The husband pushed his way in. I followed, and to my horror I found him leading by Charles Richards. Charles Richards? Catherine repeated vacantly. Flaxman looked up at her, as though puzzled. Then a flash of astonishment passed over his face. "'Elsmere has never told you of Charles Richards, the little gas-fitter, who has been his right-hand man for the past three months?' "'No, never,' she said slowly. Again he looked astonished. Then he went on sadly. "'All this spring he has been your husband's shadow. I never saw such devotion. We found him lying in the middle of the road. He had only just left work.' a man said to have been with him, and was running to the meeting. He slipped and fell, crossing the street, which was muddy from last night's rain. The dray swung round the corner, the driver was drunk or careless, and they went right over him. One foot was a sickening sight. Your husband and I luckily knew how to lift him for the best. We sent off for doctors. His home was in the next street, as it happened, nearer than any hospital, so we carried him there. The neighbours were round the door. Then he stopped himself. "'Shall I tell you the whole story?' he said kindly. "'It has been a tragedy. I, I won't give you details, if you'd rather not.' "'Oh, no,' she said hurriedly. "'No, no, tell me.' And she forgot to feel any wonder that Flaxman, in his chivalry, should treat her as though she were a girl with nerves. "'Well, it, it was the surroundings that were so ghastly. When we got to the house, an old woman rushed at me. 
"'His wife's in there, but she'll not find her in the inner senses. She's been at it from eight o'clock this morning. We took the children away.' "'I didn't know what she meant exactly, till we got into the little front room. "'There, ah, such a spectacle! "'A young woman on a chair by the fire, sleeping heavily, dead drunk. "'The breakfast things on the table, the sun blazing in on the dust and the dirt, and on the woman's face. "'I wanted to carry him into the room on the other side. "'He was unconscious, but a doctor had come up with us, "'and made us put him down on a bed that was in the corner. "'Then we got some brandy and poured it down.' The doctor examined him, looking at his foot, threw something over it. "'Nothing to be done,' he said. "'Internal injuries. He can't live half an hour.' The next minute the poor fellow opened his eyes. They had pulled away the bed from the wall. Your husband was on the farther side, kneeling. When he opened his eyes, clearly the first thing he saw was his wife. He half sprang up. The husband had caught him, and gave a horrible cry, indescribably horrible. "'At it again! At it again! My God!' Then he fell back fainting. They got the wife out of the room between them. A perfect log! You could hear her heavy breathing from the kitchen opposite. We gave him more brandy, and he, he came to again. He looked up in your husband's face. "'She hasn't broke out for two months,' he said so piteously. Two months, and now I'm done, I'm done, and she'll just go straight to the devil.' "'And it comes out,' so the neighbours told us, that for two years or more he'd been patiently trying to reclaim this woman without a word of complaint to anybody, though his life must have been a dog's life. And now, on his deathbed, what seemed to be breaking his heart was not that he was dying, but that his task was snatched from him. Flaxman paused and looked away out of the window. He told his story with difficulty. Your husband tried to comfort him, promised that the wife and children should be his special care, that everything that could be done to save and protect them should be done. The poor little fellow looked up at him, with the tears running down his cheeks, and uh, blessed him. "'I cared about nothing,' he said, when you came. "'You've been God to me. I've seen him in you.' Then he asked us to say something. Your husband said verse after verse of the Psalms, of the Gospels, of St. Paul. His eyes grew filmy, but he seemed every now and then to struggle back to life, and as soon as he caught Elsmere's face his look lightened. Towards the last he said something that none of us caught, but your husband thought it was a line from Emily Bronte's hymn, which he said to them last Sunday in lecture. He looked up at her interrogatively, but there was no response in her face. "'I asked him about it,' the speaker went on, as we came home. "'He said Graves and Anselms once quoted it to him. "'He'd had a love for it ever since.' "'Did he die while you were there?' asked Catherine presently, after a silence. "'Her voice was dull and quiet. "'He thought her a strange woman. "'No,' said Flaxman, almost sharply. "'But by now it must be over. "'The last sign of consciousness was a murmur of his children's names.' They brought them in, but his hands had to be guided to them. A few minutes after it seemed to me that he was really gone, though he still breathed. The doctor was certain there would be no more consciousness. We stayed nearly another hour. Then his brother came, and some other relations. We left him. Ah, it's over now. Hugh Flaxman sat looking out into the dingy bit of London garden. Penetrated with pity as he was, he felt the presence of Ellesmere's pale, silent, unsympathetic wife, an oppression. How could she receive such a story in such a way? The door opened, and Robert came in hurriedly. "'Good night, Catherine. He's told you?' He stood by her, his hand on her shoulder, wistfully looking at her, the face full of signs of what he had gone through. "'Yes, it was terrible,' she said with an effort. His face fell. He kissed her on the forehead and went away. When he was gone, Flaxman suddenly got up and leant against the open French window, looking keenly down on his companion. A new idea had stirred in him. And presently, after more talk of the incident of the afternoon, and when he had recovered his usual manner, he slipped gradually into the subject of his own experiences in North R. during the last six months. He assumed all through that she knew as much as there was to be known of Ellesmere's work, 
and that she was as much interested as the normal wife is in her husband's doings. His tact, his delicacy, never failed him for a moment. But he spoke of his own impressions of matters within his personal knowledge. And since the Easter sermon he'd been much on Ellesmere's track, he'd been filled with curiosity about him. Catherine sat a little way from him, her blue dress lying in long folds about her, her head bent, her long fingers crossed on her lap. Sometimes she gave him a startled look, sometimes she shaded her eyes, while her other hand played silently with her watch-chain. Flaxman, watching her closely, however little he might seem to, to do so, was struck by her austere and delicate beauty, as he had never been before. She hardly spoke all through, but he felt that she listened without resistance, nay, at last, that she listened with a kind of hunger. He went from story to story, from scene to scene, without any excitement, in his most ordinary manner, making his reserves now and then, expressing his own opinion when it occurred to him, and not always favourably. But gradually the whole picture emerged, began to live before them. At last he hurriedly looked at his watch. "'What a time I've kept you! It's been a relief to talk to you.' "'You've not had dinner,' she said, looking up at him with a sudden nervous bewilderment which touched him and subtly changed his impression of her. Uh, "'No matter. I will get some at home. Good night.' When he was gone, she carried the child up to bed. Her supper was brought to her solitary in the dining-room, and afterwards in the drawing-room, where a soft twilight was fading into a soft and starlit night, she mechanically brought out some work for Mary, and sat bending over it by the window. After about an hour she looked up straight before her, threw her work down, and slipped on to the floor, her head resting on the chair. The shock, the storm, had come. There for hours lay Catherine Ellesmere, weeping her heart away, wrestling with herself, with memory, with God. It was the greatest moral upheaval she had ever known, greater even than that which had convulsed her life at Muirwell. End of Book Six, Chapter Forty Two. Book Six, Chapter Forty Three of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Forty Three. Robert, tired and sick at heart, felt himself in no mood this evening for a dinner party in which conversation would be treated more or less as a fine art. Liberal Catholicism had lost its charm. His sympathetic interest in Montalembert, Lacordaire, Lamennais had to be quickened, pumped up again, as it were, by great efforts, which were constantly relaxed within him as he sped westwards by the recurrent memory of that miserable room, the group of men, the bleeding hand, the white dying face. In Madame de Netfield's drawing-room he found a small number of people assembled. Monsieur de Curiol, a middle-sized, round-headed old gentleman of a familiar French type, Lady Aubrey, thinner, more lathe-like than ever, clad in some sumptuous mingling of dark red and silver, Lord Rupert, beaming under the recent introduction of a land purchase bill for Ireland, by which he saw his way at last to wash his hands of a beastly set of tenants, Mr. Warncliffe, a young private secretary with a waxed moustache, six feet of height, and a general air of superlativeness which demanded and secured attention. A famous journalist, whose smiling, self-repressive look assured you that he carried with him the secrets of several empires. And one Sir John Hedlam, a little black-haired Jewish-looking man with a limp, an ex-colonial governor, who had made himself accepted in London as an amusing fellow, but who was at least as much disliked by one half of society as he was popular with the other. "'Purely for talk, you see, not for show,' said Madame de Netville to Robert, with a little smiling nod round her circle, as they stood waiting for the commencement of dinner. "'I shall hardly do my part,' he said with a little sigh. "'I've just come from a very different scene.' She looked at him with inquiring eyes. "'A terrible accident in the East End,' he said briefly. "'We won't talk of it. I only mentioned it to propitiate you beforehand. These things are not forgotten at once.' She said no more, but seeing that he was indeed out of heart, physically and mentally, 
she showed the most subtle consideration for him at dinner. Monsieur de Corriol was made to talk. His hostess wound him up and set him going, tune after tune. He played them all, and by dint of long practice to perfection, in the French way. A visit of his youth to the island grave of Chateaubriand, his early memories as a poetical aspirant of the magnificent flatteries by which Victor Hugo made himself the god of young romantic Paris, his talks with Montalembert in the days of L'Avenir, his memories of Lamennais's sombre figure, of Maurice de Guérin's feverish ethereal charm, his account of the opposition salon under the Empire, they had all been elaborated in the course of years, till every word fitted and each point led to the next with the inevitableness of true art. Robert, at first silent and distray, found it impossible after a while not to listen with interest. He admired the skill, too, of Madame de Netteville's second in the duet, the finish, the alternate sparkle and melancholy of it, and at last he too was drawn in, and found himself listened to with great benevolence by the Frenchman, who had been informed about him and regarded him indulgently as one more curious specimen of English religious provincialisms. The journalist, Mr. Adelston, who won a European reputation for wisdom by a great scantiness of speech in society, coupled with the look of Minerva's owl, attached himself to them, while Lady Aubrey, Sir John Hedlam, Lord Rupert, and Mr. Warncliffe made a noisier and more dashing party at the other end. "'Are you still in your old quarters, Lady Aubrey?' asked Sir John Hedlam, turning his old roguish face upon her. "'That house of Nelgwyn's, wasn't it, in Mead Street?' "'Oh, dear, no. We could only get it up to May this year, and then they made us turn out for the season, for the first time for ten years. There's a tarsome young heir who has married a wife and wants to live in it. I could have left a train of gunpowder and a slow match behind, I was so cross.' "'Ah, reculez pour mieux faire sauter,' said Sir John, mincing out his pun as though he loved it. "'Not bad, Sir John,' she said, looking at him calmly. "'But you have way to make up.' You were so dull the last time you took me into dinner that positively you began to wonder to what I owed my paragraph in the Société de Londres, he rejoined, smiling, though a close observer might have seen an angry flash in his little eyes. My dear Lady Aubrey, it was simply because I have not seen you for six weeks. My education had been neglected. I get my art, my literature from you. The last time but one we met, you gave me the cream of three new French novels and all the dramatic scandal of the period. I've lived on it for weeks. By the way, have you read the Princesse de... He looked at her audaciously. The book had affronted even Paris. I haven't, she said, adjusting her bracelets while she flashed a rapier glance at him. But if I had, I should say precisely the same. Lord Rupert, will you kindly keep Sir John in order? Lord Rupert plunged in with the gallant floundering motion characteristic of him, while Mr. Warncliffe followed like a modern gunboat behind a three-decker. That young man was a delusion. The casual spectator, to borrow a famous Cambridge mot, invariably assumed that all the time he could spare from neglecting his duties he must spend in adorning his person. Not at all. The tenue of a dandy was never more cleverly used to mask the schemes of a Disraeli or the hard ambition of a Talleyrand than in Master Frederick Warncliffe, who was in reality going up the ladder hand over hand and meant very soon to be on the top rungs. It was a curious party, typical of the house and of a certain stratum of London. When, every now and then, in the pauses of their own conversation, Ellesmere caught something of the chatter going on at the other end of the table, or when the party became fused into one for a while under the genial influence of a good story or the exhilaration of a personal skirmish, the whole scene, the dainty oval room, the lights, the servants, the exquisite fruit and flowers, the gleaming silver, the tapestry walls, would seem to him for an instant like a mirage, a dream, yet with something glittering and arid about it, which a dream never has. The hard self-confidence of these people, did it belong to the same world as that humbling, that heavenly self-abandonment which had shone on him that afternoon from Charles Richards's begrimed and blood-stained face? Blessed are the poor in spirit, he said to himself once with an inward groan. Why am I here? Why am I not at home with Catherine? But Madame de Netville was pleasant to him. He had never seen her so womanly, never felt more grateful for her delicate social skill. As she talked to him, or to the Frenchman, of literature, or politics, or famous folk, 
flashing her beautiful eyes from one to the other, Sir John Hedlam would, every now and then, turn his odd, puckered face observantly towards the farther end of the table. "'By Jove!' he said afterwards to Warncliffe, as they walked away from the door together. "'She was inimitable to-night. She has more rolls than de Foray.' Sir John and his hostess were very old friends. Upstairs, smoking began, Lady Aubrey and Madame de Netfield joining in. Monsieur de Quariel, having talked the best of his repertoire at dinner, was now inclined for amusement, and had discovered that Lady Aubrey could amuse him, and was, moreover, une belle personne. Madame de Netfield was obliged to give some time to Lord Rupert. The other men stood chatting politics and the latest news, till Rupert, conscious of a complete failure of social energy, began to look at his watch. Instantly Madame de Netfield glided up to him. "'Mr. Ellesmere, you have talked no business to me, and I must know how my affairs in Elgood Street are getting on. Come into my little writing-room.' She led him into a tiny panelled room at the far end of the drawing-room, and shut off from it by a heavy curtain, which she now left half-drawn. "'The latest,' said Fred Warncliffe to Lady Aubrey, raising his eyebrows with the slightest motion of the head towards the writing-room. "'I suppose so,' she said indifferently. "'She's east-ending for a change. We all do it nowadays.' It is like Dizzy's young man who liked bad wine, he was so bored with good. Meanwhile, Madame de Netville was leaning against the open window of the fantastic little room, with Robert beside her. You look as if you had had a strain, she said to him abruptly, after they had talked business for a few minutes. What has been the matter? He told her Richard's story very shortly. It would have been impossible to him to give more than the driest outline of it in that room. His companion listened gravely. She was an epicure in all things, especially in moral sensation, and she liked his moments of reserve and strong self-control. They made his general expansiveness more distinguished. Presently there was a pause, which she broke by saying, "'I was at your lecture last Sunday. You didn't see me.' "'Were you? Oh, I remember a person in black and veiled who puzzled me. I don't think we want you there, Madame de Netville.' His look was pleasant, but his tone had some decision in it. "'Why not? Is it only the artisans who have souls? A reformer should refuse no one.' "'You have your own opportunities,' he said quietly. "'I think the men prefer to have it to themselves for the present. Some of them are dreadfully in earnest.' "'Oh, I don't pretend to be in earnest,' she said with a little wave of her hand. "'Or, at any rate, I know better than to talk of earnestness to you.' "'Why to me?' he asked, smiling. Oh, because you and your like have your fixed ideas of the upper class and the lower. One social type fills up your horizon. You are not interested in any other, and indeed you know nothing of any other. She looked at him defiantly. Everything about her tonight was splendid and regal. Her dress of black and white brocade, the dharmas at her throat, the carriage of her head, nay, the marks of experience and living on the dark, subtle face. "'Perhaps not,' he replied. "'It is enough for one life to try and make out where the English working class is tending to.' "'You are quite wrong, utterly wrong. "'The man who keeps his eye only on the lower class will achieve nothing. "'What can the idealist do without the men of action? "'The men who can take his beliefs and make them enter by violence into existing institutions. "'And the men of action are to be found with us.' "'It hardly looks just now as if the upper class was to go on enjoying a monopoly of them,' he said, smiling. "'Then appearances are deceptive. The populace supplies mass and weight, nothing else. What you want is to touch the leaders, the men and women whose voices carry, and then your populace would follow hard enough. For instance,' and she dropped her aggressive tone and spoke with a smiling kindness, "'come down next Saturday to my little Surrey cottage.' You shall see some of these men and women there, and I will make you confess when you go away that you have profited your workmen more by deserting them than by staying with them. Will you come? My Sundays are too precious to me just now, Madame de Netteville. Besides, my firm conviction is that the upper class can produce a brook farm, but nothing more. The religious movement of the future will want a vast effusion of feeling and passion to carry it into action, and feeling and passion only to be generated in sufficient volume among the masses, where the vested interests of all kinds are less tremendous. 
You upper-class folk have your part, of course. Woe betide you if you shirk it, but— Oh, let us leave it alone, she said with a little shrug. I know you would give us all the work and refuse us all the profits. We are to starve for your workman, to give him our hearts and purses and everything we have, not that we may hoodwink him, which might be worth doing, but that he may rule us. It is too much. Very well, he said dryly, his colour rising. Very well, let it be too much. And, dropping his lounging attitude, he stood erect, and she saw that he meant to be going. Her look swept over him from head to foot, over the worn face with its look of sensitive refinement and spiritual force, the active frame, the delicate but most characteristic hand. Never had any man so attracted her for years. Never had she found it so difficult to gain a hold. Eugenie de Netteville, poseuse, schemer, woman of the world that she was, was losing command of herself. "'What did you really mean by worldliness and the world in your lecture last Sunday?' she asked him suddenly, with a little accent of scorn. "'I thought your diatribes absurd. What you religious people call the world is really only the average opinion of sensible people which neither you nor your kind could do without for a day.' He smiled, half amused by her provocative tone, and defended himself not very seriously. But she threw all her strength into the argument, and he forgot that he meant to go at once. When she chose, she could talk admirably, and she chose now. She had the most aggressive way of attacking, and then, in the same breath, the most subtle and softening ways of yielding, and, as it were, of asking pardon. Directly her antagonist turned upon her, he found himself disarmed, he knew not how. The disputant disappeared, and he felt the woman, restless, melancholy, sympathetic, hungry for friendship and esteem, yet too proud to make any direct bid for either. It was impossible not to be interested, and touched. Such at least was the woman whom Robert Ellesmere felt. Whether in his hours of intimacy with her, twelve months before, young Alfred Evershed had received the same impression may be doubted. In all things Eugenie de Netteville was an artist. Suddenly the curtain dividing them from the larger drawing-room was drawn back, and Sir John Hedlam stood in the doorway. He had the glittering, amused eyes of a malicious child as he looked at them. "'Very sorry, madame,' he began, in his high, cracked voice, "'but Warncliff and I are off to the new club to see De Foray. They have got her there to-night.' "'Go,' she said, waving her hand to him. "'I don't envy you. She is not what she was.' "'No, there is only one person,' he said, bowing with grotesque little airs of gallantry. For whom time stands still. Madame de Netville looked at him with smiling, half contemptuous serenity. He bowed again, this time with ironical emphasis, and disappeared. Perhaps I'd better go back and send them off, she said, rising. But you and I have not had our talk out yet. She led the way into the drawing room. Lady Aubrey was lying back on the velvet sofa, a little green parakeet that was accustomed to wander tamely about the room perching on her hand. She was holding the field against Lord Rupert and Mr. Addleston in a three-cornered duel of wits, while Monsieur de Quiriol sat by, his plump hands on his knees, applauding. They all rose as their hostess came in. "'My dear,' said Lady Aubrey, "'it is disgracefully early, but my country before pleasure. It is the foreign office to-night, and since James took office I can't with decency absent myself. I'd rather be a scullery maid than a minister's wife. "'Lord Rupert, I would take you on if you want a lift.' She touched Madame de Netville's cheek with her lips, nodding to the other men present, and went out, her fair stag-like head well in the air, chafing Lord Rupert, who obediently followed her, performing marvellous feats of agility in his desire to keep out of the way of the superb train sweeping behind her. It always seemed as if Lady Aubrey could have had no childhood, as if she must always have had just that voice and those eyes. Tears she could never have shed, not even as a baby over a broken toy. Besides, at no period of her life could she have looked upon a lost possession as anything else than the opportunity for a new one. The other men took their departure for one reason or another. It was not late, but London was in full swing, and Monsieur de Quiriel talked with gusto of four at homes still to be grappled with. As she dismissed Mr. Warncliffe, 
Robert, too, held out his hand. No, she said with a quick impetuousness. No, I want my talk out. It is barely half past ten, and neither of us wants to be racing about London to night. Elsmere had always a certain lack of social decision, and he lingered rather reluctantly, for another ten minutes, as he supposed. She threw herself into her low chair. The windows were open to the back of the house, and the roar of Piccadilly and Sloane Street came borne in upon the warm night air. Her superb dark head stood out against a stand of yellow lilies close behind her, and the little parakeet, bright with all the colours of the tropics, perched now on her knee, now on the back of her chair, touched every now and then by quick, unsteady fingers. Then an instant followed, which Elsmer remembered to his dying day, with shame and humiliation. In ten minutes from the time of their being left alone, a woman who was five years his senior had made him what was practically a confession of love, had given him to understand that she knew what were the relations between himself and his wife, and had implored him with the quick breath of an indescribable excitement to see what a woman's sympathy and a woman's unique devotion could do for the causes he had at heart. The truth broke upon Elsmere very slowly, awakening in him, but at last it was unmistakable, a swift agony of repulsion, which his most friendly biographer can only regard with a kind of grim satisfaction. For, after all, there is an amount of innocence and absent-mindedness in matters of daily human life, which is not only nisari, but comes very near to moral wrong. In this crowded world, a man has no business to walk about with his eyes always on the stars. His stumbles may have too many consequences. A harsh but salutary truth. If Ellesmere needed it, it was bitterly taught him during a terrible half-hour. When the half-coherent, enigmatical sentences, to which he listened at first with a perplexed surprise, began gradually to define themselves, when he found a woman roused and tragically beautiful between him and escape, when no determination on his part not to understand, when nothing he could say availed to protect her from herself, when they were at last face to face with a confession and an appeal which were a disgrace to both, then at last Elsmere paid, in one minute glad life's arrears, the natural penalty of an optimism, a boundless faith in human nature, with which life, as we know it, is inconsistent. How he met the softness, the grace, the seduction of a woman who was an expert in all the arts of fascination, he never knew. In memory afterwards it was all a ghastly mirage to him. The low voice, the splendid dress, the scented room came back to him, and a confused memory of his own futile struggle to ward off what she was bent on saying, little else. He had been maladroit, he thought, had lost his presence of mind. Any man of the world of his acquaintance, he believed, trampling on himself, would have done better. But when the softness and the grace were all lost in smart and humiliation, when the Madame de Netville of ordinary life disappeared, and something took a place which was like a coarse and malignant underself suddenly brought into the light of day, from that point onwards, in after days, he remembered it all. "'I know,' cried Eugenie de Netteville at last, standing at bay before him, her hands locked before her, her white lips quivering, when her cup of shame was full and her one impulse left was to strike the man who had humiliated her. "'I know that you and your puritanical wife are miserable, miserable. What is the use of denying facts that all the world can see, that you have taken pains—' And she laid a fierce, deliberate emphasis on each word. "'All the world shall see?' There, let your wife's ignorance and bigotry, and your own obvious relation to her, be my excuse, if I wanted any. But, and she shrugged her white shoulders passionately, I want none. I am not responsible to your petty codes. Nature and feeling are enough for me. I saw you wanting sympathy and affection. My wife, cried Robert, hearing nothing but that one word. And then his glance sweeping over the woman before him, he made a stern step forward. "'Let me go, Madame de Netville, let me go, or I shall forget that you are a woman, and I a man, and that in some way I cannot understand my own blindness and folly. "'Must have led to this most undesirable scene,' she said with mocking suddenness, throwing herself, however, effectually in his way. 
Then a change came over her, and erect, ghastly white, with frowning brow and shaking limbs, a baffled and smarting woman from whom every restraint had fallen away, let loose upon him a torrent of gall and bitterness, which he could not have cut short without actual violence. He stood proudly enduring it, waiting for the moment when what seemed to him an outbreak of mania should have spent itself. But suddenly he caught Catherine's name, coupled with some contemptuous epithet or other, and his self-control failed him. With flashing eyes he went close up to her and took her wrists in a grip of iron. "'You shall not,' he said beside himself. "'You shall not. What have I done, what has she done, that you should allow yourself such words? My poor wife!' A passionate flood of self-reproachful love was on his lips. He choked it back. It was desecration that her name should be mentioned in that room. But he dropped the hand he held. The fierceness died out of his eyes. His companion stood beside him, panting, breathless, afraid. "'Thank God,' he said slowly. "'Thank God for yourself and me that I love my wife. I am not worthy of her doubly unworthy, since it had been possible for any human being to suspect for one instant that I was ungrateful for the blessing of her love, that I could ever forget and dishonour her. But worthy or not, no, no matter. Madame de Netfield, let me go, and forget that such a person exists. She looked at him steadily for a moment, at the stern manliness of the face, which seemed in this half-hour to have grown older, at the attitude with its mingled dignity and appeal. In that second she realised what she had done and what she had forfeited. She measured the gulf between herself and the man before her. But she did not flinch. Still holding him, as it were, with menacing, defiant eyes, she moved aside. She waved her hand with a contemptuous gesture of dismissal. He bowed, passed her, and the door shut. For nearly an hour afterwards Elsmere wandered blindly and aimlessly through the darkness and silence of the park. The sensitive, optimist nature was all unhinged, felt itself wrestling in the grip of dark, implacable things, upheld by a single thread above that moral abyss which yawns beneath us all, into which the individual life sinks so easily to ruin and nothingness. At such moments a man realises within himself, within the circle of consciousness, the germs of all things hideous and vile. "'Save for the grace of God,' he says to himself, shuddering. "'Save only for the grace of God.' Contempt for himself, loathing for life and its possibilities, as he had just beheld them. Moral tumult, pity, remorse, a stinging self-reproach. All these things wrestled within him. What, preached to others, and stumbled himself into such mire as this?' talk loudly of love and faith, and make it possible all the time that a fellow human creature should think you capable, at a pinch, of the worst treason against both. Elsmere dived to the very depth of his own soul that night. Was it all the natural consequence of a loosened bond, of a wretched relaxation of effort, a wretched acquiescence in something second best? Had love been cooling? Had it simply ceased to take the trouble love must take to maintain itself? And had this horror been the subtle, inevitable nemesis? All at once, under the trees of the park, Asmere stopped for a moment in the darkness, and bared his head with the passionate, reverential action of a devotee before his saint. The lurid image which had been pursuing him gave way, and in its place came the image of a new-made mother, her child close within her sheltering arm. Ah, it was all plain to him now. The moral tempest had done its work. One task of all tasks had been set him from the beginning, to keep his wife's love. If she had slipped away from him, to the injury and moral lessening of both, on his cowardice, on his clumsiness, be the blame. Above all, on his fatal power of absorbing himself in a hundred outside interests, controversy, literature, society. Even his work seemed to have lost half its sacredness. If there be a canker at the root, no matter how large the show of leaf and blossom overhead, there is but the more to wither. Of what worth is any success, 
but that which is grounded deep on the rock of personal love and duty. Oh, let him go back to her, wrestle with her, open his heart again, try new ways, make new concessions. How faint the sense of her trial had been growing within him of late, hers which had once been more terrible to him than his own. He feels the special temptations of his own nature. He throws himself, humbled, convicted, at her feet. The woman, the scene he has left, is effaced, blotted out by the natural intense reaction of remorseful love. So he sped homewards at last through the noise of Oxford Street, seeing, hearing nothing. He opened his own door and let himself into the dim, silent house. How the moment recalled to him that other supreme moment of his life at Muirwell. No light in the drawing-room. He went upstairs and softly turned to the handle of her room. Inside the room seemed to him nearly dark, but the window was wide open. The free, loosely growing branches of the plane trees made a dark, delicate network against the luminous blue of the night. A cool air came to him laden with an almost rural scent of earth and leaves. By the window sat a white, motionless figure. As he closed the door, it rose and walked towards him without a word. Instinctively, Robert felt that something unknown to him had been passing here. He paused, breathless, expectant. She came to him. She linked her cold, trembling fingers round his neck. Robert, I've been waiting so long, it was so late, I thought... And she choked down a sob. Perhaps something has happened to him. We are separated for ever, and I shall never be able to tell him. Robert, Mr. Flaxman talked to me. He opened my eyes. I have been so cruel to you, so hard. I have broken my vow. I don't deserve it. But, Robert? She had spoken with extraordinary self-command till the last word, which fell into a smothered cry for pardon. Catherine Ellesmere had very little of the soft clingingness which makes the charm of a certain type of woman. Each phrase she had spoken seemed to take with it a piece of her life. She trembled and tottered in her husband's arms. He bent over her with half-articulate words of amazement, of passion. He led her to her chair, and, kneeling before her, he tried, so far as the emotion of both would let him, to make her realise what was in his own heart— the penitence and longing which had winged his return to her. Without a mention of Madame de Netfield's name, indeed, that horror she should never know. But it was to it, as he held his wife, he owed his poignant sense of something half jeopardised and wholly recovered. It was that consciousness in the background of his mind, ignorant of it as Catherine was then, and always, which gave the peculiar epoch-making force to this sacred and critical hour of their lives but she would hear nothing of his self-blame, nothing. She put her hand across his lips. "'I have seen things as they are, Robert,' she said very simply. "'Well, I have been sitting here, and downstairs, after Mr. Flaxman left me. "'You were right. I would not understand. "'And in a sense I shall never understand. "'I cannot change.' And her voice broke into piteousness. My lord is my lord always, but he is yours, too. Oh, I know it. Say what you will. That is what has been hidden from me. That is what my trouble has taught me. The parlousness, the worthlessness of words. It is the spirit that quickeneth. I should never have felt it so but for this fiery furnace of pain. But I have been wandering in strange places, through strange thoughts. God has not one language, but many. I have dared to think he had but one, the one I knew. I have dared, and she faltered, to condemn your faith as no faith. Oh, I lay there so long in the dark downstairs, seeing you by that bed. I heard your voice. I crept to your side. Jesus was there, too. Ah, he was. He was. Leave me that comfort. What are you saying? Wrong? You? Unkind? Your wife knows nothing of it. Oh, did you think when you came in just now before dinner that I didn't care, that I had a heart of stone? Did you think I had broken my solemn promise, 
my vow to you that day at Muirwell? So I have, a hundred times over. I made it in ignorance. I have not counted the cost. How could I? It was all so new, so strange. I dare not make it again. The will is so weak, circumstances so strong. But, oh, take me back into your life. Hold me there. Remind me always of this night. Convict me out of my own mouth. But I will learn my lesson. I will learn to hear the two voices, the voice that speaks to you and the voice that speaks to me. I must. It is all plain to me now. It has been appointed me. Then she broke down into a kind of weariness, and fell back in her chair, her delicate fingers straying with soft childish touch over his hair. But I am past thinking. Let us bury it all and begin again. Words are nothing. Strange ending to a day of torture. As she tired above him in the dimness, white and pure and drooping, her force of nature all dissolved, lost in this new heavenly weakness of love. He thought of the man who passed through the place of sin and the place of expiation, and saw at last the rosy light creeping along the east, caught the white moving fingers, and that sweet distant melody rising through the luminous air, which announced to him the approach of Beatrice, and the nearness of those shining tablelands whereof our God himself is moon and sun. For eternal life, the ideal state, is not something future and distant. Dante knew it when he talked of Kerke in paradisa la mia mente. Paradise is here, visible and tangible by mortal eyes and hands, whenever self is lost in loving, whenever the narrow limits of personality are beaten down by the inrush of the divine spirit. End of Book Six, Chapter Forty Three. Book Six, Chapter Forty Four of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Six, Chapter Forty Four. The saddest moment in the lives of these two persons, whose history we have followed for so long, was over and done with. Henceforward to the end, Ellesmere and his wife were lovers as of old. But that day and night left even deeper marks on Robert than on Catherine. Afterwards she gradually came to feel, running all through his views of life, a note sterner, deeper, maturer than any present there before. The reasons for it were unknown to her, though sometimes her own tender, ignorant remorse supplied them. But they were hidden deep in Ellesmere's memory. A few days afterwards he was casually told that Madame de Netville had left England for some time. As a matter of fact, he never set eyes on her again. After a while, the extravagance of his self-blame abated. He saw things as they were, without morbidness. But a certain boyish carelessness of mood he never afterwards quite recovered. Men and women of all classes, and not only among the poor, became more real and more tragic, moral truths more awful, to him. It was the penalty of a highly strung nature set with exclusive intensity towards certain spiritual ends. On the first opportunity after that conversation with Hugh Flaxman, which had so deeply affected her, Catherine accompanied Ellesmere to his Sunday lecture. He tried a little, tenderly, to dissuade her, but she went, shrinking and yet determined. She had not heard him speak in public since that last sermon of his in Muirwell Church, every detail of which by long brooding had been burnt into her mind. The bare Elgood Street room, the dingy outlook on the high walls of a warehouse opposite, the lines of blanched, quick-eyed artisans, the descent from what she loved and he had once loved, implied in everything, the lecture itself on the narratives of the passion. It was all exquisitely painful to her, and yet, yet, she was glad to be there. Afterwards, Wardlaw, with the brusque remark to Ellesmere, that any fool could see he was getting done up, insisted on taking the children's class. Catherine, too, had been impressed, as she saw Robert raised a little above her in the glare of many windows, with a sudden perception that the worn, exhausted look of the preceding summer had returned upon him. She held out her hands to Wardlaw with a quick, warm word of thanks. 
he glanced at her curiously. What had brought her there, after all? Then Robert, protesting that he was being ridiculously coddled, and that Wardlaw was much more in want of a holiday than he, was carried off to the embankment, and the two spent a happy hour wandering westward, Somerset House, the bridges, the Westminster Towers rising before them into the haze of the June afternoon. A little fresh breeze came off the river. That, or his wife's hand on his arm, seemed to put new life into Ellesmere, and she walked beside him, talking frankly, heart to heart, with flashes of her old sweet gaiety, as she had not talked for months. Deep in her mystical sense, all the time lay the belief in a final restoration, in an all-atoning moment, perhaps at the very end of life, in which the blind would see, the doubter be convinced. And meanwhile, the blessedness of this peace, this surrender. Surely the air this afternoon was pure and life-giving for them, the bells rang for them, the trees were green for them. He had need in the week that followed of all that she had given back to him, for Mr. Gray's illness had taken a dangerous and alarming turn. It seemed to be the issue of long ill health, and the doctors feared that there were no resources of constitution left to carry him through it. Every day some old St. Anselm's friend on the spot wrote to Ellesmere, and with each post the news grew more despairing. Since Ellesmere had left Oxford, he could count on the fingers of one hand the occasions on which he and Gray had met face to face. But for him, as for many another man of our time, Henry Gray's influence was not primarily an influence of personal contact. His mere life, that he was there, on English soil, within a measurable distance, had been to Ellesmere in his darkest moments one of his thoughts of refuge. At a time when a religion which can no longer be believed clashes with a scepticism full of danger to conduct, every such witness as Gray to the power of a new and coming truth holds a special place in the hearts of men who can neither accept fairy tales nor reconcile themselves to a world without faith. The saintly life grows to be a beacon, a witness. Men cling to it as they have always clung to each other, to the visible and the tangible. As the elders of Miletus, through the way lay before them, clung to the man who had set their feet therein, sorrowing most of all that they should see his face no more. The accounts grew worse. All friends shut out, no possibility of last words. The whole of Oxford moved and sorrowing. Then at last, on a Friday, came the dreaded, expected letter. He is gone. He died early this morning, without pain, conscious almost to the end. He mentioned several friends by name, you among them, during the night. The funeral is to be on Tuesday. You will be here, of course. Sad and memorable day. By an untoward chance it fell in commemoration week, and Robert found the familiar streets teeming with life and noise, under a showery, uncertain sky, which every now and then would send the bevies of lightly-gowned maidens, with their mothers and attendant squires, scurrying for shelter, and leave the roofs and pavements glistening. He walked up to St. Anselm's, found, as he expected, that the first part of the service was to be in the chapel, the rest in the cemetery, and then mounted the well-known staircase to Langham's rooms. Langham was apparently in his bedroom. Lunch was on the table, the familiar commons, the familiar toast and water. There, in a recess, were the same splendid wall maps of Greece he had so often consulted after lecture. There was the little case of coins, with the gold Alexanders he had handled with so much covetous reverence at eighteen. Outside, the irregular quadrangle with its dripping trees stretched before him. The steps of the new hall, now the shower was over, were crowded with gowned figures. It might have been yesterday that he stood in that room, blushing with awkward pleasure under Mr. Gray's first salutation. The bedroom door opened, and Langham came in. Hellsmere, but of course I expected you. His voice seemed to Robert curiously changed. There was a flatness in it, an absence of positive cordiality which was new to him in any greeting of Langham's to himself, and had a chilling effect upon him. The face, too, was changed. Tint and expression were both dulled. Its marble-like sharpness and finish had coarsened a little, and the figure, which had never possessed the erectness of youth, had now the pinched look and the confirmed stoop of the valetudinarian. "'I did not write to you, Elsmere,' he said immediately, as though in anticipation of what the other would be sure to say. 
I knew nothing but what the bulletin said, and I was told that Cathcart wrote you. It is many years now since I have seen much of Grey. Sit down and have some lunch. We have time, but not too much time. Robert took a few mouthfuls. Langham was difficult, talking disconnectedly of trifles, and Robert was soon painfully conscious that the old sympathetic bond between them no longer existed. Presently, Langham, as though with an effort to remember, asked up after Catherine, then inquired what he was doing in the way of writing, and neither of them mentioned the name of Laban. They left the table and sat spasmodically talking, in reality expectant. And at last the sound present already in both minds made itself heard, the first long, solitary stroke of the chapel bell. Robert covered his eyes. Do you remember in this room, Langham, you introduced us first? I remember, replied the other abruptly. Then, with a half-cynical, half-melancholy scrutiny of his companion, he said after a pause, What a faculty of hero-worship you've always had, Ellesmere! Do you know anything of the end? Robert asked him presently, as that tolling bell seemed to bring the strong feeling beneath more irresistibly to the surface. No, I never asked, cried Langham, with sudden harsh animation. What purpose could be served? Death should be avoided by the living. We have no business with it. Do what we will, we cannot rehearse our own parts. And the sight of other men's performance helps us no more than the sight of a great actor gives the dramatic gift. All they do for us is to imperil the little nerve, break through the little calm we have left. Ellesmere's hand dropped, and he turned round to him with a flashing smile. Ah, I know it now. You loved him still. Langham, who was standing, looked down on him sombrely, yet more indulgently. How much you always made of feeling, he said after a little pause, in a world where, according to me, our chief object should be not to feel. Then he began to hunt for his cap and gown. In another minute the two made part of the crowd in the front quadrangle, where the rain was sprinkling, and the insistent grief-laden voice of the bell rolled from pause to pause above the gowned figures, spreading thence in wide waves of morning sound over Oxford. The chapel service passed over Robert like a solemn, pathetic dream. The lines of adjugate faces, the provost's white head, the voice of the chaplain reading, the full male unison of the voices replying. How they carried him back to the day when, as a lad from school, he had sat on one of the chancel benches beside his mother, listening for the first time to the subtle simplicity, if one may be allowed the paradox, of the provost's preaching. Just opposite to where he sat now with Langham, Gray had sat that first afternoon. The freshman's curious eyes had been drawn again and again to the dark, massive head, the face with its look of reposeful force, of righteous strength. During the lesson from Corinthians, Ellesmere's thoughts were irreverently busy with all sorts of mundane memories of the dead. What was especially present to him was a series of liberal election meetings in which Gray had taken a warm part, and in which he himself had helped just before he took orders. A hundred odd incongruous details came back to Robert now with poignant force. Gray had been to him at one time primarily the professor, the philosopher, the representative of all that was best in the life of the university. Now, fresh from his own grapple with London and its life, what moved him most was the memory of the citizen, the friend and brother of common man, the thinker who had never shirked action in the name of thought, for whom conduct had been from beginning to end the first reality. The procession through the streets afterwards, which conveyed the body of this great son of modern Oxford to its last resting place in the citizen cemetery on the western side of the town, will not soon be forgotten, even in a place which forgets notoriously soon. All the university was there, all the town was there. Side by side with men honourably dear to England, who had carried with them into one or other of the great English careers the memory of the teacher, were men who had known from day to day the cheery, modest helper in a hundred local causes. Side by side with the youth of Armour Mater went the poor of Oxford. Tradesmen and artisans followed or accompanied the group of gowned and venerable figures, representing the heads of houses and the professors, or mingled with the slowly pacing crowd of masters. All along the route, groups of visitors and merrymakers, young men in flannels or girls in light dresses, 
stood with suddenly grave faces here and there, caught by the general wave of mourning, and wondering what such a spectacle might mean. Robert, losing sight of Langham as they left the chapel, found his arm grasped by young Crathcart, his correspondent. The man was a junior fellow who had attached himself to Grey during the two preceding years with a special devotion. Robert had only a slight knowledge of him, but there was something in his voice and grip which made him feel at once infinitely more at home with him at this moment than he had felt with the old friend of his undergraduate years. They walked down Bowman Street together. The rain came on again, and the long black crowd stretched before them was lashed by the driving gusts. As they went along, Cathcart told him all he wanted to know. The night before the end he was perfectly calm and conscious. I told you he mentioned your name among the friends to whom he sent his good-bye. He thought for everybody. For all those of his house he left the most minute and tender directions. He forgot nothing. And all with such extraordinary simplicity and quietness, like one arranging for a journey. In the evening an old Quaker aunt of his, a North Country woman whom he be much with as a boy, and to whom he was much attached, was sitting with him. I was there too. She was a beautiful old figure, in her white cap and kerchief, and it seemed to please him to lie and look at her. "'It'll not be for long, Henry,' she said to him once. "'I'm seventy-seven this spring. I shall come to you soon.' He made no reply, and his silence seemed to disturb her. I don't fancy she knew much of his mind of late years. "'You'll not be doubting the Lord's goodness, Henry?' she said to him, with the tears in her eyes. "'No,' he said. "'No, never. Only it seems to be his will we should be certain of nothing but himself. I ask no more.' I shall never forget the accent of those words. They were the breath of his inmost life. If ever man was got betrunken, it was he, and yet not a word beyond what he felt to be true, beyond what the intellect could, could grasp. Twenty minutes later Robert stood by the open grave. The rain beat down on the black concourse of mourners, but there were blue spaces in the drifting sky, and a wavering, rainy light played at intervals over the Witham and Hinksy hills, and over the buttercupped river meadows, where the lush hay-grass bent in long lines under the showers. To his left, the provost, his glistening white head bare to the rain, was reading the rest of the service. As the coffin was lowered, Ellesmere bent over the grave. "'My friend, my master!' cried the yearning filial heart. "'Oh, give me something of yourself to take back into life, something to brace me through this darkness of our ignorance, something to keep hope alive as you kept it to the end.' And on the inward ear there rose, with the solemnity of a last message, words which years before he had found marked in a little book of meditations borrowed from Gray's table words long treasured and often repeated. Amid a world of forgetfulness and decay, in the sight of his own shortcomings and limitations, or on the edge of the tomb, he alone who has found his soul in losing it, who in singleness of mind has lived in order to love and understand, will find that the God who is near to him as his own conscience has a face of light and love. Pressing the phrases into his memory, he listened to the triumphant outbursts of the Christian service. Man's hope, he thought, has grown humbler than this. He keeps now a more modest mien in the presence of the eternal mystery. But is it in truth less real, less sustaining? Let Grace trust answer for me. He walked away absorbed, till at last in the little squalid street outside the cemetery it occurred to him to look round for Langham. Instead he found Cathcart, who had just come up with him. "'Is Langham behind?' he asked. "'I wanted a word with him before I go.' "'Is he here?' asked the other, with a change of expression. "'But of course he was in the chapel. How could you—' "'I thought he would probably go away,' said Cathcart, with some bitterness. "'Grey made many efforts to get him to come and see him before he became so desperately ill. Langham came once. Grey never asked for him again.' "'It is his old horror of expression, I suppose.' said Robert, troubled, his dread of being forced to take a line, to face anything certain and irrevocable. I understand. He could not say good-bye to a friend to save his life. There is no shirking that. One must either do it or leave it. Cathcart shrugged his shoulders and drew a masterly little picture of Langham's life in college. 
he had succeeded by the most adroit devices in completely isolating himself both from the older and the younger men. He attends college meetings sometimes, and contributes a sarcasm or two on the cramming system of the college. He takes a constitutional to Summertown every day, on the least frequented side of the road, that he may avoid being spoken to. And as to his ways of living, he and I happen to have the same scout, old Dobson, do you remember? And if I would let him, he would tell me tales by the hour. He is the only man in the university who knows anything about it. I gather from what he says that Langham has become a complete valetudinarian. Everything must go exactly by rule. His work, his food, the management of his clothes, and any little contretour makes him ill. But the comedy is to watch him when there is anything going on in the place that he thinks may lead to a canvas and to any attempt to influence him for a vote. On these occasions he goes off with automatic regularity to an hotel at West Morven, and only reappears when the Times tell him the thing is done with both laughed. Then Robert sighed. Weaknesses of Langham's sort may be amusing enough to the contemptuous and unconcerned outsider, but the general result of them, whether for the man himself or those whom he affects, is tragic, not comic, and Ellesmere had good reason for knowing it. Later, after a long talk with the provost and meetings with various other old friends, he walked down to the station, under a sky clear from rain, and through a town gay with festal preparations. Not a sign now, in these crowded, bustling streets, of that melancholy pageant of the afternoon. The heroic memory had flashed for a moment like something vivid and gleaming in the sight of all, understanding and ignorant. Now it lay committed to a few faithful hearts, there to become one seed among many of a new religious life in England. On the platform, Robert found himself nervously accosted by a tall, shabbily dressed man. Elsmere, have you forgotten me? He turned and recognised a man whom he had last seen as the St Anselm's undergraduate, one MacNeil, a handsome, rowdy young Irishman, supposed to be clever and decidedly popular in the college. As he stood looking at him, puzzled by the difference between the old impression and the new, suddenly the man's story flashed across him. He remembered some disgraceful escapade, an expulsion. "'You came for the funeral, of course,' said the other, his face flushing consciously. "'Yes, and you too?' The man turned away, and something in his silence led Robert to stroll on beside him to the open end of the platform. "'I've lost my only friend,' MacNeil said at last, hoarsely. "'He took me up when my own father would have nothing to say to me. "'He found me work. He wrote to me. "'For years he stood between me and perdition. "'I'm just going out to a post in New Zealand he got for me. "'And next week before I sail I, I, I am to be married, and he was to be there. "'He was so pleased he had seen her.' "'It was one story out of a hundred like it, as Robert knew very well. "'They talked for a few minutes, then the train loomed in the distance.' "'He saved you,' said Robert, holding out his hand, "'and at a dark moment in my own life I owed him everything. "'There is nothing we can do for him in return but to remember him. "'Write to me, if you can or will, from New Zealand, for his sake.' "'A few seconds later the train sped past the bare little cemetery "'which lay just beyond the line. "'Robert bent forward. "'In the pale yellow glow of the evening he could distinguish the grave, "'the mound of gravel, the planks, and some figures moving beside it. He strained his eyes till he could see no more, his heart full of veneration, of memory, of prayer. In himself life seemed so restless and combative. Surely he, more than others, had need of the lofty lessons of death. End of Book Six, Chapter 44《Chapter 45 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 6, Chapter 45. In the weeks which followed, weeks often of mental and physical depression, caused by his sense of personal loss and by the influence of an overworked state he could not be got to admit, Ellesmere owed much to Hugh Flaxman's cheery, sympathetic temper and became more attached to him than ever, and more ready than ever, should the fates deem it so, to welcome him as a brother-in-law. 
However, the fates for the moment seemed to have borrowed a leaf from Langham's book, and did not apparently know their own minds. It says volumes for Hugh Flaxman's general capacities as a human being, that at this period he should have had any attention to give to a friend, his position as a lover was so dubious and difficult. After the evening at the Workman's Club, and as a result of further meditation, he had greatly developed the tactics first adopted on that occasion. He beaten a masterly retreat, and Rose Laban was troubled with him no more. The result was that a certain brilliant young person was soon sharply conscious of a sudden drop in the pleasures of living. Mr. Flaxman had been the Laban's most constant and entertaining visitor. During the whole of May he paid one formal call to Lerwick Gardens, and was then entertained tete-a-tete -tete -tete by Mrs. Laban, to Rose's intense subsequent annoyance, who knew perfectly well that her mother was incapable of chattering about anything but her daughters. He still sent flowers, but they came from his head gardener, addressed to Mrs. Laban. Agnes put them in water, and Rose never gave them a look. Rose went to Lady Helen's because Lady Helen made her, and was much too engaging a creature to be rebuffed. But, however merry and protracted the teas in these scented rooms might be, Mr. Flaxman's step on the stairs, and Mr. Flaxman's hand on the curtain over the door, till now the feature in the entertainment most to be counted on, were, generally speaking, conspicuously absent. He and the Labans met, of course, for their list of common friends was now considerable. But Agnes, reporting matters to Catherine, could only say that each of these occasions left Rose more irritable and more inclined to say biting things as to the foolish ways in which society takes its pleasures. Rose certainly was irritable, and at times, Agnes thought, depressed. But as usual, she was unapproachable about her own affairs, and the state of her mind could only be somewhat dolefully gathered from the fact that she was much less unwilling to go back to Wormwood this summer than had ever been known before. Meanwhile, Mr. Flaxman left certain other people in no doubt as to his intentions. "'My dear aunt,' he said calmly to Lady Charlotte, "'I mean to marry Miss Laban if I can at any time persuade her to have me. "'So much you may take us fixed, "'and it would be quite waste of breath on your part to quote dukes to me. "'But the other factor in the problem is by no means fixed. "'Miss Laban won't have me at present, "'and as for the future I have most salutary qualms.' "'You!' interrupted Lady Charlotte angrily. "'As if you hadn't had the mothers of London at your feet for years!' Lady Charlotte was in a most variable frame of mind, one day hoping devoutly that the Langham affair might prove lasting enough in its effects to tire Hugh out, the next outraged that a silly girl should waste a thought on such a creature while Hugh was in her way, at one time angry that an insignificant chit of a schoolmaster's daughter should apparently care so little to be the Duke of Sembert's niece, and should even dare to allow herself the luxury of snubbing a flaxman, at another utterly sceptical as to any lasting obduracy on the chit's part. The girl was clearly anxious not to fall too easily, but as to final refusal, poof! and it made her mad that Hugh would hold himself so cheap. Meanwhile, Mr. Flaxman felt himself in no way called upon to answer that remark of his aunt's we have recorded. "'I have qualms,' he repeated, "'but I mean to do all I know, and you and Helen must help me.' Lady Charlotte crossed her hands before her. "'I may be a liberal and a lion-hunter,' she said firmly, "'but I have still conscience enough left not to aid and abet my nephew in throwing himself away.' She had nearly slipped in again, but just saved herself. "'Your conscience is all a matter of the Duke,' he told her. "'Well, if you won't help me, then Helen and I will have to arrange it by ourselves.' But this did not suit Lady Charlotte at all. She had always played the part of earthly providence to this particular nephew, and it was abominable to her that the wretch, having refused for ten years to provide her with a love affair to manage, should now manage one for himself in spite of her. "'You are such an arbitrary creature,' she said fretfully. "'You prance about the world like Don Quixote, and expect me to play Sancho without a murmur.' "'How many drubbings have I brought you yet?' he asked her, laughing. He was really very fond of her. "'It is true there is a point of likeness.' I won't take your advice. But then, why don't you give me better? It is strange, he added, musing. Women talk to us about love as if we were too gross to understand it. And when they come to business and they're not in it themselves, they feel the temper of attorneys. Love? cried Lady Charlotte, nettled. Do you mean to tell me, Hugh, that you are really seriously in love with that girl? 
"'Well, I only know,' he said, thrusting his hands far into his pockets, "'that unless things mend I shall go out to California in the autumn and try ranching.' Lady Charlotte burst into an angry laugh. He stood opposite to her, with his orchid in his buttonhole, himself the fine flower of civilization. Ranching, indeed! However, he had done so many odd things in his life, that, as she knew, it was never quite safe to decline to take him seriously, and he had looked at her now so defiantly, his clear greenish eyes so wide open and alert, that her will began to waver under the pressure of his. "'What do you want me to do, sir?' His glance relaxed at once, and he laughingly explained to her that what he had asked of her was to keep the prey in sight. "'I can do nothing for myself at present,' he said. "'I get on her nerves. She was in love with that black-haired enfant du siècle, or rather she prefers to assume that she was, and I haven't given her time to forget him. Serious blunder, and I deserve to suffer for it. Very well, then, I retire, and I ask you and Helen to keep watch.' Don't let her go. Make yourself nice to her. And, in fact, spoil me a little now I am on the high road to forty, as you used to spoil me at fourteen. Mr. Flaxman sat down by his aunt and kissed her hand, after which Lady Charlotte was as wax before him. Thank heaven, she reflected, in ten days the Duke and all of them will go out of town. Retribution, therefore, for wrongdoing would be tardy, if wrongdoing there must be. She could but ruefully reflect that, after all, the girl was beautiful and gifted. Moreover, if Hugh would force her to befriend him in this criminality, there might be a certain joy in thereby vindicating those liberal principles of hers in which a scornful family had always refused to believe. So, being driven into it, she would fain have done it boldly and with a dash. But she could not rid her mind of the Duke, and her performance all through, as a matter of fact, was blundering. However, she was for the time very gracious to Rose, being in truth really fond of her, and Rose, however high she might hold her little head, could find no excuse for quarrelling either with her or Lady Helen. Towards the middle of June there was a grand ball given by Lady Fauntleroy at Fauntleroy House, to which the two Miss Labans, by Lady Helen's machinations, were invited. It was to be one of the events of the season, and when the cards arrived, to have the honour of meeting their royal highnesses, etc., etc., Mrs. Laban, good soul, gazed at them with eyes which grew a little moist under her spectacles. She wished Richard could have seen the girls dressed just once. But Rose treated the cards with no sort of tenderness. If one could but put them up to auction, she said flippantly, holding them up, how many German opera tickets I should get for nothing. I don't know what Agnes feels. As for me, I have neither nerve enough for the people nor money enough for the toilet. However, with eleven o'clock, Lady Helen ran in, a fresh vision of blue and white, to suggest certain dresses for the sisters which had occurred to her in the visions of the night. Original, adorable, cost a mere nothing. My harpy, she remarked, alluding to her dressmaker, would ruin you over them, of course. Your maid, for Laban's possessed a remarkably clever one, will make them divinely for Tuppence Halfpenny. Listen. Rose listened. Her eye kindled. The maid was summoned, and the invitation accepted in Agnes's neatest hand. Even Catherine was roused during the following ten days to a smiling indulgent interest in the concerns of the workroom. The evening came, and Lady Helen fetched the sisters in her carriage. The ball was a magnificent affair. The house was one of historical interest and importance, and all that the ingenuity of the present could do to give fresh life and gaiety to the pillared rooms, the carved galleries and stately staircases of the past, had been done. The ballroom, lined with Van Dykes and Lelys, glowed softly with electric light. The picture gallery had been banked with flowers and carpeted with red, and the beautiful dresses of the women trailed up and down it, challenging the satins of the Netschers and the Turbergs on the walls. Rose's card was soon full to overflowing. The young men present were of the smartest, and would not willingly have bowed the knee to a nobody, however pretty. But Lady Helen's devotion the girl's reputation as a musician, and her little nonchalant disdainful ways, gave her a kind of prestige, which made her, for the time being at any rate, the equal of anybody. Petitioners came and went away empty. Royalty was introduced, and smiled both upon the beauty and the beauty's delicate and becoming dress. And still Rose, though a good deal more flushed and erect than usual, 
and their flesh and blood could not resist the contagious pleasure which had glistened even in the eyes of that sage Agnes, was more than half inclined to say with the preacher that all was vanity. Presently, as she stood waiting with her hand on her partner's arm before gliding into a waltz, she saw Mr. Flaxman opposite to her, and with him a young debutante in white tulle, a thin, pretty, undeveloped creature, whose sharp elbows and timid movements together with the blushing enjoyment glowing so frankly from her face, pointed her out as the schoolgirl of sweet seventeen, just emancipated and trying her wings. "'Ah, oh, there is Lady Florence,' said her partner, a handsome young hussar. "'This ball is in her honour, you know. She comes out to-night. What, another cousin? Really, she keeps too much in the family.' "'Is Mr. Flaxman a cousin?' The young man replied that he was, and then, in the intervals of waltzing, went on to explain to her the relationships of many of the people present, till the whole gorgeous affair began to seem to Rose a mere family party. Mr. Flaxman was of it. She was not. "'Why am I here?' the little Jacobin said to herself fiercely as she waltzed. "'It is foolish, unprofitable. I do not belong to them, nor they to me.' "'Miss Laban, charmed to see you,' cried Lady Charlotte, stopping her, and then in a loud whisper in her ear, Never saw you look better. Your taste, or Helen's, that dress? The rose is exquisite. Rose dropped her a little mock curtsy, and whirled on again. Lady Florence's are always well dressed, thought the child angrily. And who notices it? Another turn brought them against Mr. Flaxman and his partner. Mr. Flaxman came at once to greet her with smiling courtesy. I have a Cambridge friend to introduce you, a beautiful youth. "'Shall I find you by Helen? "'Now, Lady Florence, patience a moment. "'That corner is too crowded. "'How good that last turn was!' "'And, bending with a sort of kind chivalry over his partner, "'who looked at him with the eyes of a joyous, excited child, "'he led her away. Five minutes later, Rose, standing flushed by Lady Helen, "'saw him coming again towards her, "'ushering a tall, blue-eyed youth "'whom he introduced to her as Lord Wainfleet.' The handsome boy looked at her with the boy's open admiration, and beguiled her of a supper-dance, while a group standing near, a mother and three daughters, stood watching with cold eyes and expressions which said plainly to the initiated that mere beauty was receiving a ridiculous amount of attention. "'I wouldn't have given it to him, but it is rude, it is bad manners not even to ask,' the supposed victress was saying to herself with quivering lips, her eyes following not the Trinity freshman who was their latest captive, but an older man's well-knit figure, and a head on which the fair hair was already growing scantily, receding a little from the fine intellectual brows. An hour later she was again standing by Lady Helen, waiting for a partner, when she saw two persons crossing the room, which was just beginning to fill again for dancing, towards them. One was Mr. Flaxman, the other was a small, wrinkled old man, who leant upon his arm, displaying the ribbon of the garter as he walked. "'Dear me!' said Lady Helen, a little fluttered. "'Here is my Uncle Semba. I thought they'd left town.' The pair approached, and the old Duke bowed over his niece's hand with the manners of a past generation. "'I, I made you give me an arm,' he said quaveringly. "'These floors are homicidal. If I came down to them I shall bring an action.' "'I thought you'd all left town,' said Lady Helen. Who can make plans with a government in power pledged to every sort of villainy and public plunder? said the old man testily. I suppose Varley's there to-night, helping to vote away my property and Fauntleroy's. Some of his own, too, if you please, said Lady Helen, smiling. Yes, I suppose he is waiting for the division, or he would be here. I wonder why Providence blessed me with such a radical crew of relations, remarked the Duke. Hugh is a regular communist. I never heard such arguments in my life. And as for any idea of standing by his order—' The old man shook his bald head, and shrugged his small shoulders with almost French vivacity. He had been handsome once, and delicately featured, but now the left eye drooped, and the face had a strong look of peevishness and ill-health. "'Uncle,' interposed Lady Helen, "'let me introduce you to my two great friends, Miss Laban, Miss Rose Laban.' The Duke bowed, looked at them through a pair of sharp eyes, seemed to cogitate inwardly whether such a name had ever been known to him, and turned to his nephew. 
get me out of this, you, and I shall be obliged to you. Young people may risk it, but if I broke, I shouldn't mend. Still grumbling audibly about the floor, he hobbled off towards the picture gallery. Mr. Flaxman had only time for a smiling, backward glance at Rose. "'Have you given my pretty boy a dance?' "'Yes,' she said, but with as much stiffness as she might have shown to his uncle. "'That's over,' said Lady Helen, with relief. "'My uncle hardly meets any of us now without a spa. "'He has never forgiven my father for going over to the Liberals. "'And then he thinks we none of us consult him enough. "'No more we do, except Aunt Charlotte. "'She's afraid of him.' "'Lady Charlotte afraid?' echoed Rose. "'Odd, isn't it? The Duke avenges a good many victims on her, if they only knew.' Lady Helen was called away, and Rose was left standing, wondering what had happened to her partner. Opposite, Mr. Flaxman was pushing through a doorway, and Lady Florence was again on his arm. At the same time she became conscious of a morsel of chaperone's conversation, such as, by the kind contrivances of fate, a girl is tolerably sure to hear under similar circumstances. The debutant's good looks, Hugh Flaxman's apparent susceptibility to them, the possibility of results, and the satisfactory disposition of the family goods and chattels that would be brought about by such a match, the opportunity it would offer the man, too, of rehabilitating himself socially after his first matrimonial escapade. Rose caught fragments of all these topics as they were discussed by two old ladies, presumably also of the family ring, who gossiped behind her with more gusto than discretion. High-mindedness, of course, told her to move away. Something else held her fast, till her partner came up to her. Then she floated away into the whirlwind of waltzers. But as she moved round the room on her partner's arm, her delicate, half-scornful grace attracting look after look, the soul within was all aflame, aflame against the serried ranks and phalanxes of this unfamiliar, hostile world. She had just been reading Trevelyan's Life of Fox aloud to her mother, who liked occasionally to flavour her knitting with literature, and she began now to revolve a passage from it, describing the upper class of the last century, which had struck that morning on her quick, retentive memory. A few thousand people who thought that the world was made for them, did it not run so, and that all outside their own fraternity were unworthy of notice or criticism, bestowed upon each other an amount of attention quite inconceivable, Within the charmed precincts there had prevailed an easy and natural mode of intercourse, in some respects singularly delightful. Such, for instance, as the Duke of Semper was master of. Well, it was worth while, perhaps, to have gained an experience, even at the expense of certain illusions as to the manners of dukes, and, and as to the constancy of friends. But never again, never again, said the impetuous inner voice. I have my world, they theirs. But why so strong a flood of bitterness against our poor upper class, so well intentioned for all its occasional lack of lucidity, should have arisen in so young a breast, it is a little difficult for the most conscientious biographer to explain. She had partners to her heart's desire. Young Lord Wainfleet used his utmost arts upon her to persuade her that at least half a dozen numbers of the regular programme were extras and therefore at his disposal. And when royalties upped, it was graciously pleased to ordain that Lady Helen and her two companions should sup behind the same folding doors as itself, while beyond these doors surged the inferior crowd of persons who had been specially invited to meet their royal highnesses, and had so far been held worthy neither to dance nor to eat in the same room with them. But in vain. Rose still felt herself, for all her laughing outward insouciance, a poor, bruised, helpless chattel, trodden under the heel of a world which was intolerably powerful, rich and self-satisfied, the odious product of family arrangements. Mr. Flaxman sat far away at the same royal table as herself. Beside him was the thin, tall debutante. "'She's like one of the Gainsborough princesses,' thought Rose, studying her with involuntary admiration. "'Of course it is all plain. He will get everything he wants, and a Lady Florence into the bargain.' Radical, indeed! What nonsense! Then it startled her to find that the eyes of Lady Florence's neighbour were, as it seemed, on herself. Or was he merely nodding to Lady Helen? And she began immediately to give a smiling attention to the man on her left. An hour later, she and Agnes and Lady Helen were descending the great staircase on their way to their carriage. 
The morning light was flooding through the chinks of the carefully veiled windows. Lady Helen was yawning behind her tiny white hand, her eyes nearly asleep. But the two sisters, who had not been up till three on four preceding nights, like their chaperone, were still almost as fresh as the flowers massed in the hall below. "'Ah, there is Hugh!' cried Lady Helen. "'How I hope he's found the carriage!' At that moment Rose slipped on a spray of gardenia which had dropped from the bouquet of some predecessor. To prevent herself from falling downstairs, she caught hold of the stem of a brazen chandelier fixed in the balustrade. It saved her, but she gave her arm a most painful wrench, and leant limp and white against the railing of the stairs. Lady Helen turned at Agnes's exclamation, but before she could speak, as it seemed, Mr. Flaxman, who had been standing talking just below them, was on the stairs. "'You've hurt your arm. Don't speak. Take mine. Let me get you downstairs out of the crush.' She was too far gone to resist, and when she was mistress of herself again, she found herself in the library with some water in her hand which Mr. Flaxman had just put there. "'Is it the playing hand?' said Lady Helen, anxiously. "'No,' said Rose, trying to laugh. "'The bowing elbow!' And she raised it, but with a contortion of pain. "'Don't raise it,' he said peremptorily. "'We will have a doctor here in a moment, and have it bandaged.' He disappeared. Rose tried to sit up, seized with a frantic longing to disobey him and get off before he returned. Stinging the girl's mind was the sense that it might all perfectly well seem to him a planned appeal to his pity. "'Agnes, help me up,' she said, with a little involuntary groan. "'I shall be better at home.' But both Lady Helen and Agnes laughed her to scorn, and she lay back once more, overwhelmed by fatigue and faintness. A few more minutes, and a doctor appeared, caught by good luck in the next street. He pronounced it a severe muscular strain, but nothing more applied a lotion, and improvised a sling. Rose consulted him anxiously as to the interference with her playing. "'No meek,' he said. "'No more, if you are careful.' Her pale face brightened. Her art had seemed specially dear to her of late. "'Hugh,' called Lady Helen, going to the door. "'Now we are ready for the carriage.' Rose, leaning on Agnes, walked out into the hall. They found him there, waiting. "'The carriage is here.' he said, bending towards her with a look and tone which so stirred the fluttered nerves that the sense of faintness stole back upon her. "'Let me take you to it.' "'Thank you,' she said coldly, but by a superhuman effort. "'My sister's help is quite enough.' He followed them with Lady Helen. At the carriage door the sisters hesitated a moment. Rose was helpless without her right hand. A little imperative movement from behind displaced Agnes, and Rose felt herself hoisted in by a strong arm. She sank into the farther corner. The glow of the dawn caught her white, delicate features, the curls on her temples, all the silken confusion of her dress. He Flaxman put in Agnes and his sister, said something to Agnes about coming to inquire, and raised his hat. Rose caught the quick force and intensity of his eyes, and then closed her own, lost in a languid swoon of pain, memory, and resentful wonder. Flaxman walked away down Park Lane, through the chill morning quietness, the gathering light striking over the houses beside him onto the misty stretches of the park. His hat was over his eyes, his hands thrust into his pockets. A close observer would have noticed a certain trembling of the lips. It was but a few seconds since her young, warm beauty had been for an instant in his arms. His whole being was shaken by it, and by that last look of hers. "'Have I gone too far?' he asked himself anxiously. "'Is it divinely true, already, that she resents being left to herself? "'Oh, little rebel, you tried your best not to let me see. "'But you were angry, you were. "'Now then, how to proceed? "'She's all fire, all character. "'I rejoice in it. "'If she will give me trouble, so much the better. "'Poor little hurt thing. "'The fight is only beginning.' but I will make her do penance some day for all that loftiness to-night. If these reflections betray to the reader a certain masterful note of confidence in Mr. Flaxman's mind, he will perhaps find small cause to regret that Rose did give him a great deal of trouble. Nothing could have been more salutary, to use his own word, than the dance she led him during the next three weeks. She provoked him indeed at moments so much that he was a hundred times on the point of trying to seize his kingdom of heaven by violence, 
of throwing himself upon her with a tempest shock of reproach and appeal. But some secret instinct restrained him. She was willful, she was capricious, she had a real and powerful distraction in her art. He must be patient and risk nothing. He suspected, too, what was the truth, that Lady Charlotte was doing harm. Rose, indeed, had grown so touchingly sensitive that she found offence in almost every word of Lady Charlotte's about her nephew. Why should the apparently casual remarks of the aunt bear so constantly on the subject of the nephew's social importance? Rose vowed to herself that she needed no reminder of that station whereunto it had pleased God to call her, and that Lady Charlotte might spare herself all those anxieties and reluctances which the girl's quick sense detected in spite of the invitations so freely showered on Lerwick Gardens. The end of it all was that Hugh Flaxman found himself again driven into a corner. At the bottom of him was still a confidence that would not yield. Was it possible that he had ever given her some tiny, involuntary glimpse of it, and that, but for that glimpse, she would have let him make his peace much more easily? At any rate, now he felt himself at the end of his resources. "'I must change the venue,' he said to himself. "'Decidedly, I must change the venue.' So, by the end of June, he had accepted an invitation to fish in Norway with a friend, and was gone. Rose received the news with a callousness which made even Lady Helen want to shake her. On the eve of his journey, however, Hugh Flaxman had at last confessed himself to Catherine and Robert. His obvious plight made any further scruples on their part futile, and what they had they gave him in the way of sympathy. Also, Robert, gathering that he already knew much, and without betraying any confidence of Rose's, gave him a hint or two on the subject of Langham. But more not the friendliest mortal could do for him, and Flaxman went off into exile, announcing to a mocking Ellesmere that he should sit pensive on the banks of Norwegian rivers till fortune had had time to change. End of Book 6, Chapter 45Book 7, Chapter 46 of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 7, Chapter 46 A hot July had well begun, but still Ellesmere was toiling on in Elgood Street and could not persuade himself to think of a holiday. Catherine and the child he had driven away more than once, but the claims upon himself were becoming so absorbing he did not know how to go even for a few weeks. There were certain individuals in particular who depended on him from day to day. One was Charles Richards's widow. The poor desperate creature had put herself abjectly into Ellesmere's hands. He had sent her to an asylum, where she had been kindly and skilfully treated, and after six weeks' abstinence she had just returned to her children and was being watched by himself and a competent woman neighbour whom he had succeeded in interesting in the case. Another was a young secret springer, to use the mysterious terms of the trade, Robson by name, whom Ellesmere had originally known as a clever workman belonging to the watchmaking colony, and a diligent attendant from the beginning on the Sunday lectures. He was now too ill to leave his lodgings, and his sickly pessimist personality had established a special hold on Robert. He was dying of tumour in the throat, and had become a torment to himself and a disgust to others. There was a spark of wayward genius in him, however, which enabled him to bear his ills with a mixture of savage humour and clear-eyed despair. In general outlook, he was much akin to the author of The City of Dreadful Night, whose poems he read. The loathsome spectacles of London have filled him with a kind of sombre energy of revolt against all that is and now that he could only work intermittently, he would sit brooding for hours, startling the fellow workmen who came in to see him with ghastly hind-like jokes on his own hideous disease, living no one exactly knew how, though it was supposed on supplies sent him by a shopkeeper uncle in the country, and constantly on the verge, as all his acquaintances felt, of some ingenious expedient or other for putting an end to himself and his troubles. He was unmarried and a misogynist to boot, no woman willingly went near him, and he tended himself. How Robert had gained any hold upon him, no one could guess. 
but from the moment when Ellesmere, struck in the lecture-room by the pallid, ugly face and swathed neck, began regularly to go and see him, the elder man felt instinctively that virtue had gone out of him, and that in some subtle way yet another life had become pitiful, silently dependent on his own stock of strength and comfort. His lecturing and teaching work also was becoming more and more the instrument of far-reaching change, and therefore more and more difficult to leave. The thoughts of God, the image of Jesus, which were active and fruitful in his own mind, had been gradually passing from the one into the many, and Robert watched the sacred transforming emotion, once nurtured at his own heart, now working among the crowd of men and women his fiery speech had gathered round him, with a trembling joy, a humble prostration of the soul before the eternal truth, no word can fitly describe. With an ever-increasing detachment of mind from the objects of self and sense, he felt himself a tool in the great workman's hand. Accomplish thy purposes in me, was the cry of his whole heart and life. Use me to the utmost, spend every faculty I have, O thou who mouldest men. But in the end his work itself drove him away. A certain memorable Saturday evening brought it about. It had been his custom of late to spend an occasional evening hour after his night-school work in the North R Club, of which he was now, by invitation, a member. Here, in one of the inner rooms, he would stand against the mantelpiece, chatting, smoking often with the men. Everything came up in turn to be discussed, and Robert was at least as ready to learn from the practical workers about him as to teach. But in general these informal talks and debates became the supplement of the Sunday lectures. Here he met Andrews and the secularist crew face to face. Here he grappled in Socratic fashion with objections and difficulties, throwing into the task all his charm and all his knowledge, a man at once of no pretensions and of unfailing natural dignity. Nothing so far had served his cause and his influence so well as these moments of free discursive intercourse. The mere orator, the mere talker indeed, would never have gained any permanent hold. But the life behind gave weight to every acute or eloquent word, an importance even to those mere sallies of a boyish enthusiasm which were still common enough in him. He had already visited the club once during the week preceding this Saturday. On both occasions there was much talk of the growing popularity and efficiency of the Elgood Street work, of the numbers attending the lectures the storytelling, the Sunday school, and of the way in which the attractions of it had spread into other quarters of the parish, exciting there, especially among the clergy of St. Wilfrid's, an anxious and critical attention. The conversation on Saturday night, however, took a turn of its own. Robert felt in it a new and curious note of responsibility. The men present were evidently beginning to regard the work as their work also, and its success as their interest. It was perfectly natural, for not only had most of them been his supporters and hearers from the beginning, but some of them were now actually teaching in the night school or helping in the various branches of the large and overflowing boys' club. He listened to them for a while in his favourite attitude, leaning against the mantelpiece, throwing in a word or two now and then as to how this or that part of the work might be amended or expanded. Then suddenly a kind of inspiration seemed to pass from them to him. Bending forward as the talk dropped a moment, he asked them, with an accent more emphatic than usual, whether in view of this collaboration of theirs, which was becoming more valuable to him and his original helpers every week, it was not time for a new departure. Suppose I drop my dictatorship, he said. Suppose we set up a parliamentary government. Are you ready to take your share? Are you ready to combine, to commit yourselves? Are you ready for an effort to turn this work into something lasting and organic? The men gathered round him, smoked on in silence for a minute. Old MacDonald, who had been sitting contentedly puffing away in a corner peculiarly his own, and dedicated to the glorification, in broad Berwickshire, of the experimental philosophers, laid down his pipe and put on his spectacles, that he might grasp the situation better. Then Lestrange, in a dry, cautious way, Ask Ellesmere to explain himself further. Robert began to pace up and down, talking out his thought, his eyes kindling. But in a minute or two he stopped abruptly, with one of those striking, rapid gestures characteristic of him. 
but no mere social and educational body, mind you. And his bright commanding look swept round the circle. A good thing, surely, yet is there better than it. The real difficulty of every social effort, you know it and I know it, lies not in the planning of the work, but in the kindling of will and passion enough to carry it through. And that can only be done by religion, by faith. He went back to his old leaning attitude, his hands behind him. The men gazed at him, at the slim figure, the transparent, changing face, with a kind of fascination, but were still silent, till MacDonald said slowly, taking off his glasses again, and clearing his throat, "'You be about starting a new church, I'm thinking, Mr. Ellesmere.' "'If you like,' said Robert impetuously, "'I have no fear of the great words. "'You can do nothing by despising the past and its products. "'You can also do nothing by being too much afraid of them, "'by letting them choke and stifle your own life. "'Let the new wine have its new bottles, if it must, "'and never mind words. "'Be content to be a new sect, conventicle, or what not, so long as you feel that you are something with a life and purpose of its own in this tangle of a world. Again he paused with knit brows, thinking. Lestrange sat with his elbows on his knees, studying him. The spare grey hair brushed back tightly from the bony face, on the lips the slightest Voltairean smile. Perhaps it was the coolness of his look which insensibly influenced Robert's next words. However, I don't imagine we should call ourselves a church. Something much humbler will do, if you choose ever to make anything of these suggestions of mine. Association, society, brotherhood, what you will. But always, if I can persuade you, with something in the name and everything in the body itself, to show that for the members of it life rests still, as all life worth having has everywhere rested, on trust and memory. Trust in the God of experience and history, memory of that God's work in man, by which alone we know him and can approach him. Well, of that work, I have tried to prove it to you a thousand times, Jesus of Nazareth has become to us, by the evolution of circumstance, the most moving, the most efficacious of all types and epitomes. We have made our protest, we are daily making it, in the face of society, against the fictions and overgrowths, which at the present time are excluding him more and more from human love. But now, suppose we turn our backs on negation, and have done with mere denial. Suppose we throw all our energies into the practical building of a new house of faith, the gathering and organising of a new company of Jesus. Other men had been stealing in while he was speaking. The little room was nearly full. It was strange, the contrast between the squalid modernness of the scene, with its incongruous sights and sounds, the club-room, painted in various hideous shades of cinnamon and green, the smoke, the lines and groups of working men in every sort of working dress, the occasional rumbling of huge wagons past the window, the click of glasses and cups in the refreshment bar outside, and this stir of spiritual passion which any competent observer might have felt sweeping through the little crowd as Robert spoke, connecting what was passing there with all that is sacred and beautiful in the history of the world. After another silence, a young fellow in a shabby velvet coat stood up. He was commonly known among his fellow potters as the Hartist, because of his long hair, his little affectations of dress, and his aesthetic susceptibilities generally. The wits of the club made him their target, but the teasing of him that went on was more or less tempered by the knowledge that in his own queer way he brought up and educated two young sisters almost from infancy, and that his sweetheart had been killed before his eyes a year before, in a railway accident. "'I don't know,' he said in a high treble voice, "'I don't know whether I speak for anybody but myself. Very likely not. But what I do know,' and he raised his right hand and shook it with a gesture of curious felicity, "'is this. What Mr. Ellesmere starts, I'll join. Where he goes, I'll go. What's good enough for him's good enough for me. He's put a new heart and a new stomach into me, and what I've got he shall have.' whenever it pleases him to call for it. So if he wants to run a new thing against, or alongside the Eldons, and he wants me to help him with it, I don't know as I'm very clear what he's driving at, nor what good I can do him, but when Tom Wheeler's asked for, he'll be there. A deep murmur, rising almost into a shout of assent, ran through the little assembly. 
Robert bent forward, his eye listening, a moved acknowledgment in his look and gesture. But in reality a pang ran through the fiery soul. It was the personal estimate, after all, that was shaping their future and his, and the idealist was up in arms for his idea, sublimely jealous lest any mere personal fancy should usurp its power and place. A certain amount of desultory debate followed as to the possible outlines of a possible organisation, and as to the observances which might be devised to mark its religious character. As it flowed on, the atmosphere grew more and more electric. A new passion, though still timid and awestruck, seemed to shine from the looks of the men standing or sitting round at the central figure. Even Lestrange lost his smile under the pressure of that strange, subdued expectancy about him, and when Robert walked homeward, about midnight, there weighed upon him an almost awful sense of crisis, of an expanding future. He let himself in softly and went into his study. There he sank into a chair and fainted. He was probably not unconscious very long, but after he had struggled back to his senses and was lying stretched on the sofa among the books with which he was littered, the solitary candle in the big room throwing weird shadows about him, a moment of black depression overtook him. It was desolate and terrible, like a presence of death. How was it he had come to feel so ill? Suddenly, as he looked back over the preceding weeks, the physical weakness and disturbance which had marked them, and which he had struggled through, paying as little heed as possible, took shape, spectre-like, in his mind. And at the same moment a passionate rebellion against weakness and disablement arose in him. He sat up dizzily, his head in his hands. Rest, strength, he said to himself with strong inner resolve, for the work's sake. He dragged himself up to bed, and said nothing to Catherine till the morning. Then, with boyish brightness, he asked her to take him and the babe off without delay to the Norman coast, vowing that he would lounge and idle for six whole weeks if she would let him. Shocked by his looks, she gradually got from him the story of the night before. As he told it, his swoon was a mere untoward incident and hindrance in a spiritual drama, the thrill of which, which he described it, passed even to her. The contrast, however, between the strong hopes she felt pulsing through him and his air of fragility and exhaustion seemed to melt the heart within her, and make her whole being, she hardly knew why, one sensitive dread. She sat beside him, her head laid against his shoulder, oppressed by a strange and desolate sense of her comparatively small share in this ardent life. In spite of his tenderness and devotion, she felt often as though he were no longer hers, as though a craving, hungry world, whose needs were all dark and unintelligible to her, were asking him from her, claiming to use as roughly and prodigally as it pleased the quick mind and delicate frame. As to the schemes developing round him, she could not take them in whether for protest or sympathy. She could think only of where to go, what doctor to consult, how she could persuade him to stay away long enough. There was little surprise in Elgood Street when Ellesmere announced that he must go off for a while. He so announced it that everybody who heard him understood that his temporary withdrawal was to be the mere preparation for a great effort, the vigil before the tourney, and the eager friendliness with which he was met sent him off in good heart. Three or four days later, he, Catherine and Mary, were at Petit Dal, a little place on the Norman coast near Fécombe, with which he had first made acquaintance years before, when he was at Oxford. Here, all that in London had been oppressive in the August heat, suffered a sea change, and became so much matter for physical delight. It was fiercely hot indeed. Every morning, between five and six o'clock, Catherine would stand by the little white-veiled window in the dewy silence, to watch the eastern shadow spreading sharply already into a blazing world of sun, and see the tall poplar just outside shooting into a quivering, chargeless depth of blue. Then, as early as possible, they would sally forth before the glare became unbearable. The first event of the day was always Mary's bathe, which gradually became a spectacle for the whole beach, so ingenious were the blandishments of the father who wooed her into the warm, sandy shallows and so beguiling the glee and pluck of the two-year-old English bébé. By eleven the heat out of doors grew intolerable, and they would stroll back, father and mother and trailing child, past the hotels on the plage, along the irregular village lane, to the little house where they had established themselves, 
with Mary's nurse and a French bonne to look after them, would find the green wooden shutters drawn close, the déjeuner waiting for them in the cool, bare room, and the scent of the coffee penetrating from the kitchen, where the two maids kept up a dumb but perpetual warfare. Then afterwards Mary, emerging from her sunbonnet, would be tumbled into her white bed upstairs, and lie, a flushed image of sleep, till the patter of her little feet on the boards, which alone separated one story from the other, warned mother and nurse that an imp of mischief was let loose again. Meanwhile Robert, in the carpetless salon, would lie back in the rickety armchair which was its only luxury, lazily dozing and dreaming, Balzac perhaps in his hand, but quite another comédie humaine unrolling itself vaguely meanwhile in the contriving optimist mind. Petit Dal was not fashionable yet, though it aspired to be, but he could boast of a deputy and a senator and a professor of the Collège de France, as good as any of Entretat, a tired journalist or two, and a sprinkling of Rouen men of business. Robert soon made friends among them, more sûr, by dint of a rough-and-ready French, spoken with the most unblushing accent imaginable, and lounged along the sands through many an amusing and sociable hour with one or other of his new acquaintances. But by the evening husband and wife would leave the crowded beach, and mount by some tortuous dusty way on to the high plateau through which was cleft far below the wooded fissure of the village. Here they seemed to have climbed the beanstalk into a new world. The rich Normandy country lay all around them, the cornfields, the hedgeless tracts of white-flowered lucerne or crimson clover, dotted by the orchard trees which made one vast garden of the land as one sees it from a height. On the fringe of the cliff, where the soil became too thin and barren even for French cultivation, there was a wild belt, half heather, half tangled grass and flower growth, which the English pair loved for their own special reasons. Bathed in light, cooled by the evening wind, the patches of heather glowing, the tall grasses swaying in the breeze, there were moments when its wide, careless, dusty beauty reminded them poignantly, and yet most sweetly, of the home of their first unclouded happiness, of the Surrey commons and wildernesses. One evening they were sitting in the warm dusk by the edge of a little dip of heather sheltered by a tuft of broom, when suddenly they heard the purring sound of the nightjar, and immediately afterwards the bird itself lurched past them, and as it disappeared into the darkness they caught several times the characteristic click of the wing. Catherine raised her hand and laid it on Robert's. The sudden tears dropped on to her cheeks. "'Did you hear it, Robert?' He drew her to him. These involuntary signs of an abiding pain in her always smote him to the heart. "'I'm not unhappy, Robert,' she said at last, raising her head. "'No, if you will only get well and strong. I have submitted. It is not for myself, but—' "'For what, then? Merely the touchiness of mortal things as such? Of youth? Of hope? Of memory?' Choking down a sob, she looked seaward over the curling, flame-coloured waves, while he held her hand close and tenderly. No, she was not unhappy. Something indeed had gone for ever out of that early joy. Her life had been caught and nipped in the great inexorable wheel of things. It would go in some sense maimed to the end. But the bitter self-torturing of that first endless year was over. Love and her husband and the thousand subtle forces of a changing world had conquered. She would live and die steadfast to the old faiths. But her present mind and its outlook was no more the mind of her early married life than the Christian philosophy of today is the Christian philosophy of the Middle Ages. She was not conscious of change, but change there was. She had in fact undergone that dissociation of the moral judgment from a special series of religious formulae, which is the crucial, the epoch-making fact of our day. Unbelief, says the orthodox preacher, is sin, and implies it. And while he speaks, the saint in the unbeliever gently smiles down his argument, and suddenly, in the rebel of yesterday, men see the rightful heir of tomorrow. End of Book 7, Chapter 46「Book Seven, Chapter Forty Seven of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Seven, Chapter Forty Seven. Meanwhile, the Laybans were at Burwood again. Rose's summer, indeed, was much varied by visits to country houses many of them belonging to friends and acquaintances of the Flaxman family, by concerts and the demands of several new and exciting artistic friendships. But she was seldom loath to come back to the little bare valley and the grey-walled house. Even the rain, which poured down in August, quite unabashed by any consciousness of fine weather elsewhere, was not as intolerable to her as in past days. The girl was not herself. There was visible in her not only that general softening and deepening of character which had been the consequence of her trouble in the spring, but a painful ennui she could hardly disguise, a longing for she knew not what. She was beginning to take the homage paid to her gift and her beauty with a quiet dignity, which was in no sense false modesty, but implied a certain clearness of vision, curious and disquieting in so young and dazzling a creature. And when she came home from her travels, she would develop a taste for long walks, breasting the mountains in rain or sun, penetrating to their austerest solitudes alone, as though haunted by that profound saying of Obermann, Man is not made for enjoyment only. La tristesse fait aussi partie de ses vastes boisons. What indeed was it that ailed her? In her lonely moments, especially in those moments among the high fells, beside some little tarn or streamlet, while the sheets of mist swept by her, or the great clouds dappled the spreading sides of the hills. She thought often of Langham, of that first thrill of passion which had passed through her, delusive and abortive, like one of those first thrills of spring which bring out the buds, only to provide victims for the frost. Now with her again, a moral east wind was blowing. The passion was gone. The thought of Langham still roused in her a pity that seemed to strain at her heartstrings. But was it really she— really this very rose, who had rested for that one intoxicating instant on his breast. She felt a sort of bitter shame over her own shallowness of feeling. She must surely be a poor creature, else how could such a thing have befallen her, and have left so little trace behind? And then, her hand dabbling in the water, her face raised to the blind, friendly mountains, she would go dreaming far afield. Little vignettes of London would come and go on the inner retina. Smiles and sighs would follow one another. How kind he was that time! How amusing this! Or, how provoking he was that afternoon! How cold that evening! Nothing else. The pronoun remained ambiguous. I want a friend, she said to herself once, as she was sitting far up in the bosom of High Fell. I want a friend badly. Yet my lover deserts me, and I send away my friend. One afternoon Mrs. Thornburg, the vicar, and Rose were wandering round the churchyard together, enjoying a break of sunny weather after days of rain. Mrs. Thornburg's personal accent, so to speak, had grown perhaps a little more defined, a little more emphatic even, than when we first knew her. The vicar, on the other hand, was a trifle greyer, a trifle more submissive, as though on the whole, in the long conjugal contests of life, he was getting clearly worsted as the years went on. But the performance through which his wife was now taking him tried him exceptionally, and she only kept him to it with difficulty. She had had an attack of bronchitis in the spring, and was still somewhat delicate, a fact which to his mind gave her an unfair advantage of him, for she would make use of it to keep constantly before him ideas which he disliked, and in which he considered she took a morbid and unbecoming pleasure. The vicar was of opinion that when his latter end overtook him, he should meet it on the whole as courageously as other men. But he was altogether averse to dwelling upon it, or the adjuncts of it beforehand. Mrs. Thornburg, however, since her illness, had awoke to that inquisitive affectionate interest in these very adjuncts which many women feel. And it was extremely disagreeable to the vicar. At the present moment she was engaged in choosing the precise spots of the little churchyard where it seemed to her it would be pleasant to rest. There was one corner in particular which attracted her, and she stood now looking at it with measuring eyes and dissatisfied mouth. "'William, I wish you would come here and help me!' The vicar took no notice, but went on talking to Rose. "'William!' imperatively. The vicar turned unwillingly. "'You know, William, if you wouldn't mind lying with your feet that way, there would be just room for me, 
but of course if you will have them the other way the shoulders in the old black silk mantle went up and the grey curls shook dubiously the vicar's countenance showed plainly that he thought the remark worse than irrelevant uh, my dear he said crossly i am not thinking of those things nor i do i wish to think of them everything has its time and place it is close on tea and miss rose says she must be going home mrs thornburg again shook her head this time with a disapproving sigh you talk william she said severely as if you were a young man instead of turning sixty-six last birthday and again she measured the spaces with her eye checking the results aloud but the vicar was obdurately deaf he strolled on with rose who was chattering to him about a visit to manchester and the little church gate clicked behind them hearing it mrs thornburg relaxed her measurements they were only really interesting to her after all when the vicar was by she hurried after them as fast as her short squat figure would allow and stopped midway to make an exclamation a carriage she said shading her eyes with a very plump hand stopping at greyburns the one road to the valley was visible from the churchyard winding along the bottom of the shallow green trough for at least two miles greybarns was a farmhouse just beyond burwood about half a mile away mrs thornburg moved on her matronly face aglow with interest mary jenkinson taken ill she said of course that's dr baker well it's to be hoped it won't be twins this time but as i told her last sunday it's constitutional my dear i knew a woman who had three pairs five o'clock now well about seven it'll be worth while sending to inquire when she overtook the vicar and his companion she began to whisper certain particulars into the ear that was not on rose's side the vicar who like uncle toby was possessed of a fine natural modesty would have preferred that his wife would refrain from whispering on these topics in rose's presence but he submitted lest opposition should provoke her into still more audible improprieties and rose walked on a step or two in front of the pair her eyes twinkling a little at the vicarage gate she was let off with the customary final gossip mrs thornburg was so much occupied in the fate hanging over mary jenkinson that she for once forgot to catechise rose as to any manageable young men she might have come across in a recent visit to a great country house of the neighbourhood an operation which formed the invariable pendant to any of rose's absences so with a smiling nod to them both the girl turned homewards as she did so she became aware of a man's figure walking along the space of road between greybarns and burwood the western light behind it dr baker but even granting that mrs jenkinson had brought him five miles on a false alarm in the provoking manner of matrons the shortest professional visit could not be over in this time she looked again shading her eyes she was nearing the gate of Burwood, and involuntarily slackened step. The man who was approaching, catching sight of the slim, girlish figure in the broad hat and pink and white cotton dress, hurried up. The colour rushed to Rose's cheek. In another minute she and Hugh Flaxman were face to face. She could not hide her astonishment. "'Why are you not in Scotland?' she said, after she had given him her hand. "'Lady Helen told me last week she expected you in Rossia.' directly the words left her mouth she felt she had given him an opening and why had nature played her with this trick of blushing and because i am here he said smiling his keen dancing eyes looking down upon her he was bronzed as she had never seen him and never had he seemed to bring with him such an atmosphere of cool pleasant strength i have slain so much since the first of july that i can slay no more i am not like other men the nimrod in me is easily gorged and goes to sleep after a while so this is Burwood. He caught her just on the little sweep leading to the gate, and now his eyes swept quickly over the modest old house with its trim garden, its overgrown porch and open casement windows. She dared not ask him again why he was there. In the properest manner she invited him to come in and see Mamma. I hope Mrs. Naban is better than she was in town. I should be delighted to see her. But must you go in so soon? I left my carriage half a mile below, and have been revelling in the sun and air. I am loath to go indoors yet a while. Are you busy? Would it trouble you to put me in the way to the head of the valley? Then, if you will allow me, I will present myself later." Rose thought his request as little in the ordinary line of things as his appearance. But she turned and walked beside him, pointing out the crags at the head, 
the great sweep of High Fell, and the pass over to Alswater, with as much sang froid as she was mistress of. He, on his side, informed her that on his way to Scotland he had bethought himself that he had never seen the lakes, that he had stopped at Wimborough, was bent on walking over the High Fell Pass to Alswater, and making his way thence to Ambleside, Grasmere, and Keswick. "'But you're much too late to-day to get to Alswater,' cried Rose incautiously. "'Certainly. You see my hotel?' And he pointed, smiling, to a white farmhouse standing just at the bend of the valley, where the road turned towards Winborough. "'I persuaded the good woman there to give me a bed for the night, took my carriage a little farther, then, knowing I had friends in these parts, I came on to explore.' Rose angrily felt her flush getting deeper and deeper. "'You're the first tourist,' she said coolly, "'who has ever stayed in Windale.' "'A tourist? I repudiate the name. I am a worshipper at the shrine of Wordsworth and Nature. Had and I long ago defined a tourist as a being with straps. I defy you to discover a strap about me, and I left my Murray in the railway carriage.' He looked at her, laughing. She laughed, too. The infection of his strong, sunny presence was irresistible. In London it had been so easy to stand on her dignity, to remember whenever he was friendly that the night before he had been distant. In these green solitudes it was not easy to be anything but natural, the child of the moment. "'You are neither more practical nor more economical than when I saw you last,' she said demurely. "'When did you leave Norway?' They wandered on past the vicarage, talking fast. Mr. Flaxman, who had been joined for a time on his fishing tour by Lord Wainfleet, was giving her an amusing account of the susceptibility to titles shown by the primitive Democrats of Norway. As they passed a gap in the vicarage hedge, laughing and chatting, Rose became aware of a window and a grey head hastily withdrawn. Mr. Flaxman was puzzled by the merry flash, instantly suppressed, that shot across her face. Presently they reached the hamlet of High Close, and the house where Mary Backhouse died, and where her father and the poor bedridden Jim still lived. They mounted the path behind it, and plunged into the hazel plantation which had sheltered Robert and Catherine on a memorable night. But when they were through it, Rose turned to the right along a scrambling path leading to the top of the first great shoulder of High Fell. It was a steep climb, though a short one, and it seemed to Rose that when she had once let him help her over a rock, her hand was never her own again. He kept it an almost constant prisoner, on one pretext or another, till they were at the top. Then she sank down on a rock, out of breath. He stood beside her, lifting his brown wide awake from his brow. The air below had been warm and relaxing. Here it played upon them both with a delicious, life-giving freshness. He looked round on the great hollow bosom of the fell, the crags buttressing it on either hand, the winding greenness of the valley, the white sparkle of the river. It reminds me a little of Norway, the same austere and frugal beauty, the same bare valley floors, but no pines, no peaks, no fjords. No, said Rose scornfully, we are not Norway and we are not Switzerland. To prevent disappointment I may at once inform you that we have no glaciers and that there is perhaps only one place in the district where a man who was not an idiot could succeed in killing himself. He looked at her, calmly smiling. "'You're angry,' he said, "'because I make comparisons. "'You're wholly on a wrong scent. "'I never saw a scene in the world "'that pleased me half as much as this bare valley, "'that grey roof,' "'and he pointed to Burburg among its trees, "'and this knoll of rocky ground.' His look travelled back to her, and her eyes sank beneath it. He threw himself down on the short grass beside her. "'It rained this morning,' She still had the spirit to murmur under her breath. He took not the smallest heed. "'Do you know?' he said, and his voice dropped. "'Can you guess at all why I am here to-day?' "'You have never seen the lakes,' she repeated in a prim voice, her eyes still cast down, the corners of her mouth twitching. "'You stopped at Wimborough, intending to take the pass over to Arswater, thence to make your way to Ambleside and Keswick. Or was it to Keswick and Ambleside?' She looked up innocently, but the flashing glance she met abashed her again. Taqueen, he said, but you shall not laugh me out of countenance. If I said all that to you just now, may I be forgiven? One purpose, one only, brought me from Norway, for maybe to go to Scotland, drew me to Wimborough, guided me up your valley. 
the purpose of seeing your face. It could not be said at that precise moment that he had attained it. Rather, she seemed bent on hiding that face quite away from him. It seemed to him an age before, drawn by the magnetism of his look, her hands dropped, and she faced him, crimson, her breath fluttering a little. Then she would have spoken, but he would not let her. Very tenderly and quietly, his hand possessed itself of hers as he knelt beside her. "'I have been in exile for two months. You sent me. I saw that I troubled you in London. You thought I was pursuing you, pressing you. Your manner said, Go, and I went. But do you think that for one day, or hour, or moment, I have thought of anything else in those Norway woods, but of you, and of this blessed moment when I should be at your feet, as I am now?' She trembled. Her hand seemed to leap in his. His gaze melted, enwrapped her. He bent forward. In another moment her silence would have so answered for her that his covetous arms would have stolen about her for good and all. But suddenly a kind of shiver ran through her, a shiver which was half memory, half shame. She drew back violently, covering her eyes with her hand. "'Oh, no, no!' she cried, and her other hand struggled to get free. "'Don't, don't talk to me so. I—' I have a, a confession." He watched her, his lips trembling a little, a smile of the most exquisite indulgence and understanding dawning in his eyes. Was she going to confess to him what he knew so well already? If he could only force her to say it on his breast. But she held him at arm's length. "'You remember, you remember Mr. Langham?' "'Remember him?' echoed Mr. Flaxman fervently. That thought-reading night at Lady Charlotte's, on the way home, he, he spoke to me. I said I loved him. I did love him. I let him kiss me." Her flush had quite faded. He could hardly tell whether she was yielding or defiant as the words burst from her. An expression, half trouble, half compunction, came into his face. "'I knew,' he said very low, or rather, I guessed and for an instant it occurred to him to unburden himself, to ask her pardon for that espionage of his. But no, no, not till he had her safe. I guessed, I mean, that there had been something grave between you. I saw you were sad. I would have given the world to comfort you. Her lip quivered childishly. I said I loved him that night. The next morning he wrote to me that it could never be. He looked at her a moment, embarrassed. The conversation was not easy. Then the smile broke once more. "'And you have forgotten him as he deserved. If I were not sure of that, I could wish him all the tortures of the inferno. As it is, I cannot think of him. I cannot let you think of him. Sweet, do you know that ever since I first saw you, the one thought of my days, the dream of my nights, the purpose of my whole life, has been to win you? There was another in the field. I knew it. I stood by and waited. He failed you. I knew he must in some form or other. Then I was hasty, and you resented it. Little tyrant, you made yourself a rose with many thorns. But tell me, tell me it is all over, your pain, my waiting. Make yourself sweet to me. Unfold to me at last. An instant she wavered. His bliss was almost in his grasp. Then she sprang up, and Flaxman found himself standing by her, rebuffed and surprised. "'No, no!' she cried, holding out her hands to him, though, all the time. "'Oh, it is too soon. I should despise myself. I do despise myself. It tortures me that I can change and forget so easily. It ought to torture you. Oh, don't ask me yet to—' "'To be my wife,' he said calmly, his cheek a little flushed, his eye meeting hers with a passion in it that strove so hard for self-control. It was almost sternness. "'Not yet,' she pleaded, and then after a moment's hesitation she broke into the most appealing smiles, though the tears were in her eyes, hurrying out the broken, beseeching words. "'I want a friend so much, a, a real friend. Since Catherine left I have had no one. I have been running riot. Take me in hand. Write to me. Scold me. Advise me. I will be your pupil. I will tell you everything. You seem to be so fearfully wise, so much older, so... Don't be vexed. And, and in, in six months?' She turned away, rosy as her name. He held her still so rigidly that her hands were almost hurt. 
The shadow of the hat fell over her eyes. The delicate outlines of the neck and shoulders in the pretty pale dress were defined against the green hill background. He studied her deliberately, a hundred different expressions sweeping across his face. A debate of the most feverish interest was going on within him. Her seriousness at the moment, the chances of the future, her character, his own, all these knotty points entered into it had to be weighed and decided with lightning rapidity. But Hugh Flaxman was born under a lucky star, and the natal charm held good. At last he gave a long breath. He stooped and kissed her hands. So be it. For six months I will be your guardian, your friend, your teasing, implacable censor. At the end of that time I will be... well, never mind what. I, I give you fair warning. He released her. Rose clasped her hands before her and stood, drooping. Now that she had gained her point, all her bright, mocking independence seemed to have vanished. She might have been in reality the tremulous, timid child she seemed. His spirits rose. He began to like the role she had assigned to him. The touch of unexpectedness in all she said and did acted with exhilarating force on his fastidious, romantic sense. "'Now then,' he said, picking up her gloves from the grass, You've given me my rights. I will begin to exercise them at once. I must take you home. The clouds are coming up again, and on the way you will kindly give me a full, true, and minute account of those two months while you have been so dangerously left to your own devices. She hesitated, and began to speak with difficulty, her eyes on the ground. But by the time they were in the main Shamor path again, and she was not so weakly dependent on his physical aid, her spirits too returned. Pacing along with her hands behind her, she began by degrees to throw into her accounts of her various visits and performances plenty of her natural malice. And after a bit, as that strange storm of feeling which had assailed her on the mountain top abated something of its bewildering force, certain old grievances began to raise very lively heads in her. The smart of Lady Fauntleroy's ball was still there. She had not yet forgiven him all those relations and the teasing image of Lady Florence woke up in her. "'It seems to me,' he said at last, dryly, as he opened a gate for her not far from Burwood, "'that you've been making yourself agreeable to a vast number of people. In my new capacity of censor, I should like to warn you that there is nothing so bad for the character as universal popularity.' "'I've not got a thousand and one important cousins,' she explained, her lip curling. "'If I want to please, I must take pains, else nobody minds me.' He looked at her attentively, his handsome face aglow with animation. "'What can you mean by that?' he said slowly. But she was quite silent, her head well in air. "'Cousins?' he repeated. "'Cousins? And clearly meant as a taunt at me. Now when did you see my cousins? I grant that I possess a monstrous and indefensible number. I have it. You think that at Lady Fauntleroy's ball I devoted myself too much to my family and too little to—' "'Not at all!' cried Rose hastily, adding with charming incoherence while she twisted a sprig of honeysuckle in her restless fingers. "'Some cousins, of course, are pretty.' He paused an instant. Then a light broke over his face, and his burst of quiet laughter was infinitely pleasant to hear. Rose got redder and redder. She realised dimly that she was hardly maintaining the spirit of their contract, and that he was studying her with eyes inconveniently bright and penetrating. "'Shall I quote to you,' he said, a sentence of Stern's? "'If you violate our contract, I must plead extenuating circumstances. Stern is admonishing a young friend as to his manners in society. "'You are in love,' he says. "'Tomio. But do not imagine that the fact bestows on you a license to behave like a bear towards all the rest of the world. Affection may surely conduct thee through an avenue of women to her who possesses thy heart, without tearing the flounces of any of their petticoats. Not even those of little cousins of seventeen. I say this, you'll observe, in the capacity you've assigned me. In another capacity I venture to think I could justify myself still better. "'My guardian and director,' cried Rose, "'must not begin his functions by misleading and sophistical quotations from the classics.' He did not answer for a moment. They were at the gate of Burwood, under a thick screen of wild cherry-trees. The gate was half open, and his hand was on it. 
"'And my pupil,' he said, bending to her, "'must not begin by challenging the prisoner whose hands she has bound, "'or he will not answer for the consequences.' His words were threatening, but his voice, his fine expressive face, were infinitely sweet. By a kind of fascination she never afterwards understood, Rose, for answer, startled him and herself. She bent her head, she laid her lips on the hand which held the gate, and then she was through it in an instant. He followed her in vain, he never overtook her again till at the drawing-room door she paused with amazing dignity. Mamma, she said, throwing it open, here is Mr. Flaxman. He has come from Norway and is on his way to Oswater. I'll go and speak to Margaret about tea. End of Book 7 Chapter 47book 7 chapter 48 of robert elsmere by mary augusta ward this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers book 7 chapter 48 after the little incident recorded at the end of the preceding chapter few flaxmen may be forgiven if as he walked home along the valley that night towards the farmhouse where he had established himself he entertained a very comfortable scepticism as to the permanence of that curious contract into which Rose had just forced him. However, he was quite mistaken. Rose's maiden dignity avenged itself abundantly on Hugh Flaxman for the injuries it had received at the hands of Langham. The restraints, the anomalies, the hair-splittings of the situation delighted her ingenuous youth. "'I am free. He is free. We will be friends for six months.' Possibly we may not suit one another at all. If we do, then... In the thrill of that then lay, of course, the whole attraction of the position. So that next morning Hugh Flaxman saw the comedy was to be scrupulously kept up. It required a tolerably strong masculine certainty at the bottom of him to enable him to resign himself once more to his part. But he achieved it, and being himself a modern of the moderns, a lover of half-shades and refinements of all sorts, he began very soon to enjoy it, and to play it with an increasing cleverness and perfection. How Rose got through Agnes's cross-questioning on the matter, history saith not. Of one thing, however, a conscientious historian may be sure, namely that Agnes succeeded in knowing as much as she wanted to know. Mrs. Laban was a little puzzled by the erratic lines of Mr. Flaxman's journeys. It was, as she said, curious that a man should start on a tour through the lakes from Long Windale. But she took everything naively as it came, and as she was told. Nothing with her ever passed through any changing crucible of thought. It required no planning to elude her. Her mind was like a stretch of wet sand, on which all impressions are equally easy to make and equally fugitive. He liked them all, she supposed, in spite of the comparative scantiness of his later visits to Lerwick Gardens, or he would not have come out of his way to see them. But as nobody suggested anything else to her, her mind worked no further, and she was as easily beguiled after his appearance as before it by the intricacies of some new knitting. Things, of course, might have been different if Mrs. Thornburg had interfered again. But as we know, poor Catherine's sorrows had raised a whole odd host of misgivings in the mind of the vicar's wife. She prowled nervously round Mrs. Laban, filled with contempt for her placidity, but she did not attack her. She spent herself, indeed, on Rose and Agnes, but long practice had made them adepts in the art of baffling her. And when Mr. Flaxman went to tea at the vicarage in their company, in spite of an absorbing desire to get at the truth which caused her to forget a new cap and let fall a plate of tea-cakes, she was obliged to confess crossly to the vicar afterwards that no one could tell what a man like that was after. She supposed his manners were very aristocratic, but for her part she liked plain people. On the last morning of Mr. Flaxman's stay in the valley, he entered the Burwood Drive about eleven o'clock, and Rose came down the steps to meet him. For a moment he flattered himself that her disturbed looks were due to the nearness of their farewells. "'There's something wrong,' he said, softly detaining her hand a moment. So much, at least, was in his right. "'Robert is ill. There's been an accident at Petit Dal. He's been in bed for a week. They hope to get home in a few days. Catherine writes bravely, but she's evidently very low.' Hugh Flaxman's face fell. Certain letters he had received from Ellesmere in July had lain heavy on his mind ever since. 
so pitiful was the half-conscious revelation in them of an incessant physical struggle. An accident! Elsbeth was in no state for accidents. What miserable ill luck! Rose read in Catherine's account. It appeared that on a certain stormy day a swimmer had been observed in difficulties among the rocks skirting the northern side of the Petit Dal Bay. The old bagneur of the place, owner of the still primitive Etablissement des Bains, without stopping to strip or even to take off his heavy boots, went out to the man in danger with a plank. The man took the plank and was safe. Then to the people watching it became evident that the bagneur himself was in peril. He became unaccountably feeble in the water, and the cry rose that he was sinking. Robert, who happened to be bathing near, ran off to the spot, jumped in, and swam out. By this time the old man had drifted some way. Robert succeeded, however, in bringing him in, and then, amid an excited crowd, headed by the Bagneur's wailing family, they carried the unconscious form onto the higher beach. Ellesmere was certain life was not extinct, and sent off for a doctor. Meanwhile, no one seemed to have any common sense, or any knowledge of how to proceed, but himself. For two hours he stayed on the beach, in his dripping bathing clothes, a cold wind blowing, trying every device known to him, rubbing, hot bottles, artificial respiration. In vain. The man was too old and too bloodless. Directly after the doctor arrived, he breathed his last, amid the wild and passionate grief of wife and children. Robert, with a cloak flung about him, still stayed to talk to the doctor, to carry one of the bagneur's sobbing grandchildren to its mother in the village. Then at last Catherine got hold of him, and he submitted to be taken home, shivering and deeply depressed by the failure of his efforts. A violent gastric and lung chill declared itself almost immediately, and for three days he had been anxiously ill. Catherine, miserable, distrusting the local doctor, and not knowing how to get hold of a better one, had never left him night or day. "'I had not the heart to write even to you,' she wrote to her mother. "'I could think of nothing but trying one thing after another. "'Now he has been in bed eight days, and is much better. "'He talks of getting up to-morrow, and declares he must go home next week. "'I have tried to persuade him to stay here another fortnight, "'but the thought of his work distresses him so much that I hardly dare urge it. "'I cannot say how I dread the journey. "'He is not fit for it anyway.' "'Rose folded up the letter.' her face softened to a most womanly gravity. Hugh Flaxman paused a moment outside the door, his hands on his side, considering. "'I shall not go on to Scotland,' he said. "'Mrs. Ellesmere must not be left. I will go off there at once.' In Rose's soberly sweet looks as he left her, Hugh Flaxman saw for an instant, with the stirring of a joy as profound as it was delicate, not the fanciful enchantress of the day before, but his wife that was to be and yet she held him to his bargain. All that his lips touched as he said good-bye was the little bunch of yellow briar roses she gave him from her belt. Thirty hours later he was descending the long hill from Sassetor to Petit Dow. It was the first of September. A chilly west wind blew up the dust before him and stirred the parched leafage of the valley. He knocked at the door, of which the woodwork was all peeled and blistered by the sun. Catherine herself opened it. "'This is kind, this is like yourself,' she said, after a first stare of amazement when he had explained himself. "'He's in there, much better.' Robert looked up, stupefied, as Hugh Flaxman entered. But he sprang up with his old brightness. "'Well, this is friendship. What on earth brings you here, old fellow? Why aren't you in the stubble celebrating St. Partridge?' Hugh Flaxman said what he had to say very shortly but so as to make Robert's eyes gleam, and to bring his thin hand with a sort of caressing touch upon Flaxman's shoulder. "'I shan't try to thank you. Catherine can, if she likes. How relieved she would be about that bothering journey of ours. However, I am rarely ever so much better. It was very sharp while it lasted, and the doctor no great shakes. But there never was such a woman as my wife. She pulled me through. And now then, sir, just confess yourself a little more plainly. What brought you and my sister-in-law together?' You not try and persuade me that Long Window is a natural gate of the lakes, or the route intended by heaven from London to Scotland, though I have no doubt you tried that little fiction on them. Hugh Flaxman laughed, and sat down very deliberately. I am glad to see that illness has not robbed you of that perspicacity of which you are so remarkable, Elsmere. Well, 
on the day before yesterday I asked your sister Rose to marry me. She, go on, man, cried Robert, exasperated by his pause. I don't know how to put it, said Flaxman calmly. For six months we are to be rather more than friends and a good deal less than fiancés. I am to be allowed to write to her. You may imagine how seductive it is to be one of the worst and laziest letter-writers in the three kingdoms that his fortunes in love should be made to depend on his correspondence. I may scold her, if she gives me occasion, and in six months, as one says to a publisher, the agreement will be open to revision. Robert stared. "'And you are not engaged?' "'Not as I understand it,' replied Flaxman. Oh, "'Decidedly not,' he added with energy, remembering that very platonic farewell. Robert sat with his hands on his knees, ruminating. "'Fantastic thing, the modern young woman. It's what I think I can understand. There may have been more than mere caprice in it.' His eye met his friend's significantly. "'I suppose so,' said Robert quietly. Not even for Robert's benefit was he going to reveal any details of that scene on High Fell. "'Never mind, old fellow. I am content. And indeed, Fodemio, I should be content with anything that brought me nearer to her, were it but by the thousands of an inch.' Robert grasped his hand affectionately. "'Catherine,' he called through the door, "'never mind the supper. Let it burn. Flaxman brings news.' Catherine listened to the story with amazement. Certainly her ways would never have been as her sister's. "'Are we supposed to know?' she asked, very naturally. "'She never forbade me to tell,' said Flaxman, smiling. "'I think, however, if I were you, I should say nothing about it yet. I told her it was part of our bargain that she should explain my letters to Mrs. Laban. I gave her free leave to invent any fairy tale she pleased, but it was to be her invention, not mine.' Neither Robert nor Catherine were very well pleased, but there was something reassuring, as well as comic, in the stoicism with which Flaxman took his position. And clearly the matter must be left to manage itself. Next morning the weather had improved. Robert, his hand on Flaxman's arm, got down to the beach. Flaxman watched him critically, did not like some of his symptoms, but thought on the whole he must be recovering at the normal rate, considering how severe the attack had been. "'What do you think of him?' Catherine asked him next day, with all her soul in her eyes. They had left Robert established in a sunny nook, and were strolling on along the sands. "'I think you must get him home, call in a first-rate doctor, and keep him quiet,' said Flaxman. "'He will be all right presently.' "'How can we keep him quiet?' said Catherine, with a momentary despair in her fine, pale face. "'All day long and all night long he is thinking of his work.' It is like something fiery burning the heart out of him. Flaxman felt the truth of the remark during the four days of calm autumn weather he spent with them before the return journey. Robert would talk to him for hours, not on the sands, with the grey infinity of sea before them, now pacing the bounds of their little room till fatigue made him drop heavily into his long chair, and the burden of it all was the religious future of the working class. He described the scene in the club, and brought out the dreams swarming in his mind, presenting them for Flaxman's criticism, and dealing with them himself, with that startling mixture of acute common sense and eloquent passion which had always made him so effective as an initiator. Flaxman listened dubiously at first, as he generally listened to Ellesmere, and then was carried away not by the beliefs, but by the man. He found his pleasure in dallying with the magnificent possibility of the church, Doubt with him applied to all propositions, whether positive or negative. And he had the dislike of the aristocrat and the cosmopolitan for the privilegialisms of religious dissent. Political dissent, or social reform, was another matter. Since the revolution, every generous child of the century had been open to the fascination of political or social utopias. But religion? What? What is truth? Why not let the old things alone? However, it was through the social passion, once so real in him and still living, in spite of disillusion and self-mockery, that Robert caught him, had in fact been slowly gaining possession of him all these months. "'Well,' said Flaxman one day, "'suppose I grant you that Christianity of the old sort shows strong signs of exhaustion, even in England, and in spite of the church expansion we hear so much about. And suppose 
I believe with you that things will go badly without religion. What then? Who can have a religion for the asking? But who can have it without? Seek that ye may find. Experiment. Try new combinations. If a thing is going that humanity can't do without, and you and I believe it, what duty is more urgent for us than the effort to replace it? Flaxman shrugged his shoulders. What would you gain? A new sect? Possibly, but what we stand to gain is a new social bond, was the flashing answer. A new compelling force in man and in society. Can you deny that the world wants it? What are your economists and sociologists of the new type always pining for? Why, for that diminution of the self in man which is to enable the individual to see the world's ends clearly, and to care not only for his own, but for his neighbour's interest, which is to make the rich devote themselves to the poor, and the poor bear with the rich? If man only would, he could, you say, solve all the problems which oppress him. It is man's will which is eternally defective, eternally inadequate, well, the great religions of the world are the stimulants by which the power at the root of things has worked upon this sluggish instrument of human destiny. Without religion you cannot make the will equal to its tasks. Our present religion fails us. We must, we will, have another. He rose and began to pace along the sands, now gently glowing in the warm September evening, Flaxman beside him. A new religion! Of all words, the most tremendous. Flaxman pitifully weighed against it the fraction of force fretting and surging in the thin, elastic frame beside him. He knew well, however, few better, that the outburst was not a mere dream and emptiness. There was experience behind it, a burning, driving experience of actual fact. Presently, Robert said, with a change of tone, I must have that whole block of warehouses, Flaxman. "'Must you?' said Flaxman, relieved by the drop from speculation to the practical. "'Why?' "'Look here.' And sitting down again on a sand-hill, overgrown with wild grasses and mats of sea-thistle, the poor, pale reformer began to draw out the details of his scheme on its material side. Three floors of rooms brightly furnished, well-dit, and warmed. A large hall for the Sunday lectures, concerts, entertainments, and storytelling. Rooms for the boys' club— Two rooms for women and girls, reached by a separate entrance. A library and reading room open to both sexes, well stored with books, and made beautiful by pictures. Three or four smaller rooms to serve as committee rooms, and for the purposes of the Naturalist Club, which had been started in May on the Muirwall plan. And, if possible, a gymnasium. Money, he said, drawing up with a laugh in mid-career. <laughs> There's the rub, of course. But I shall manage it. The judge from the past. Flaxman thought it extremely likely that he would. He studied the cabalistic lines Ellesmere's stick had made in the sand for a minute or two. Then he said dryly, I will take the first expense, and draw me afterwards up to five hundred a year for the first four years. Robert turned upon him and grasped his hand. I do not thank you, he said quietly, after a moment's pause. The work itself will do that. Again they strolled on, talking, plunging into details, till Flaxman's pulse beat as fast as Robert's. So full of infectious hope and energy was the whole being of the man before him. "'I can take in the women and girls now,' Robert said once. "'Catherine has promised to, to superintend it all.' Then suddenly something struck the mobile mind, and he stood an instant looking at his companion. It was the first time he had mentioned Catherine's name in connection with the North R. work. Flaxman could not mistake the emotion, the unspoken thanks in those eyes. He turned away, nervously knocking the ashes off his cigar. But the two men understood each other. End of Book 7, Chapter 48Book Seven, Chapter Forty Nine of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Seven, Chapter Forty Nine. Two days later they were in London again. Robert was a great deal better and beginning to kick against invalid restraints. All men have their pet irrationalities. 
Ellesmere's irrationality was an aversion to doctors from the point of view of his own ailments. He had an unbounded admiration for them as a class, and would have nothing to say to them as individuals that he could possibly help. Flaxman was sarcastic. Catherine looked imploring in vain. He vowed that he was treating himself with a skill any professional might envy, and went his way. And for a time the stimulus of London and of his work seemed to act favourably upon him. After his first welcome at the club, he came home with bright eye and vigorous step, declaring that he was another man. Flaxman established himself in St. James's Place. Town was deserted. The partridges at Greenlaws clamoured to be shot. The headkeeper wrote letters which would have melted the heart of a stone. Flaxman replied recklessly that any decent fellow in the neighbourhood was welcome to shoot his birds, a reply which almost brought upon him the resignation of the outraged keeper by return of post. Lady Charlotte wrote and remonstrated with him for neglecting a landowner's duties, inquiring at the same time what he meant to do with regard to that young lady. To which Flaxman replied calmly that he had just come back from the lakes, where he had done not indeed all that he meant to do, but still something. Miss Laban and he were not engaged, but he was on probation for six months, and found London the best place for getting through it. "'So far,' he said, "'I am getting on well, and developing an amount of energy, especially in the matter of correspondence, which alone ought to commend the arrangement to the relations of an idle man. But we must be left to dream our dream unto ourselves alone. One word from anybody belonging to me, to anybody belonging to her on the subject, and—' "'But threats are puerile. For the present, dear aunt, I am your devoted nephew, Hugh Flaxman.' "'On probation.' Flaxman chuckled as he sent off the letter. He stayed because he was too restless to be anywhere else, and because he loved the Ellesmere's for Rose's sake and his own. He thought, moreover, that a cool-headed friend with an eye for something else in the world than religious reform might just be useful then to Ellesmere, and he was determined at the same time to see what the reformer meant to be at. In the first place, Robert's attention was directed to getting possession of the whole block of buildings in which the existing school and lecture rooms took up only the lowest floor. This was a matter of some difficulty, for the floors above were employed in warehousing goods belonging to various minor import trades, and were held on tenures of different lengths. However, by dint of some money and much skill, the requisite clearances were effected during September and part of October. By the end of that month, all but the top floor, the tenant of which refused to be dislodged, fell into Ellesmere's hands. Meanwhile, at a meeting held every Sunday after lecture, a meeting composed mainly of artisans of the district, but including also Robert's helpers from the West, and a small sprinkling of persons interested in the man and his works from all parts, the details of the new Brotherhood of Christ was being hammered out. Catherine was generally present, sitting a little apart, with a look which Flaxman, who now knew her well, was always trying to decipher afresh, a sort of sweet aloofness, as though the spirit behind it saw, down the vistas of the future, ends and solutions which gave it courage to endure the present. Murray Edwards, too, was always there. It often struck Flaxman afterwards that in Robert's attitude towards Edwards at this time, in his constant desire to bring him forward, to associate him with himself as much as possible in the government and formation of the infant society, there was a half-conscious presence of a truth that as yet none knew, not even the tender wife, the watchful friend. The meetings were of extraordinary interest. The men, the great majority of whom had been disciplined and moulded for months by contact with Ellesmere's teaching and Ellesmere's thought, showed a responsiveness, a receptivity, even a power of initiation, which often struck Flaxman with wonder. Were these the men he'd seen in the club hall on the night of Robert's address, sour, stolid, brutalised, hostile to all things in heaven and earth? And we go on prating that the age of saints is over, the role of the individual lessening day by day? Fool! Go and be a saint! Go and give yourself to ideas! Go and live the life hid with Christ in God, and see! So would run the quick comment of the observer. But incessant as was the reciprocity, the interchange and play of feeling between Robert and the wide following growing up around him, it was plain to Flaxman that although he never moved a step without carrying his world with him, he was never at the mercy of his world. Nothing was ever really left to chance. Through all these strange debates, which began rawly and clumsily enough, and grew every week more and more absorbing to all concerned, 
Flaxman was convinced that hardly any rule or formula of the new society was ultimately adopted which had not been for long in Robert's mind, thought out and brought into final shape, perhaps, on the petty Dow Sands. It was an unobtrusive art, his art of government, but a most effective one. At any moment, as Flaxman often felt, at any rate in the early meetings, the discussions as to the religious practices which were to bind together the new association might have passed the line and become puerile or grotesque. At any moment, the jarring characters and ambitions of the men Ellesmere had to deal with might have dispersed to that delicate atmosphere of moral sympathy and passion in which the whole new birth seemed to have been conceived, and upon the maintenance of which its fruition and development depended. But as soon as Ellesmere appeared, difficulties vanished, enthusiasm sprang up again. The rules of the new society came simply and naturally into being, steeped and haloed, as it were, from the beginning, in the passion and genius of one great heart. The fastidious critical instinct in Flaxman was silenced no less than the sour, half-educated analysis of such a man as Lestrange. In the same way, all personal jars seemed to melt away beside him. There were some painful things connected with the new departure. Wardlaw, for instance, a conscientious comptist, refusing stoutly to admit anything more than an unknowable reality behind phenomena, was distressed and affronted by the strongly religious bent Ellesmere was giving to the work he had begun. Lestrange, who was a man of great though raw ability, who almost always spoke at the meetings, and whom Robert was bent on attaching to the society, had times when the things he was half inclined to worship one day, he was much more inclined to burn the next, in the sight of all men, and when the smallest failure of temper on Robert's part might have entailed a disagreeable scene, and the possible formation of a harassing left wing. But Robert's manner to Wardlaw was that of a grateful younger brother. It was clear that the Comtist could not formally join the Brotherhood, but all the share and influence that could be secured him in the practical working of it was secured him. And what was more, Robert succeeded in infusing his own delicacy, his own compunctions on the subject, into the men and youths who had profited in the past by Wardlaw's rough self-devotion. So that if, through much that went on now, he could only be a spectator, at least he was not allowed to feel himself an alien or forgotten. As to Lestrange, against a man who was as ready to laugh as to preach, and into whose ardent soul nature had infused a saving sense of the whimsical in life and character, cynicism and vanity seemed to have no case. Robert's quick temper had been wonderfully disciplined by life since his Oxford days. He had now very little of that stiff nakedness so fatal to the average reformer, which makes a man insist on all or nothing from his followers. He took what each man had to give. Nay, he made it almost seem as though the grudging support of Lestrange, or the critical half-patronising approval of the young barrister from the West, who came down to listen to him and made a favour of teaching in his night school, were as precious to him as was the whole-hearted, the self-abandoning veneration, which the majority of those about him had begun to show towards the man in whom, as Charles Richards said, they had seen God. At last, by the middle of November, the whole great building, with the exception of the top floor, was cleared and ready for use. Robert felt the same joy in it, in its clean paint, the half-filled shelves of the library, the pictures standing against the walls ready to be hung, the rolls of bright-coloured matting ready to be laid down, as he had felt in the Muirwell Institute. He and Flaxman, helped by a voluntary army of men, worked at it from morning till night. Only Catherine could ever persuade him to remember that he was not yet physically himself. Then came the day when the building was formally opened, when the gilt letters over the door, the new Brotherhood of Christ, shone out into the dingy street, and when the first enrolment of names in the Book of the Brotherhood took place. For two hours a continuous stream of human beings surrounded the little table besides which Ellesmere stood, inscribing their names, and receiving from him the silver badge bearing the head of Christ, which was to be the outward and conspicuous sign of membership. Men came of all sorts, the intelligent, well-paid artisan, the padded clerk or small accountant, stalwart warehousemen, huge carters and draymen, the boys attached to each by the laws of the profession, often straggling lumpishly behind his master. Women were there, wives who came because their lords came, or because Mr. Ellesmere had been that good to them that anything they could do to oblige him 
they would and welcome. Prim pupil teachers holding themselves with straight superior shoulders. Children who came trooping in, grinned up into Robert's face and retreated again with red cheeks, the silver badge tight clasped in hands which not even much scrubbing could make passable. Flaxman stood and watched it from the side. It was an extraordinary scene. The crowd, the slight figure on the platform, the two great inscriptions represented the only articles of the new faith gleaming from the freshly coloured walls. In thee, O Eternal, have I put my trust. This do in remembrance of me. The recesses on either side of the hall, lined with white marble, and destined, the one to hold the names of the living members of the Brotherhood, the other to commemorate those who had passed away, empty this last, save for the one poor name of Charles Richards. The copy of Giotto's Pergium and Virtues, Faith, Fortitude, Charity, and the like, which broke the long wall at intervals. The cynic and the onlooker tried to assert itself against the feeling with which Gere seemed overcharged. In vain. Whatever comes of it, Flaxman said to himself with strong involuntary conviction, whether he fails or no, the spirit that is moving here is the same spirit that spread the church, the spirit that sent out Benedictine and Franciscan into the world, that fired the children of Luther, or Calvin, or George Fox, the spirit of devotion through a man to an idea, through one much-loved, much-trusted soul to some eternal verity, newly caught, newly conceived behind it. There's no approaching the idea for the masses except through the human life. There's no lasting power for the man except as the slave of the idea. A week later he wrote to his aunt as follows. He could not write to her of Rose, he did not care to write of himself, and he knew that Ellesmere's club address had left a mark even on her restless and overcrowded mind. Moreover, he himself was absorbed. We are in the full stream of religion-making. I watch it with a fascination you at a distance cannot possibly understand, even where my judgment demurs and my intelligence protests that the thing cannot live without Ellesmere, and that Ellesmere's life is a frail one. After the ceremony of enrolment which I described to you yesterday, the council of the new brotherhood was chosen by popular election, and Ellesmere gave an address. Two-thirds of the council, I should think, are working men, the rest of the upper class. Ellesmere, of course, president. Since then the first religious service under the new constitution has been held. The service is extremely simple, and the basis of the whole is new bottles for the new wine. The opening prayer is cited by everybody's present standing. It is rather an act of adoration and faith than a prayer, properly so called. It represents, in fact, the placing of the soul in the presence of God. The mortal turns to the eternal, the ignorant and imperfect looked away from themselves to the knowledge and perfection of the all-holy. It is Ellesmere's drawing up, I imagine. At any rate, it is essentially modern, expressing the modern spirit, answering to modern need, as I imagine the first Christian prayers expressed the spirit and answer to the need of an earlier day. Then follows some passage from the life of Christ. Ellesmere reads it and expounds it in the first place, as a lecturer might expound a passage of Tacitus, historically and critically. His explanation of miracle, his efforts to make his audience realise the germs of miraculous belief which each man carries with him in the constitution and inherited furniture of his mind, are some of the most ingenious, perhaps the most convincing, I have ever heard. My heart and my head have never been very much at one, as you know, on this matter of the marvellous element in religion. But then, when the critic has done, the poet and the believer begins. Whether he's got hold of the true Christ is another matter, but that the Christ he preaches moves the human heart as much as, and in the case of the London artisan more than, the current orthodox presentation of him, I begin to have ocular demonstration. I was present, for instance, at his children's Sunday class the other day. He brought them up to the story of the crucifixion, reading from the revised version, and amplifying wherever the sense required it. Suddenly a little girl laid her head on the desk before her, and with choking sobs implored him not to go on. The whole class seemed ready to do the same. The poor human pity of the story, the contrast between the innocence and the pain of the sufferer, seemed to be more than they could bear. And there was no comforting sense of a jugglery by which the suffering was not real after all, and the sufferer not man but God. 
He took one of them upon his knee and tried to console them. But there was something piercingly penetrating and austere, even in the consolations of this new faith. He did but remind the children of the burden of gratitude laid upon them. "'Would you let him suffer so much in vain? His suffering has made you and me happier and better to-day, at this moment, than he could have been without Jesus. He will understand how and why more clearly when you grow up. Let us in return keep him in our hearts always, and obey his words. It is all you can do for his sake, just as all you could do for a mother who died would be to follow her wishes and sacredly keep her memory.' Well, that was about the gist of it. It was a strange little scene, wonderfully suggestive and pathetic. But a few more words about the Sunday service. After the address came a hymn. There are only seven hymns in the little service book, gathered out of the finest we have. It is supposed that in a short time they will become so familiar to the members of the Brotherhood that they will be sung readily by heart. The singing of them in the public service alternates with an equal number of psalms and both psalms and hymns are meant to be recited or sung constantly in the homes of the members, and have become part of the everyday life of the Brotherhood. They have been most carefully chosen, and a sort of ritual importance has been attached to them from the beginning. Each day in the week has its particular hymn or psalm. Then the whole wound up with another short prayer, also repeated standing, a commendation of the individual, the Brotherhood, the nation, the world, to God. The phrases of it are terse and grand. One can see at once that it has laid hold of the popular sense, the popular memory. The Lord's Prayer followed. Then, after a silent pause of recollection, Ellesmere dismissed them. It gave him peace in the love of God and the memory of his servant, Jesus. I looked carefully at the men as they were tramping out. Some of them were among the secularist speakers you and I heard at the club in April. In my wonder, I thought of a saying of Vinay's. C'est pour la religion que le peuple a la plus de talent. C'est en religion qui montre le plus d'esprit. In a later letter he wrote, I have not yet described to you what is perhaps the most characteristic, the most binding practice of the new brotherhood. It is that which has raised most angry comment, cries of profanity, wanton insults, and what not. I came upon it yesterday in an interesting way. I was working with Elsmere at the arrangement of the library, which is now becoming a most fascinating place, under the management of a librarian chosen from the neighbourhood, when he asked me to go and take a message to a carpenter who has been giving us voluntary help in the evenings after his day's work. He thought that as it was the dinner hour, and the man worked in the dock close by, I might find him at home. I went off to the model lodging-house where I was told to look for him, mounted the common stairs, and knocked at his door. Nobody seemed to hear me, and as the door was ajar, I pushed it open. Inside was a curious sight. The table was spread for the midday meal. Round the table stood four children, the eldest about fourteen, and the youngest six or seven. At the other end of it stood the carpenter himself in his working apron, a brawny Saxon, bowed a little by his trade. Before him was a plate of bread, and his horny hands were resting on it. The street was noisy, they had not heard my knock, and as I pushed open the door there was an old coat hanging over the corner of it which concealed me. Something in the attitudes of all concerned reminded me, kept me where I was, silent. The farmer lifted his right hand. The master said, This do in remembrance of me. The children stooped for a moment in silence, then the youngest said slowly, in a little softened cockney voice that touched me extraordinarily, "'Jesus, we remember thee always.' It was the appointed response. As she spoke, I recollected the child perfectly at Ellesmere's class. I also remembered that she had no mother, that her mother had died of cancer in June, visited and comforted to the end by Ellesmere and his wife. Well, the great question, of course, remains. Is there a sufficient strength of feeling and conviction behind these things?' If so, after all, everything was new once, and Christianity was but modified Judaism. December the 22nd I believe I shall soon be as deep in this matter as Ellesmere. In Elgood Street, great preparations are going on for Christmas. But it will be a new sort of Christmas. We shall hear very little, it seems, of angels and shepherds. 
and a great deal of the humble childhood of a little Jewish boy whose genius grown to maturity transformed the Western world. To see Elsmere with his boys and girls about him, trying to make them feel themselves the heirs and fellows of the Nazarene child, to make them understand something of the lessons that child must have learnt, the sights he must have seen, and the thoughts that must have come to him, is a spectacle of which I will not miss more than I can help. Don't imagine, however, that I am converted exactly, but only that I am more interested and stimulated than I have been for years. And don't expect me for Christmas. I shall stay here. New Year's Day I am writing from the library of the New Brotherhood. The amount of activity, social, educational, religious, of which this great building promises to be the centre, is already astonishing. Everything, of course, including the constitution of the Infant Society, is as yet purely tentative and experimental. But for a scheme so young, things are falling into working order with wonderful rapidity. Each department is worked by committees under the Central Council. Ellesmere, of course, is ex officio chairman of a large proportion. Wardlaw, Mackay, I, and a few other fellows run the rest for the present. But each committee contains working men, and it is the object of everybody concerned to make the workman element more and more real and efficient. What with the tax on the members, which was fixed by a general meeting, and the contributions from outside, the society already commands a fair income. But Ellesmere is anxious not to attempt too much at once, and will go slowly and train his workers. Music, it seems, is to be the great feature in the future. I have my own projects as to this part of the business, which, however, I forbid you to guess at. By the rules of the Brotherhood, every member is bound to some work in connection with it during the year, but little or much as he or she is able. And every meeting, every undertaking of whatever kind, opens with the special word or formula of the Society. This do in remembrance of me. January the 6th. Besides the Sunday lectures, Ellesmere is pegging away on Saturday evenings at The History of the Moral Life in Man. It is a remarkable course, and very largely attended by people of all sorts. He tries to make it an exposition of the leading principles of the new movement, of that continuous and only revelation of God in life and nature, which is in reality the basis of his whole thought. By the way, the letters that are pouring in upon him from all parts are extraordinary. They have shown a mountain degree of interest in ideas of the kind, which are surprising to a lady of Sion like me. But he's not surprised, says he always expected it, that there are thousands who only want a rallying point. His personal effect, the love that is felt for him, the passion and energy of the nature, never has our generation seen anything to equal it. As you perceive, I am reduced to taking it all seriously, and don't know what to make of him or myself. She, poor soul, is now always with him, comes down with him day after day, and works away. She no more believes in his ideas, I think, than she ever did, but all her antagonism is gone. In the midst of the stir about him, her face often haunts me. It has changed lately. She is no longer a young woman, but so refined, so spiritual. But he is ailing and fragile. There is the one cloud on a scene that fills me with increasing wonder and reverence. End of Book 7, Chapter 49《Book Seven, Chapter Fifty of Robert Elsbeer by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book Seven, Chapter Fifty. One cold Sunday afternoon in January, Flaxman, descending the steps of the New Brotherhood, was overtaken by a young Dr. Edmondson, an able young physician, just set up for himself as a consultant, who had only lately attached himself to Elsmere and was now helping him with eagerness to organise a dispensary. Young Edmondson and Flaxman exchanged a few words on Ellesmere's lecture, and then the doctor said abruptly, "'I don't like his looks nor his voice. How long has he been hoarse like that?' "'More or less for the last month. He's very much worried by it himself, and talks of clergyman's throat. He had a touch of it, it appears, once in the country.' "'Clergyman's throat?' Edmondson shook his head dubiously. "'It may be.' I wish he would let me overhaul him. I wish he would, 
said Flaxman devoutly. "'I will see what I can do. I will get hold of Mrs. Ellesmere.' Meanwhile Robert and Catherine had driven home together. As they entered the study she caught his hands, a suppressed and exquisite passion gleaming in her face. "'You did not explain him. You never will.' He stood, held by her, his gaze meeting hers. Then in an instant his face changed, blanched before her. He seemed to gasp for breath. She was only just able to save him from falling. It was apparently another swoon of exhaustion. As she knelt beside him on the floor, having done for him all she could, watching his return to consciousness, Catherine's look would have terrified any of those who loved her. There are some natures which are never blind, never taken blissfully unawares, and which taste calamity and grief to the very dregs. "'Robert, to-morrow you will see a doctor?' she implored him, when at last he was safely in bed, white but smiling. He nodded. "'Send for Edmondson. What am I most is this hoarseness,' he said in a voice that was little more than a tremulous whisper. Catherine hardly closed her eyes all night. The room, the house, seemed to her stifling, oppressive, like a grave. And by ill luck with the morning came a long-expected letter, not indeed from the squire, but about the squire. Robert had been for some time expecting a summons to Muirwell. The squire had written to him last, in October, from Clarence on the Lake of Geneva. Since then weeks had passed without bringing Ellesmere any news of him at all. Meanwhile the growth of the new brotherhood had absorbed its founder, so that the inquiries which should have been sent to Muirwell had been postponed. The letter which reached him now was from old Merrick. The squire has had another bad attack, and is much weaker. But his mind is clear again, and he greatly desires to see you. If you can, come to-morrow. His mind is clear again. Horrified by the words and by the images they called up, remorseful also for his own long silence, Robert sprang up from bed, where the letter had been brought to him, and presently appeared downstairs, where Catherine, believing him safely captive for the morning, was going through some household business. "'I must go! I must go!' he said as he handed her the letter. "'Merrick puts it cautiously, but it may be the end.' Catherine looked at him in despair. "'Robert, you are like a ghost yourself, and I have sent for Dr. Edmondson.' "'Put him off till the day after to-morrow. Dear little wife, listen. My voice is ever so much better. Muirwell air will do me good.' She turned away to hide the tears in her eyes. Then she tried fresh persuasions, but it was useless. His look was glowing and restless. She saw he felt it a call impossible to disobey. A telegram was sent to Edmondson, and Robert drove off to Waterloo. Out of the fog of London it was a mild, sunny winter's day. Robert breathed more freely with every mile. His eyes took note of every landmark in the familiar journey with a thirsty eagerness. It was a year and a half since he had travelled it. He forgot his weakness, the exhausting pressure and publicity of his new work. The past possessed him, thrust out the present. Surely he had been up to London for the day and was going back to Catherine. At the station he hailed an old friend among the cabmen. "'Take me to the corner of the Mule Lane, Tom. Then you may drive on my bag to the hall, and I shall walk over the common.' The man urged on his tottering old steed with a will. In the streets of the little town Robert saw several acquaintances who stopped and stared at the apparition. Were the houses, the people, real, or was it all a hallucination? His flight and his return, so unthought of yesterday, so easy and swift to-day. By the time they were out on the wild ground between the market town and Muirwell, Robert's spirits were as buoyant as thistledown. He and the driver kept out of an incessant gossip over the neighbourhood, and he jumped down from the carriage as the man stopped with the alacrity of a boy. "'Go on, Tom. See if I am not there as soon as you.' "'Looks most uncommon bad,' the man muttered to himself as his horse shambled off. Seems a surprise a lark all the same. Why, the gorse was out, positively out in January, and the thrushes were singing as though it were March. Robert stopped opposite a bush covered with timid, half-opened blooms, and thought he'd seen nothing so beautiful since he'd last trodden that road in spring. Presently he was in the same cart-track he had crossed on the night of his confession to Catherine. He lingered beside the same solitary fir on the brink of the ridge. A winter world lay before him, soft brown woodland, or reddish heath and fern, 
struck sideways by the sun, clothing the earth's bareness everywhere, curling mists, blue points of distant hill, a grey, luminous depth of sky. The eyes were moist, the lips moved. There in the place of his old anguish he stood and blessed God, not for any personal happiness, but simply for that communication of himself which may make every hour of a common living a revelation. Twenty minutes later, leaving the park gate to his left, he hurried up the lane leading to the vicarage. One look, he might not be able to leave the squire later. The gate of the wood-path was ajar. Surely just inside it he should find Catherine in her garden hat, the white-frocked child dragging behind her. And there was the square stone house, the brown cornfield, the red-brown woods. Why, what had the man been doing with the study? White blinds showed it was a bedroom now. Vandal! Besides, how could the boys have free access except to that ground-floor room? And all that pretty stretch of grass under the acacia had been cut up into stiff little lozenge-shaped beds, filled, he supposed, in summer with the properest geraniums. He should never dare to tell that to Catherine. He stood and watched the little significant signs of change in this realm, which had been once his own, with a dissatisfied mouth, his undermind filled the while with tempestuous yearning and affection. In that upper room he had lain through that agonised night of crisis. The dawn twitterings of the summer birds seemed to be still in his ears. And there, in the distance, was the blue wreath of smoke hanging over Marl End. Ha! Huh, the new cottages must be warm this winter. The children did not lie in the wet any longer, thank God. Was there time just to run down to Irwin's cottage to have a look at the Institute? He had been standing on the farther side of the road from the rectory that he might not seem to be spying out the land and his successor's ways too closely. Suddenly he found himself clinging to a gate near him that led into a field. He was shaken by a horrible struggle for breath. The self seemed to be foundering in a stifling sea and fought like a drowning thing. When the moment passed, he looked round him, bewildered, drawing his hand across his eyes. The world had grown black. The sun seemed to be scarcely shining. Were those the sounds of children's voices on the hill, the rumbling of a cart, or was it all sight and sound alike, mirage and delirium? With difficulty, leaning on his stick as though he were a man of seventy, he groped his way back to the park. There he sank down, still gasping, among the roots of one of the great cedars near the gate. After a while the attack passed off, and he found himself able to walk on. But the joy, the leaping pulse of half an hour ago, were gone from his veins. Was that the river? The house? He looked at them with dull eyes. All the light was lowered. A veil seemed to lie between him and the familiar things. However, by the time he reached the door of the hall, Will and Nature had reasserted themselves, and he knew where he was and what he had to do. Vincent flung the door open with his old lordly air. "'Why, sir, Mr. Ellesmere!' The butler's voice began on a note of joyful surprise, sliding at once into one of alarm. He stood and stared at this ghost of the old rector. Ellesmere grasped his hand and asked him to take him into the dining-room and give him some wine before announcing him. Vincent ministered to him with a long face, pressing all the alcoholic resources of the hall upon him in turn. The squire was much better, he declared, and had been carried down to the library. But, Lord, oh, sir, there ain't much to be said for your looks, neither. Seems as if London didn't suit you, sir. Ellesmere explained feebly that he'd been suffering from his throat, and had overtired himself by walking over the common. Then, recognising from a distorted vision of himself in a Venetian mirror hanging by, that something of his natural colour had returned to him, he rose and bade Vincent announce him. "'And Mrs. Darcy?' he asked, as they stepped out into the hall again. "'Oh, Mrs. Darcy, sir, she's very well,' said the man, but as it seemed to Robert with something of an embarrassed air. He followed Vincent down the long passage, haunted by old memories, by the old sickening sense of mental anguish, to the curtained door. Vincent ushered him in. There was a stir of feet and a voice, but at first he saw nothing. The room was very much darkened. Then Merrick emerged into distinctness. 
The squire here is Mr. Ellesmere. Well, Mr. Ellesmere, sir, I'm sure we're very much obliged to you for meeting the squire's wishes so promptly. You'll find him poorly, Mr. Ellesmere, but mending. Oh, yes, mending, sir, no doubt of it. Ellesmere began to perceive a figure by the fire. A bony hand was advanced to him out of the gloom. That'll do, Merrick. You won't be wanted till the evening. The imperious note in the voice struck Robert with a sudden sense of relief. After all, the squire was still capable of trampling on Merrick. In another minute the door had closed on the old doctor, and the two men were alone. Robert was beginning to get used to the dim light. Out of it the squire's face gleamed almost as whitely as the tortured marble of the Medusa just above their heads. "'It's some inflammation in the eyes,' the squire explained briefly. "'That's made Merrick set up all this damned business of blinds and shutters. I don't mean to stand it much longer. The eyes are better, and I prefer to see my way out of the world, if possible.' "'But you are recovering?' Robert said, laying his hand affectionately on the old man's knee. "'I have added to my knowledge,' said the squire dryly. "'Like Hine, I am qualified to give lectures in heaven on the ignorance of doctors on earth. And I am not in bed, which I was last week. For heaven's sake, don't ask questions. If there is a loathsome subject on earth, it is the subject of the human body. Well, I suppose my message to you dragged you away from a thousand things you'd rather be doing. What are you so hoarse for? Neglecting yourself as usual, for the sake of the people, who wouldn't even subscribe to bury you? Have you been working up the Apocrypha, as I recommended you last time we met? Robert smiled. For the last four months, Squire, I've been doing two things with neither of which had you much sympathy in old days, holiday-making and slumming. Oh, I remember, interrupted the Squire hastily. I was low last week and read the church papers by way of a counter-irritant. You've been starting a new religion, I see. A new religion! Ha! The great head fell forward, and through the dusk Robert caught the sarcastic gleam of the eyes. You are harder the man to deny he said, undisturbed, that the old ones lis are desiri. Because there are old abuses, is there any reason why you should go and set up a brand new one, an ugly anachronism besides? retorted the squire. However, you and I have no common ground, never had. I say no, you say feel. Where is the difference, after all, between you and any charlatan of the lot? Well, how is Madame de Netfield? I have not seen her for six months. Robert replied with equal abruptness. The squire laughed a little under his breath. "'What did you think of her?' "'Very much what you told me to think, intellectually,' replied Robert, facing him, but flushing with the readiness of physical delicacy. "'Well, I certainly never told you to think anything morally,' said the squire. "'The word moral has no relation to her. Whom did you see there?' The catechism was naturally most distasteful to its object, but Ellesmere went through with it, the squire watching him for a while with an expression which had a spark of madness in it. It is not unlikely that some gossip of the Lady Aubrey's sort had reached him. Ellesmere had always seemed to him oppressively good. The idea that Madame de Netfield had tried her arts upon him was not without its piquancy. But while Robert was answering a question, he was aware of a subtle change in the squire's attitude, a relaxation of his own sense of tension. After a minute he bent forward, peering through the darkness. The squire's head had fallen back, his mouth was slightly open, and the breath came lightly, quiveringly through. The cynic of a moment ago had dropped suddenly into a sleep of more than childish weakness and defencelessness. Robert remained bending forward, gazing at the man who had once meant so much to him. Strange white face sunk in the great chair. Behind it glimmered the Donatello figure, and the divine Hermes, a glorious shape in the dusk, looking scorn on human decrepitude. All round spread the dim walls of books. The life they had nourished was dropping into the abyss out of ken. They remained. Sixty years of effort and slavery to end so, a river lost in the sands. Old Merrick stole in again and stood looking at the sleeping squire. Bad sign. "'Bad sign,' he said, and shook his head mournfully. After he made an effort to take some food which Vincent pressed upon him, Robert, conscious of a stronger physical malaise than had ever yet tormented him, was crossing the hall again, 
when he suddenly saw Mrs. Darcy at the door of a room which opened into the hall. He went up to her with a warm greeting. "'Are you going into the square? Let us go together.' She looked at him with no surprise, as though she had seen him the day before, and as he spoke she retreated a step into the room behind her, a curious film, so it seemed to him, darkening her small grey eyes. "'The squire is not here. He's gone away. Have you seen my white mice? Oh, they are such darlings. Only one of them is ill, and they won't let me have the doctor.' Her voice sank into the most pitiful plaintiveness. She stood in the middle of the room, pointing with an elfish finger to a large cage of white mice which stood in the window. The room seemed full beside of other creatures. Robert stood rooted, looking at the tiny withered figure in the black dress, its snowy hair and diminutive face swathed in lace, with a perplexity into which there slipped an involuntary shiver. Suddenly he became aware of a woman by the fire, a decent, strong-looking body in grey, who rose as his look turned to her. Their eyes met. Her expression, and the little jerk of her head towards Mrs. Darcy, who was now standing by the cage, coaxing the mice with the weirdest gestures, were enough. Robert turned and went out, sick at heart. The careful, exquisite beauty of the great hall struck him as something mocking and anti-human. No one else in the house said a word to him of Mrs. Darcy. In the evening the squire talked much at intervals, but in another key. He insisted on a certain amount of light, and, leaning on Robert's arm, went feebly round the bookshelves. He took out one of the volumes of the fathers that Newman had given him. "'When I think of the hours I wasted over this barbarous rubbish,' he said, his blanched fingers turning the leaves vindictively, "'and of the other hours I maundered away in services and self-examination.' Thank heaven, however, the germ of revolt and sanity was always there, and when once I got to it, I learnt my lesson pretty quick. Robert paused, his kind, inquiring eyes looking down on the shrunken squire. Oh, not one you had any chance of learning, my good friend, said the other, aggressively, and after all it's simple. Go to your grave with your eyes open, that's all. But men don't learn it somehow. Newman was incapable, so are you. All the religions are nothing but so many vulgar anaesthetics, which only the few have courage to refuse. "'Do you want me to contradict you?' said Robert, smiling. "'I am quite ready.' The squire took no notice. Presently, when he was in his chair again, he said abruptly, pointing to a mahogany bureau by the window, "'The book is all there, both parts, first and second. Publish it, if you please. If not, throw it into the fire.' both are equally indifferent to me. It's done its work. It has helped me through half a century of living. "'It shall be to me a sacred trust,' said Ellesmere, with emotion. "'Of course, if you don't publish it, I shall publish it.' "'As you please. Well, then, if you have nothing more rational to tell me about, tell me of this ridiculous brotherhood of yours.' Robert, Sir George, began to talk, but with difficulty. The words would not flow, and it was almost a relief when in the middle that strange, creeping sleep overtook the squire again. Merrick, who was staying in the house, and who had been coming in and out through the evening, eyeing Ellesmere, now that there was more like on the scene, with almost as much anxiety and misgiving as the squire, was summoned. The squire was put into his carrying chair. Vincent and a male attendant appeared, and he was borne to his room. Merrick peremptorily refusing to allow Robert to lend so much as a finger to the performance. They took him up the library stairs, through the empty book-rooms, and that dreary room which had been his father's, and so into his own. By the time they set him down he was quite awake and conscious again. "'It can't be said that I've followed my own precepts,' he said to Robert grimly, as they put him down. "'Not much of the open eye about this. I shall sleep myself into the unknown as sweetly as any saint in the calendar.' Robert was going when the squire called him back. "'You'll stay to-morrow, Ellesmere?' "'Of course, if you wish it.' The wrinkled eyes fixed him intently. "'Why did you ever go?' "'As I told you before, squire, because there was nothing else for an honest man to do.' The squire turned round with a frown. "'What the deuce are you dawdling about, Benson? Give me my stick and get me out of this.' By midnight all was still in the vast pile of Muirwell. A clear moon shone over the sloping reaches of the park. The trees shone silverly in the cold light, 
their black shadows cast along the grass. Robert found himself quartered in the steward room, where James the Second had slept, and where the tartan hangings of the ponderous carved bed and the rows and thistle reliefs of the walls and ceilings, untouched for two hundred years, bore witness to the loyal preparations made by some bygone Wendover. He was mortally tired, but by the way of distracting his thoughts a little from the squire, and that other tragedy which the great house sheltered somewhere in its walls, he took from his coat-pocket a French anthologie which had been Catherine's birthday gift to him, and read a little before he fell asleep. Then he slept profoundly, the sleep of exhaustion. Suddenly he found himself sitting up in bed, his heart beating to suffocation, strange noises in his ears. A cry, Help! resounded through the wide, empty galleries. He flung on his dressing-gown and ran out in the direction of the squire's room. The hideous cries and scuffling grew more apparent as he reached it. At that moment Benson, the man who had helped to carry the squire, ran up. "'My God, sir!' he said, deadly white. "'Another attack!' The squire's room was empty, but the door into the lumber-room adjoining it was open, and the stifled sounds came through it. They rushed in, and found Merrick struggling in the grip of a white figure that seemed to have the face of a fiend and the grip of a tiger. Those old bloodshot eyes, those wrinkled hands on the throat of the doctor, horrible! They released poor Berwick, who staggered bleeding into the squire's room. Then Robert and Benson got the squire back by main force. The whole face was convulsed, the poor shrunken limbs rigid as iron. Merrick, who was sitting gasping, by a superhuman effort of will, mastered himself enough to give directions for a strong opiate. Benson managed to control the madman while Robert found it. Then between them they got it swallowed. But nature had been too quick for them. Before the opiate could have had time to work, the squire shrank together like a puppet of which the threads had loosened, and fell heavily sideways out of his captor's hands on to the bed. They laid him there, tenderly covering him from the January cold. The swollen eyelids fell, leaving just a thread of white visible underneath. The clenched hands slowly relaxed. The loud breathing seemed to be the breathing of death. Merrick, whose wound on the head had been hastily bound up, threw himself beside the bed. The nightlight beyond cast a grotesque shadow of him on the wall, emphasising, as their mockery, the long straight back, the ragged whiskers, the strange ends and horns of the bandage. But the passion in the old face was as purely tragic as any that ever spoke through the lips of an Antigone or a Gloucester. The last! The last! he said, choked, the tears falling down his lined cheeks onto the squire's hand. He can never rally from this, and I was fool enough yesterday to think I had pulled him through. Again a long gaze of inarticulate grief. Then he looked up at Robert. He wouldn't have Benson to-night. I, I slept in the next room with the door ajar. A few minutes ago I heard him moving. I was up in an instant and found him standing by that door, peering through, barefooted, a wind like ice coming up. He looked at me, frowning, all in a flame. My father, he said, my father, he went that way. What do you want here? Keep back. I threw myself on him. He had something sharp which scratched me on the temple. I got that away from him, but it was his hands. And the old man shuddered. I thought they would have done for me before anyone could hear, and that then he would kill himself, as his father did. Again he hung over the figure on the bed, his own withered hand stroking that of the squire with a yearning affection. When was the last attack? asked Robert sadly. A month ago, sir, just after they got back. Ah, oh, Mr. Ellesmere, he suffered. And he's been so lonely. No one to cheer him, no one to please him with his food, to put his cushions right, to coax him up a bit, and that and his poor sister, too, always there before his eyes. Of course he would stand to it, he liked to be alone. But I never believe men are made so unlike one to the other. The Almighty meant a man to have a wife or a child about him when he comes to the last. He missed you, sir, when you went away. Not did he say a word, but he moped. His books didn't seem to please him, nor anything else. I've just broke my heart over him this last year." There was silence a moment in the big room, hung round with the shapes of bygone Wendovers. The opiate had taken effect. The squire's countenance was no longer convulsed. The great brow was calm, a more than common dignity and peace spoke from the long, peaked face. Robert bent over him. The madman, the cynic, had passed away. 
the dying scholar and thinker lay before him. "'Will he rally?' he asked under his breath. Merrick shook his head. "'I doubt it. It has exhausted all the strength he had left. The heart is failing rapidly. I think he will sleep away. Uh, Mr. Elsevier, you go. Go and sleep. Benson and I'll watch. Oh, my scratch is nothing, sir. I'm used to a rough-and-tumble life. But you go. If there's a change, we'll wake you.' Elsmere bent down and kissed the squire's forehead tenderly, as a son might have done. By this time he himself could hardly stand. He crept away to his own room, his nerves still quivering with the terror of that sudden waking, the horror of that struggle. It was impossible to sleep. The moon was at the full outside. He drew back the curtains, made up the fire, and wrapping himself in a fur coat which Flaxman had lately forced upon him, sat where he could see the moonlit park and still be within the range of the blaze. As the excitement passed away, a reaction of feverish weakness set in. The strangest whirlwind of thoughts fled through him in the darkness, suggested very often by the figures on the seventeenth-century tapestry which lined the walls. Were those the trees in the wood-path? Surely that was Catherine's figure, training, and that dome, strange. Was he still walking in Grey's funeral procession, the Oxford buildings looking sadly down? Death here, death there, death everywhere, yawning under life from the beginning. The veil which hides the common abyss, inside of which men could not always hold themselves and live, is rent asunder. He looks shuddering into it. And in its stead, that old familiar image of the river of death took possession of him. He stood himself on the brink. On the other side were Grey and the squire. But he felt no pang of separation, of pain, for he himself was just about to cross and join them. And during a strange brief lull of feeling, the mind harboured image and expectation alike with perfect calm. Then the fever spell broke, the brain cleared, and he was terribly himself again. Whence came it this fresh, inexorable consciousness? He tried to repel it, to forget himself, to cling blindly, without thought, to God's love and Catherine's. But the anguish mounted fast. On the one hand this fast-growing certainty, urging and penetrating through every nerve and fibre of the shaken frame. On the other, the ideal fabric of his efforts and his dreams, the new Jerusalem of a regenerate faith, the poor, the loving, and the simple, walking therein. My God, my God, no time, no future! In his misery he moved to the uncovered window and stood looking through it, seeing and not seeing. Outside the river, just filmed with ice, shone under the moon. Over it bent the trees laden with hoar-frost. Was that a heron rising for an instant beyond the bridge in the unearthly blue? And quietly, heavily, like an irrevocable sentence, there came, breathed to him as it were from that winter cold and loneliness, words that he had read an hour or two before, in the little red book beside his hand, words in which the gayest of French poets had fixed, as though by accident, the most tragic of all human cries. Quittez le long espoir et les vastes pensées. He sank on his knees, wrestling with himself, and with a bitter longing for life, and the same words rang through him, deafening every cry but their own. Quittez, quittez de long espoir et les vastes pensées. End of Book 7, Chapter 50「Robert Ellesmere」by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Book 7, Chapter 51 There is little more to tell. The man who had lived so fast was no long time dying. The eager soul was swift in this as in all else. The day after Ellesmere's return from Yorwell, where he left the squire still alive, the telegram announcing the death reached Bedford Square a few hours after Robert's arrival. Edwardson came up to see him and examine him. 
he discovered tubercular disease of the larynx, which begins with slight hoarseness and weakness, and develops into one of the most rapid forms of phthisis. In his opinion, it had been originally set up by the effects of the chill at Petit Dal, acting upon a constitution never strong, and at that moment peculiarly susceptible to mischief. And, of course, the speaking and preaching of the last four months had done enormous harm. It was with great outward composure that Elsmere received his arrêt de mort at the hands of the young doctor, who announced the result of his examination with a hesitating lip and a voice which struggled in vain to preserve its professional calm. He knew too much of medicine himself to be deceived by Edmondson's optimist remarks as to the possible effect of a warm climate like Algiers on his condition. He sat down, resting his head on his hands a moment. Then, wringing Edmondson's hand, he went out feebly to find his wife. Catherine had been waiting in the dining-room, her whole soul one dry, tense misery. She stood looking out of the window, taking curious heed of a Jewish wedding that was going on in the square, of the preposterous bouquets of the coachman and the gaping circle of errand-boys. How pinched the bride looked in the north wind! When the door opened and Catherine saw her husband come in, her young husband, to whom she had been married not yet four years, with that indescribable look in the eyes which seemed to divine and confirm all those terrors which had been shaking her during her agonised waiting, there followed a moment between them which words cannot render. When it ended, that half-articulate convulsion of love and anguish, she found herself sitting on the sofa beside him, his head on her breast, his hand clasping hers. "'Do you wish me to go, Catherine?' he asked her gently. "'To Algiers?' Her eyes implored for her. "'Then I will,' he said, but with a long sigh. "'It will only prolong it two months,' he thought. "'And does one not owe it to the people for whom one has tried to live, "'to make a brave end amongst them? "'Ah, no, no, those two months are hers.' So without any outward resistance, he let the necessary preparations be made. It wrung his heart to go, but he could not wring hers by staying. After his interview with Robert, and his further interview with Catherine, to whom he gave the most minute recommendations and directions, with a reverent gentleness which seemed to make the true state of the case more ghastly plain to the wife than ever, Edmondson went off to Flaxman. Flaxman heard his news with horror. A bad case, you say? Advanced? A bad case, Edmondson repeated gloomily. He had been fighting against it too long under that absurd delusion of clergyman's throat. If only men would not insist upon being their own doctors. And, of course, that going down to Muirwell the other day was madness. I shall go with him to Algiers, and probably stay a week or two. To think of that life, that career, cut short. This is a queer sort of world. When Flaxman went over to Bedford Square in the afternoon, he went like a man going himself to execution. In the hall he met Catherine. You have seen Dr. Edmondson? she asked, pale and still, except for a little nervous quivering of the lip. He stooped and kissed her hand. Yes, he says he goes with you to Algiers. I will come after if you will have me. The climate may do wonders. She looked at him with the most heart-rending of smiles. Will you go in to Robert? He's in the study. He went, in trepidation, and found Robert lying tucked up on the sofa, apparently reading. "'Don't, don't, old fellow,' he said affectionately, as Flaxman almost broke down. It "'Comes to all of us sooner or later. Whenever it comes, we think it too soon. I believe I've been sure of it for some time. We are such strange creatures. It has been so present to me lately that life was too good to last. You remember the sort of feeling one used to have as a child about some treat in the distance, that it was too much joy, that something was sure to come between you and it?' Well, in a sense, I've had my joy, the first fruits of it at least. But as he threw his arms behind his head, leaning back on them, Flaxman saw the eyes darken and the naive boyish mouth contract, and knew that under all these brave words there was a heart which hungered. How strange, Robert went on reflectively. Yesterday I was travelling, walking like other men, a member of society. Today I am an invalid. In the true sense, a man no longer. The world has done with me. A barrier I shall never recross has sprung up between me and it. 
Flaxman, tonight is the storytelling. Will you read to them? I have the book here prepared, some scenes from David Copperfield. And will you tell them? A hard task, but Flaxman undertook it. Never did he forget the scene. Some ominous rumour had spread, and the new brotherhood was besieged. Impossible to give the reading. A hall full of strained, upturned faces listened to Flaxman's announcement, and to Ellesmere's messages of cheer and exhortation, and then a wild wave of grief spread through the place. The street outside was blocked, men looking dismally into each other's eyes, women weeping, children sobbing for sympathy, all feeling themselves at once shelterless and forsaken. When Ellesmere heard of it, he turned on his face and asked even Catherine to leave him for a while. The preparations were pushed on. The new brotherhood had just become the subject of an animated discussion in the press, and London was touched by the news of its young founder's breakdown. Catherine found herself besieged by offers of help of various kinds. One offer Flaxman persuaded her to accept. It was the loan of a villa at El Biar, on the hill above Algiers, belonging to a connection of his own. A resident on the spot was to take all trouble off their hands. They were to find servants ready for them, and every comfort. Catherine made every arrangement, met every kindness, with a self-reliant calm that never failed. But it seemed to Flaxman that her heart was broken, that half of her, in feeling, was already on the other side of this horror which stared them all in the face. Was it his perception of it which stirred Robert after a while to a greater hopefulness of speech, a constant bright dwelling on the flowery sunshine for which they were about to exchange the fog and cold of London? The momentary revival of energy was more pitiful to Flaxman than his first quiet resignation. He himself wrote every day to Rose, strange love letters, in which the feeling that could not be avowed ran as a fiery undercurrent through all the sad brotherly record of the invalid's doings and prospects. There was deep trouble in Long Windale. Mrs. Laban was tearful and hysterical and wished to rush off to town to see Catherine. Agnes wrote in distress that her mother was quite unfit to travel, showing her own inner conviction, too, that the poor thing would only be an extra burden on the Ellesmeres if the journey were achieved. Rose wrote, asking to be allowed to go with them to Algiers. And after a little consultation it was so arranged, Mrs. Leyburn being tenderly persuaded, Robert himself writing, to stay where she was. The morning after the interview with Edmondson, Robert sent for Murray Edwards. They were closeted together for nearly an hour. Edwards came out with the look of one who has been lifted into heavenly places. "'I thank God,' he said to Catherine with deep emotion, "'that I ever knew him. I pray that I may be found worthy to carry out my pledges to him.' When Catherine went into the study, she found Robert gazing into the fire with dreamy eyes. He started and looked up to her with a smile. Murray Edwards has promised himself heart and soul to the work. If necessary, he will give up his chapel to carry it on. But we hope it will be possible to work them together. What a brick he is! What a blessed chance it was that took me to that breakfast party at Flaxman's! The rest of the time before departure he spent almost entirely in consultation and arrangement with Edwards. It was terrible how rapidly worse he seemed to grow directly the situation had declared itself and the determination not to be ill had been perforce overthrown. But his struggle against breathlessness and weakness, and all the other symptoms of his state during these last days, was heroic. On the last day of all, by his own persistent wish, a certain number of members of the Brotherhood came to say good-bye to him. They came in one by one, MacDonald first. The old Scotchman, from the height of his sixty years of tough, weather-beaten manhood, looked down on Robert with a fatherly concern. Hey, Mr. Ellesmere, but it's a fine place you're going to, they say. You do well, they say, you do well. And as for the work, sir, we'll keep it up. We'll not let the deal make hay of it, and we knows it, the whole year, he added, with a phraseology which did more honour to the Calvinism of his blood than the philosophy of his training. Lestrange came in with a pale, sharp face and said little in his ten minutes. But Robert divined in him a sort of repressed curiosity and excitement, akin to that of Voltaire turning his feverish eyes towards Le Grand Secret. You, 
who preach to us that consciousness and God and the soul are the only realities? Are you so sure of it now you are dying as you were in health? Are your courage, your certainty, what they were? These were the sort of questions that seemed to underlie the man's spoken words. There was something trying in it, but Robert did his best to put aside his consciousness of it. He thanked him for his help in the past, and implored him to stand by the young society and Mr. Edwards. "'I shall hardly come back, Lestrange. But does one man matter? One soldier falls, another presses forward.' The watchmaker rose, then paused a moment, a flush passing over him. "'We can't stand without you,' he said abruptly. Then, seeing Robert's look of distress, he seemed to cast about for something reassuring to say, but could find nothing. Robert at last held out his hand with a smile, and he went. He left Ellesmere struggling with a pang of horrible depression. In reality there was no man who worked harder at the new brotherhood during the months that followed than Lestrange. He worked under perpetual protest from the Flandeur within him, but something stung him on, on, till a habit had been formed which promises to be the joy and salvation of his later life. Was it the haunting memory of that thin figure, the hand clinging to the chair, the white appealing look? Others came and went, till Catherine trembled for the consequences. She herself took in Mrs. Richards and her children, comforting the sobbing creatures afterwards with a calmness born of her own despair. Robson, in the last stage himself, sent him a grimly characteristic message. "'I shall solve the riddle, sir, before you. The doctor gives me three days. For the first time in my life I shall know what you are all still guessing at. May the blessing of one who never blessed thing or creature before he saw you go with you.' After it all, Robert sank on the sofa with a groan. "'No more,' he said hoarsely. "'No more. Now for air, the sea.' "'Tomorrow, wife, to-morrow. "'Cras ingens it rebimus aequo. "'Ah, oh, me! "'I leave my new salamis behind.' "'But on that last evening "'he insisted on writing letters to Langham and Newcom. "'I will spare Langham the sight of me,' "'he said, smiling sadly, "'and I will spare myself the sight of Newcom. "'I could not bear it, I think. "'But I must say good-bye, "'for I love them both.' Next day, two hours after the Ellesmeres had left for Dover, a cab drove up to their house in Bedford Square, and Newcombe descended from it. "'Gone, sir, two hours ago,' said the housemaid, and the priest turned away with an involuntary gesture of despair. To his dying day the passionate heart bore the burden of that too late, believing that even at the eleventh hour Ellesmere would have been granted to his prayers. He might even have followed them, but that a great retreat for clergy he was just on the point of conducting made it impossible. Flaxman went down with them to Dover. Rose, in the midst of all her new and womanly care for her sister and Robert, was very sweet to him. In any other circumstances, he told himself, he could easily have broken down the flimsy barrier between them, but in those last twenty-four hours he could press no claim of his own. When the steamer cast loose, The girl, hanging over the side, stood watching the tall figure on the pier against the grey January sky. Catherine caught her look and attitude, and could have cried aloud in her own gnawing pain. Flaxman got a cheery letter from Edmondson describing their arrival. Their journey had gone well. Even the odious passage from Marseille had been tolerable. Little Mary had proved a moral traveller. The villa was luxurious, the weather good. "'I've got rooms close by them in the vice-consul's cottage,' wrote Edmondson. "'Imagine, within sixty hours of leaving London in a January fog, "'finding yourself tramping over wild marigolds and mignonette, "'under a sky and through an air as balmy as those of an English June, "'when an English June behaves itself. "'Ellesmere's room overlooks the bay, "'the great plain of the Medici dotted with villages, "'and the grand range of the Giorgiora, backed by snowy summits, "'one can hardly tell from the clouds.' His spirits are marvellous. He's plunged in the history of Algiers, raving about one Fromenton, learning Spanish even. The wonderful purity and warmth of the air seem to have relieved the Glarynx greatly. He breathes and speaks much more easily than when we left London. I sometimes feel, when I look at him, as though in this, as in all else, 
he were unlike the common sons of men, as though to him it might be possible to subdue even this fell disease. Ellesmere himself wrote, I had not heard the half, oh, Flaxman, an enchanted land, air, sun, warmth, roses, orange blossom, new potatoes, green peas, veiled eastern beauties, domed mosques and preaching mardis, everything that feeds the outer and the inner man. To throw the window open at waking to the depth of sunlit air between us and the curve of the bay is for the moment heaven. One's soul seems to escape one, to pour itself into the luminous blue of the morning. I'm better. I breathe again. Mary flourishes exceedingly. She lives mostly on oranges, and has been adopted by sixty nuns who inhabit the convent over the way, and sell us the most delicious butter and cream. I imagine, if she were a trifle older, her mother would hardly view the proceedings of these dear Beroserid women with so much equanimity. As for Rose, she writes more letters than Clarissa, and receives more than an editor of the Times. I have the strongest views, as you know, as to the vanity of letter-writing. There was a time when you shared them, but there are circumstances and conjunctures, alas, in which no man can be sure of his friend or his friend's principles. Kind friend, good fellow, go off into Elgood Street. Tell me everything about everybody. It is possible, after all, that I may live to come back to them. But a week later, alas, the letter has fell into a very different strain. The weather had changed, and it turned indeed damp and rainy, the natives, of course, declaring that such gloom and storm in January had never been known before. Edmondson wrote in discouragement. Ellesmere had a touch of cold, had been confined to bed, and almost speechless. His letter was full of medical detail, from which Flaxman gathered that, in spite of the rally of the first ten days, it was clear that the disease was attacking constantly fresh tissue. "'He's very depressed, too,' said Edmondson. "'I've never seen him so yet. He sits and looks at us in the evening sometimes with eyes that wring one's heart. It is as though, after having for a moment allowed himself to hope, he found it a doubly hard task to submit.' "'Ah, that depression! It was the last eclipse through which a radiant soul was called to pass. But while it lasted, it was black indeed.' The implacable reality, obscured at first by the emotion and excitement of farewells, and then by a brief spring of hope and returning vigour, showed itself now in all its stern nakedness. Sat down, as it were, eye to eye with Ellesmere. Immovable. Ineluctable. There were certain features of the disease itself which were specially trying to such a nature. The long silences it enforced were so unlike him, seemed already to withdraw him so pitifully from their yearning grasp. In these dark days he would sit crouching over the wood fire in the little saddle, or lie, drawn to the window, looking out on the rainstorms, bowing the ilexes, or scattering the meshes of clematis, silent, almost always gentle, but turning sometimes on Catherine, or on Mary playing at his feet, eyes which, as Edmonton said, wrung the heart. But in reality, under the husband's depression, and under the wife's inexhaustible devotion, a combat was going on, which reached no third person, but was throughout poignant and tragic to the highest degree. Catherine was making her last effort, Robert his last stand. As you know, ever since that passionate submission of the wife which had thrown her morally at her husband's feet, there had lingered at the bottom of her heart one last supreme hope. All persons of the older Christian type attribute a special importance to the moment of death, while the man of science looks forward to his last hour as a moment of certain intellectual weakness, and calmly warns his friends beforehand that he is to be judged by the utterances of health and not by those of physical collapse. The Christian believes that on the confines of eternity the veil of flesh shrouding the soul grows thin and transparent, and that the glories and the truths of heaven are visible with a special clearness and authority to the dying. It was for this moment either in herself or in him, that Catherine's unconquerable faith had been patiently and dumbly waiting. Either she would go first, and death would wing her poor last words to him with a magic and power not their own, or, when he came to leave her, the veil of doubt would fall away perforce from a spirit as pure as it was humble, and the eternal light, 
the light of the crucified shine through. Probably, if there had been no breach in Robert's serenity, Catherine's poor last effort would have been much feebler, briefer, more hesitating. But when she saw him plunged for a short space in mortal discouragement, in a sombreness that as the days went on had its points and crests of feverish irritation, her anguish pity came to the help of her creed. Robert felt himself besieged, driven within the citadel, her being urging, grappling with his. In little half-articulate words and ways, in her attempts to draw him back to some of their old religious books and prayers, in those kneeling vigils he often found her maintaining at night beside him, he felt a persistent attack which nearly, in his weakness, overthrew him. For reason and thought grow tired like muscles and nerves. Some of the greatest and most daring thinkers of the world have felt this pitiful longing to be at one with those who love them, at whatever cost, before the last farewell. And the simpler Christian faith has still to create around it those venerable associations and habits which buttress individual feebleness and diminish the individual effort. One early February morning, just before dawn, Robert stretched out his hand for his wife and found her kneeling beside him. The dim, mingled light showed him her face vaguely, her clasped hands, her eyes. He looked at her in silence, she at him. There seemed to be a strange shock as of battle between them. Then he drew her head down to him. Catherine, he said to her in a feeble, intense whisper, would you leave me without comfort, without help, at the end? Oh, my beloved, she cried under her breath, throwing her arms round him, if you would but stretch out your hand to the true comfort, the true help, the Lamb of God sacrifice for us. He stroked her hair tenderly. My weakness might yield, my true best self never. I know whom I have believed. Oh, my darling, be content. Your misery, your prayers, hold me back from God, from that truth and that trust which can alone be honestly mine. Submit, my wife. Leave me in God's hands. She raised her head. His eyes were bright with fever, his lips trembling, his whole look heavenly. She bowed herself again with a quiet burst of tears and an indescribable self-abasement. They had had their last struggle, and once more he had conquered. Afterwards the cloud lifted from him. Depression and irritation disappeared. It seemed to her often as though he lay already on the breast of God. Even her wifely love grew timid and awestruck. Yet he did not talk much of immortality, of reunion. It was like a scrupulous child that dares not take for granted more than its father has allowed it to know. At the same time, it was plain to those about him that the only realities to him in a world of shadows were God, love, the soul. One day he suddenly caught Catherine's hands, drew her face to him, and studied it with his glowing and hollow eyes as though he would draw it into his soul. He made it, he said hoarsely, as he let her go, this love, this yearning, and in life he only makes us yearn that he may satisfy. He cannot lead us to the end and disappoint the craving he himself set in us. No, no, could, could you, could I do it? And he, the source of love or justice, Flaxman arrived a few days afterwards. Edmondson had started for London the night before, leaving Ellesmere better again, able to drive and even walk a little, and well looked after by a local doctor of ability. As Flaxman, tramping up behind his carriage, climbed the long hill to El Biar, he saw the whole marvellous place in a white light of beauty. The bay, the city, the mountains, olive yard and orange grove, drawn in pale tints on luminous air. Suddenly, at the entrance of a steep and narrow lane, he noticed a slight figure standing, a parasol against the sun. "'We thought you would like to be shown the short cut up the hill,' said Rose's voice, strangely demure and shy. "'The man can drive round.' A grip of the hand, a word to the driver, 
and they were alone in the high-walled lane, which was really the old road up the hill, before the French brought zigzags and civilization. She gave him news of Robert, better than he had expected. Under the influence of one of the natural reactions that wait on illness, the girl's tone was cheerful, and Flaxman's spirits rose. They talked of the splendour of the day, the discomforts of the steamer, the picturesqueness of the landing, of anything and everything but the hidden something which was responsible for the dancing brightness in his eyes, the occasional swift veiling of her own. Then, at an angle of the lane where a little spring ran cool and brown into a moss-grown trough, where the blue broke joyously through the grey cloud of olive wood, where not a sight or sound was to be heard of all the busy life which hides and nestles along the hill, he stopped, his hands seizing hers. "'How long?' he said, flushing, his light overcoat falling back from his strong, well-made frame. "'From August to February. How long?' No more. It was most natural, nay, inevitable. For the moment death stood aside, and love asserted itself. But this is no place to chronicle what it said. And he had hardly asked, and she had hardly yielded, before the same misgiving, the same shrinking, seized on the lovers themselves. They sped up the hill, they crept into the house, far apart. It was agreed that neither of them should say a word. But with that extraordinarily quick perception that sometimes goes with such a state as his, Elsmere had guessed the position of things before he and Flaxman had been half an hour together. He took a boyish pleasure in making his friend confess himself, and when Flaxman left him, at once sent for Catherine and told her. Catherine, coming out afterwards, met Flaxman in the little tiled hall. How she had aged and blanched! She stood a moment opposite to him, in her plain long dress with its white collar and cuffs, her face working a little. "'We are so glad,' she said, but almost with a sob. "'God bless you!' And wringing his hand, she passed away from him, hiding her eyes, but without a sound. When they met again she was quite self-contained and bright, talking much both with him and Rose about the future. And one little word of Rose's must be recorded here, for those who have followed her through these four years. It was at night when Robert, with smiles, had driven them out of doors to look at the moon over the bay, from the terrace just beyond the windows. They had been sitting on the balustrade, talking of Ellesmere. In this nearness to death, Rose had lost her mocking ways, but she was shy and difficult, and Flaxman felt it all very strange, and did not venture to woo her much. When all at once, he felt her hand steal, trembling, a little white suppliant into his, and her face against his shoulder. "'You won't you won't ever be angry with me for making you wait like that? It was impertinent. It was like a child playing tricks.' Flaxman was deeply shocked by the change in Robert. He was terribly emaciated. They could only talk at rare intervals in the day and it was clear that his nights were often one long struggle for breath. But his spirits were extraordinarily even, and his days occupied to a point Flaxman could hardly have believed. He would creep downstairs at eleven, read his English letters, among them always some from Elgood Street, write his answers to them. Those difficult scrawls are among the treasured archives of a society which is fast gathering to itself some of the best life in England. Then often fall asleep with fatigue. After food there would come a short drive, or if the day was very warm, an hour or two of sitting outside, generally his best time for talking. He had a wheeled chair in which Flaxman would take him across to the convent garden, a dream of beauty. Overhead an orange canopy, leaf and blossom and golden fruit, all in simultaneous perfection. Underneath a revel of every imaginable flower, Narcissus and, and anemones, geraniums and clematis, and above all, hedges of monthly roses, dark red and pale alternately, making a rose-leaf carpet under their feet. Through the tree trunks shone the white, sun-warmed convent, and far beyond were glimpses of downward trending valleys edged by twinkling sea. Here, sensitive and receptive to his last hour, Ellesmere drank in beauty and to delight talking, too, whenever it was possible to him, 
of all things in heaven and earth. Then, when he came home, he would have out his books and fall to some old critical problem, his worn and scored Greek testament always beside him, the quick eye making its way through some new monograph or other, the parched lips opening every now and then to call Flaxman's attention to some fresh light on an obscure point, only to relinquish the effort again and again with an unfailing patience. But though he would begin as ardently as ever, he could not keep his attention fixed to these things very long. Then it would be the turn of his favourite poets, Wordsworth, Tennyson, Virgil, Virgil perhaps most frequently. Flaxman would read the Aeneid aloud to him, Robert following the passages he loved best in a whisper, his hand resting the while in Catherine's. And then Mary would be brought in, and he would lie watching her while she played. "'I've had a letter,' he said to Flaxman one afternoon, "'from a broad church clergyman in the Midlands, who imagines me to be still militant in London, protesting against the absurd and wasteful isolation of the new brotherhood. He asked me why, instead of leaving the church, I did not join the Church Reform Union, why I did not attempt to widen the church from within, and why we in Elgood Street are not now in organic connection with the new broad church settlement in East London. I believe I have written him rather a sharp letter. I could not help it. It was borne in on me to tell him that it is all owing to him and his brethren that we are in the muddle we are in today. Miracle is to our time what the law was to the early Christians. We must make up our minds about it one way or the other. And if we decide to throw it over as Paul threw over the law, then we must fight as he did. There is no help in subterfuge, no help in anything but a perfect sincerity. We must come out of it. The ground must be cleared. Then may come the rebuilding. Religion itself, the peace of generations to come, is at stake. If we could wait indefinitely while the church widened, well and good. But we have but the one life, the one chance of saying the word or playing the part assigned us. On another occasion in the convent garden he broke out with, I often lie here, Flaxman, wondering at the way in which men become the slaves of some metaphysical word, personality, or intelligence, or what not. What meaning can they have as applied to God? Herbert Spencer is quite right. We no sooner attempt to define what we mean by a personal God than we lose ourselves in labyrinths of language and logic. But why attempt it at all? I like that French saying, on me demande ce que c'est que Dieu, je l'ignore. Quand on ne le demande pas, je le sais très bien. No, we cannot realise him in words. We can only live in him and die to him. On another occasion, he said, speaking to Catherine of the Squire and of Merrick's account of his last year of life, How selfish one is, always, when one least thinks of it. How could I have forgotten him so completely as I did during that new brotherhood time? Where? What is he now? Ah, if somewhere, somehow, one could... He did not finish the sentence, but the painful yearning of his look finished it for him. But the days passed on, and the voice grew rarer, the strength feebler. By the beginning of March, all coming downstairs was over. He was entirely confined to his room, almost to his bed. Then there came a horrible week, when no narcotics took effect, when every night was a wrestle for life, which it seemed must be the last. They had a good nurse, but Flaxman and Catherine mostly shared the watching between them. One morning he had just dropped into a fevered sleep. Catherine was sitting by the window, gazing out into a dawn world of sun which reminded her of the summer sunrises at Petit Dal. She looked the shadow of herself. Spiritually, too, she was the shadow of herself. Her life was no longer her own. She lived in him in every look of those eyes, in every movement of that wasted frame. As she sat there, her Bible on her knee, her strained, unseeing gaze resting on the garden and the sea, a sort of hallucination took possession of her. It seemed to her that she saw the form of the Son of Man passing over the misty slope in front of her, that the dim, majestic figure turned and beckoned. In her half-dream she fell on her knees, "'Master!' she cried in agony, 
I cannot leave him. Call me not. My life is here. I have no heart. It beats in his. And the figure passed on, the beckoning hand dropping at its side. She followed it with a sort of anguish, but it seemed to her as though mind and body were alike incapable of moving, that she would not if she could. Then suddenly a sound from behind startled her. She turned, her trance shaken off in an instant, and saw Robert sitting up in bed. For a moment her lover, her husband of the early days, was before her as she ran to him. But he did not see her. An ecstasy of joy was on his face. The whole man bent forward, listening. The child's cry! Thank God! Oh, Mary! Catherine! Thank God! And she knew that he stood again on the stairs at Muirwell in that September night which gave them their firstborn, and that he thanked God because her pain was over. An instant's strained looking, and sinking back into her arms, he gave two or three gasping breaths, and died. Five days later Flaxman and Rose brought Catherine home. It was supposed that she would return to her mother at Burwood. Instead, she settled down again in London, and not one of those whom Robert Ellesmere had loved was forgotten by his widow. Every Sunday morning, with her child beside her, she worshipped in the old ways. Every Sunday afternoon saw her black-veiled figure sitting motionless in a corner of the Elgood Street Hall. In the week she gave all her time and money to the various works of charity which she had started. But she held her peace. Many were grateful to her, some loved her, none understood her. She lived for one hope only, and the years passed all too slowly. The new brotherhood still exists, and grows. There are many who imagined that, as it had been raised out of the earth by Ellesmere's genius, so it would sink with him. Not so. He would have fought the struggle to victory with surpassing force, with a brilliancy and rapidity none after him could rival. But the struggle was not his. His effort was but a fraction of the effort of the race. In that effort, and in the divine force behind it, is our trust as was his. Others I doubt not, if not we, the issue of our toils shall see, and, they forgotten and unknown, young children gather as their own the harvest that the dead had shown. End of Book 7, Chapter 51 End of Robert Ellesmere by Mary Augusta Ward